Good morning and warm greetings from the Chennai Center for China Studies and National Maritime Foundation. It gives us great pleasure to welcome you all to the Maiden Security Dialogue 2022 on the topic India's Strategic Environment, Perceptions, Realities and Options. The global strategic environment has undergone significant changes in the last decade and has impacted the overall approach of nations to the multiple emerging challenges faced by them. India is no exception and is required to work on its options in the new global order in the emerging multipolar world. A detailed strategic scanning is the need of the hour for India to calibrate its economic, security, and foreign policy matrix that can prioritize her national interests and deal with serious challenge in multiple domains. In analyzing the recent trends in these various spheres of India's strategic environment and the implications in the foreseeable future, this maiden attempt is also strives to appropriately place Tamil Nadu in the strategic map of India. With these words, I would like to call upon Commodore R.S. Vasan, Director General C3S, to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you, Bala. A very good morning to everyone. Admiral Karambir Singh. Ambassador Saurabh Kumar, General Narsimhan, and all other distinguished panelists and resource persons, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to welcome all of you for this maiden event this year. It is not that Chennai Center for China Studies is doing it for the first time. We already have completed about 101 video events, webinar events in the last two years since the, the COVID hit us. And that's a very good average to maintain for anything tank. It's it's singular pleasure and privilege for me to welcome Admiral Karambir Singh, who have known him as a dashing ink pilot when he joined the Camo Squadron nearly 40 years ago, when I was in the L-38 Squadron. And thereafter, he's risen to the topmost rank in the Navy. Thereafter, now he's taken over as the chairman of National Maritime Foundation. And this is his first outing after he took over the reins of an MFS chairman on 17th of uh, this month. A wonderful uh, opportunity for us to touch base with the uh, chief of naval staff who is recently retired, who will have his hands on everything that is around us. And I could not have found a better person to dwell on the issues that we identified for scanning today. <clears throat> also very happy to inform you that Chennai Center for China Studies which was established nearly 14 years ago, you know, has uh, carved out a place for itself. In the last four years, the Think Tank Civil Society Program, an international organization, has rated us constantly as one of the top think tanks among some 12,000 think tanks in the world. Last four years, in fact, in the five or six categories where we are eligible to be rated, we've been in the top 50. And I'm very happy to inform this audience that Amongst the best independent think tanks among South Korea, China, Japan, and India, we stood first. A no mean achievement for a small think tank, you know, which is working on meager resources. But our strength is derived from the members who volunteer and contribute, you know, without any hesitation. You know, so it is that 30 members who are from different disciplines, from the bureaucracy, from the defense, from the academia, and from other business professionals who have contributed to the success of C3S. So we are the only think tank outside of Delhi who is looking specifically at China issues. And I'm very happy that we have National Maritime Foundation on board today. It's not the first program again that we are doing with National Maritime Foundation. There is convergence of, of interest. As India looks east and acts east, there's a convergence in the Indo-Pacific. And National, National Maritime Foundation it has a primary focus in the developments, both in the Indo-Pacific and in the Indian Ocean region, which is where there is this confluence of interest between these two think tanks. And then just as China Center for China Studies has made a name for itself, the National Maritime Foundation, of which I'm also a part of as the regional director of the Tamil Nadu chapter, has called out a name for itself and is the go-to think tank in terms of matters maritime. So obviously, we will have more such events in the future. And I have no doubt that this synergy will bring about the best 
of the two think tanks which have like i said a commonality of interest in indo pacific while the nmf is looking at the maritime domain the chennai center for china studies is looking at multiple dimensions of china not just the south china sea or the west pacific or the indian ocean region but we also looking at many other areas including historical cultural relations economic issues and also the political diplomatic milieu that we need to discuss so i'm i'm also again very happy to inform the audience here that uh, uh, you know in the last uh, 14 years of our existence as a think tank outside delhi there has been a phenomenal amount of work that we have done in terms of encouraging uh, interns the last summer saw 52 interns doing internship on china related issues and we consciously also allowed some of them to look at not just the technology dimensions but also the maritime dimensions which is where you know the convergence of interest comes to play and these students who came to us are not only from india but many of them came from abroad they came from iits and we have regular interaction with these so we also have a mou with <clears throat> many organizations and that includes the icwa and of course the tibet policy institute which you signed 3 4 years ago we also have an informal arrangement with uh, cccs at delhi where general nasimen heads that as the director general we done programs together and again i must place on record my gratitude to general nasimen for making it a point to do programs here in chennai outside of delhi so that the audience here the southern audience benefit from the initiative uh, welcome to you ambassador saurabh kumar good to see you here and uh, he is again been an active supporter here is located in bangalore and he is part of the national institute of advanced studies and he has been instrumental in some of the recent initiatives that we launched this year and that is related to understanding china through the prism of chinese media and which is where i am grateful again to ambassador sarab kumar for all the inputs that he has given and this is going to be a major initiative for the chennai center for china studies this year so we have uh, an array of uh, wonderful uh, speakers uh, starting off with uh, uh, mr shivaraman as a former revenue secretary we have uh, air marshal vartman uh, who retired from the air force last 10 years ago but i am very happy that he is located here in chennai and he again uh, he is an active supporter of all that we do in chennai you know as far as the veteran community is concerned we also have others the group captain chandrashekharan the subramanian shridharan we have raja ramutkrishnan uh, we have uh, many other uh, distinguished speakers who i am not going to name individually right now but all of them are here to contribute to this event success today so let's look forward to a wonderful session today and uh, as in the past uh, the rules for interaction have been clearly uh, underlined by bala uh, who is a senior research officer he will also put out the guidelines for people to follow in the chat box so uh, there will be no uh, open sessions in terms of you addressing uh, your questions uh, uh, on a mic microphone but all these would be put in the chat box so again i am grateful to all of you for uh, coming here this morning and uh, being part of this initiative a joint initiative of c3s and nmf to look at the strategic developments in the coming decades the whole intention is to see what india's responses can be what are the options that are available so we are more worried about uh, you know what are india's options are what are the constraints and you know what are the challenges and how do we cope with the strategic developments i'm not going to identify them because you know we have this illustrious list of speakers who are going to do that for us so i will stop here and uh, hand you over back to mc to conduct the proceedings what you bala and thank you jai hind thank you sir it is an honor for me to introduce our distinguished speaker for the day Admiral Karambir Singh sir who was Republic of India's 24th chief of naval staff assumed the chairmanship of the National Maritime Foundation New Delhi on 17th Jan 2022 and alumnus of the National Defence Academy Defence Services Staff College and College of Naval Warfare the admiral was commissioned into the Indian Navy in July of 1980 a naval aviator of repute he earned his wings in 1981 as a helicopter pilot and has flown extensively on the chetak and several variants of kamo helicopters over the four decades of a sterling service under the indian navy's white 
He has commanded the Indian Coast Guard ship Chand Bibi, the guide, and two of the Indian Navy's frontline guided missile destroyers, namely INS Rana and INS Delhi. As a professional, he has served in the Directorate of Naval Air Staff at the Integrated Headquarters of the Ministry of Defence and has been a captain and officer in charge of the Naval Air Station at Mumbai. On promotion to the flag rank, the Admiral distinguished himself as the Chief of Staff of the Eastern Naval Command. He has also done himself and his nation proud while holding other critical flag appointments, including those of Chief of Staff of the Tri-Services Unified Command in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and the Flag Officer Commanding Maharashtra and Gujarat Naval Area. As a Vice Admiral, he was Director General, Project Seabird, and oversaw all aspects of the development of the Indian Navy's expansive and modern base at Karwar in Indian state, southern state of Karnataka. Appointed thereafter as a Deputy Chief of Naval Staff, he admirably discharged his responsibilities towards the Indian Navy's current and future operational and combat capacity and capabilities. He assumed command of the Indian Navy on 31st May 2019, serving with uncommon distinction until his retirement from active service on 30th November 2021. It's a very privilege having you with us, sir. With this, I would like to request Admiral Karabhi Singh to kindly deliver the inaugural address. Over to you, Admiral. Uh, sir, could you please unmute yourself, sir? You're muted, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning to everybody. And at the outset, I'd like to thank the Chennai Center for China Studies for giving me the opportunity to speak at the Security Dialogue 2022. So as for my talk, I'll briefly speak about uh, India's uh, strategic contours with emphasis on the maritime domain, because I know there are a lot of uh, specialists who are handling the other domains. Uh, then dwell on how this, uh, this competition and uh, conflict paradigm is undergoing change. As I, see, as I see it from a practitioner's perspective, since I only retired about a month and a half back and thereafter suggest as to how we as a nation and a bit as a Navy could counter uh, these challenges that we are expected to face. So starting with uh, India's uh, strategic context, it is like any other nations is uh, significantly shaped by our geographic position. You know, Miles Law uh, says, and I quote, where you stand depends on where you sit. Uh, this is applicable to politics, but it's also, I'm sure, applicable to geopolitics. So when viewed from that prism, when you look north and to our west, the standoff at the LAC, to my mind, is an inflection point, which must significantly sharpen our competitive instincts vis-a-vis -vis our adversaries. Also, today we are more clear-eyed that a world dominated by certain powers may not be in India's interest. Historically, too, uh, belligerent and uh, aggressive powers, uh, like uh, in World War II, if left, uh, if left unchecked, they have caused problems. And what we are seeing today are countries deftly using geoeconomic co coercion for greater geopolitical leverage, using the comprehensive national power to achieve their ends. And I think this is something we need to factor as we negotiate the future and focus on securing our national interests. When you look seawards to the wider expanse of the oceans, uh, the Indo-Pacific is the new center of gravity of uh, global geopolitics. And to my mind, this is also a space where India's opportunities and challenges lie. Opportunities for cooperation come from several facts. One is the destination, uh, the, sorry, destinies of nations in the Indo-Pacific are interlinked, therefore the incentive to work together. Seas are the dominant medium of the Indo-Pacific, which connect and don't divide. Therefore, opportunities like uh, blue economy, connectivity, trade. So there is this interest in keeping the seas open for the economic well-being of our citizens in the littoral and indeed the globe. And as we, India, aim to be a 5 trillion economy, we need to engage the world for resources, markets to fuel and drive our economy and now these will come through the sea. Even the threats in the Indo-Pacific are transnational in nature. The drugs, when you look at drugs, piracy, terror and everybody understands that given the expanse, no one can do it alone. Therefore, the need to work together. So this is the cooperative part 
that I see. At the same time, Indo-Pacific poses significant challenges. Great power competition is being played out in our backyard, unlike the earlier Cold War, which was in Europe. And while there are several elements of great power competition, China and US will continue to jostle over supremacy in and through the maritime domain, because seas are the economic highways through which commerce and now even ideas flow because 99% of all data is being transmitted through undersea cables. Also, challenges are posed because intrastate conflicts uh, are there where, where the problems on land are spilling over into the sea. You see what is happening in Somalia, Yemen, Straits of Hormuz, they pose a challenge to our economy, which is so heavily dependent on the sea for trade. And of course, presence of resources as they keep coming up also means competition. So the biggest fear we were seeing uh, during my tenure was that differing interpretations of international law. There is something called lawfare, which you are aware of. And what is happening is that there is a fear that global commons that we all been used to can change into contested seas, threatening the free flow of commerce and trade, which has guaranteed our prosperity. And you see some nations already looking to exploit rather than respect the openness of the seas. South China Sea is an example. So this in sum is what I wanted to briefly, very briefly talk about India's strategic contours. Now, if you were to draw lessons from the broader geostrategic context, I would pick four interrelated aspects to speak about. First is, uh, uh, you know, one sees the actions of certain countries in the past few years. When we, when we look at that, uh, their aim seems to be to win without fighting. Tactics such as grey zone, hybrid warfare, fait accompli, incrementalism, intimidation have become more prominent. And newer actors have emerged on the stage. Cyber troops, maritime militia, wolf warrior diplomats, proxy forces, etc. Which is effectively blurring the line between military and non-military actions. If you look at the RAND study of 2019, they, they, they have given seven characteristics of grey zone that it highlights. Uh, and I think it's being played out in several places in the world, including South China Sea. One is remaining below the threshold of conflict, unfolding gradually over time instead of all at once. The third one is lack of attributability. Fourth is use of extensive political and legal justifications. Stopping short of threatening the adversary's vital interests. Use risk of escalation as a source of leverage and use non-military tools. So what is coming out is the eventual aim is to force strategic and operational outcomes by remaining below the threshold of conflict, make incremental gains that accumulate into a long-term advantage. We have been seeing, we have been witness to this over the last few years. So that is the first geostrategic consideration that I wanted to talk about. Second. This salami slicing, if you want to call it, is being played out across something called a competition continuum across all elements of national power. You know, the traditional armed forces, especially Navy worldview was, was binary. Either there's conflict or there's peace. What we are encountering today is a competition continuum. What I mean by it is that competition is being waged by some states at all times across all elements of dying, using all constituents of national park while remaining below the threshold of conflict. And here the autocratic countries in particular, they have an advantage. They can employ something which I would like to, which I have, it's not my term, I have read about it, sharp power, which means all power, all national power or elements of power focused to pierce perforate and undermine the integrity of very democratic institutions or pillars that are a source of power and sustenance of democratic nations. Attacking media, social media, financial institutions, election process, etc. Turning the strengths of democratic nations into weaknesses. Working from inside out rather than on the borders or outside in. So competition is therefore now a team sport with new rule sets involving all organs and elements of the state. To my mind, it is really a busy piece being negotiated on a day-to-day -day contested space. 
is the second point. The third is our traditional counters in this uh, competition continuum, therefore, need a little rethink. We are used to escalation control. Escalation control today is no longer as straightforward as earlier. There's an absence of linearity. Your actions in one domain may elicit response in another unconnected domain. The UK CDS, I think in uh, 2019, uh, called it a spider's web of multiple ladders instead of an escalation ladder. Therefore, the um, idea of escalation management or escalation dominance is no longer as simplistic. You know, territorial salami slicing may be responded with a diplomatic salami slicing or an economic salami slicing or any other avenue. Also, the conventional idea of veterans, to my mind, is undergoing change as incremental actions continue to be waged below the threshold of what would invite a formal response. In many ways, deterrence is too passive a concept to prevent coercion in the current competition continuum. We have to act proactively and win the competitive peace. And final element, we've all read about it in great detail, is technology. We see unmanned systems, drones, commercial technology. Technology is more precise, more sophisticated, more easily available. Commercial tools and technology are accessible to even the smallest actor. And we've seen the impact of drones in Nagorno-Karabakh, Syria and Libya, that has enabled states to quickly grab territory, rapidly overwhelm opponents and threaten further punishment. And drones are also, as you know, are being effectively used in the Yemen conflict. So military and indeed nations have to think innovatively, respond swiftly, act decisively to counter such evolving threats. Else one risks getting Armenianized by being left behind as new concepts, new technologies infuse new ways in which we face conflicts. So what are India's options in this complex interplay? We have a sophisticated adversary, which has every credential to outplay us unless we reimagine our overall strategy. And uh, like I said, traditional deterrence is no longer adequate. It has to be supplemented. And as our adversaries effectively deploy capabilities across the competition continuum, undertake salami slicing to achieve objectives, we will not only need to remain ready for conflict, but also prevail in sustained day-to-day -day competition before things turn kinetic. Unfortunately, the challenge is that the competition with a larger adversary is defined by an increasing asymmetry of power. One we have to cope with and increasingly counter. And the art of exploiting this ascendancy in comprehensive national power to achieve one's geopolitical goals has been very well articulated by a scholar from the Chinese Academy of Military Sciences who argues, and I will quote, Victory without war does not mean that there is no war at all. Wars one must fight are political wars, economic wars, science and technology wars, diplomatic wars, etc. To sum up in a word, it's a war of comprehensive national power. Unquote. Here, of course, military power is a very important element of the comprehensive national power. So from a strategic strategy perspective, given the substantial comprehensive national power differential, the way ahead for India is by, to my mind, is working to increase India's influence and CNP while chipping away at the adversary's influence. This is something where we need to collectively apply ourselves as a nation. As a Navy man, I'll offer some options on how we could possibly increase India's CNP and influence on the maritime front. One, I think engaging larger powers or large powers is really par for the course. China, for example, has deftly exploited such opportunities to underwrite its progress. Arthashastra too talks about this when it talks about engaging a larger power to checkmate another larger enemy. So India, to my mind, must not be reticent in engaging large powers to develop its own CNP. This is crucial if we are to leapfrog the CNP asymmetry, at least in the short term. Quad, for instance, continues to generate considerable traction and interest. It has potential, something that we must keep as a factor. The second key vector 
of increasing India's influence is to cohese our neighborhood. We do not want cleavages in our neighborhood which can be exploited. While India has addressed this from a policy perspective through strategies such as neighborhood first, security and growth for all in the region, Sagar, etc. Two C's are crucial to my mind. The first one, first C is credibility. We need to redouble our efforts in adding credibility to our engagements with the IOR literals. Delivery on capacity building in projects has become better, but has to be much more improved. Second C is customizing our pitch with each neighbor in terms of what they, then that neighbor holds dear. For example, redoubling efforts towards countering drug smuggling that threaten tourism oriented economies of Mauritius, Maldives, Seychelles and Sri Lanka. Our engagements must be, must see the challenges through our neighbor's prism to remain effective. Here, building collective maritime competence, which has been an effort now by the Navy for some time in the neighborhood, is key. And I would like to quote our external affairs minister who says, India will grow with others, not separately. And the last uh, recommendation to my mind is to shore up India's legitimacy in the region to adequate buy-in from littoral nations. There's a feedback coming in. Uh, Henry Kissinger, you know, brings uh, in his book uh, World Order, brings out that stability derives from a balance of legitimacy and power. These two elements are complementary. And while power is an as aspect which our adversary emphasizes, leg legitimacy is an aspect where India scores. And therefore, the impetus to concepts such as security and growth for all in the region, free, open, inclusive, Indo-Pacific, to my mind, preferred security partner is better than net security provider because it has a collaborative intent in it. These are not only ideas that India inherently invests in and believes in, they are also enablers towards greater legitimacy as a resident IOR power. And government of initiatives, uh, India initiatives as IORA, Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, BIMSTEC, Act East, Neighborhood First, not only engender trust and partnership, but also, also buttress India's acceptance in the region. After all, haven't we all reaped the benefits of a free, open uh, seas, rule-based order as opposed to what a certain nation is doing in the South China Sea? So legitimacy, therefore, is a key enabler when we look at developing India's comprehensive national power. In terms of chipping away at our adversary's influence, suffice to say that there are leverages available like we are highlighting the transactional nature of their engagements, highlighting the danger of debt traps to vulnerable states, uh, putting spotlight on EZ infringements by fishing, exploration, research vessels and established and, uh, you know, not looking at established international norms. The fact that some states only believe in the dictum that either you are a subordinate partner or a competitor. That, unlike them, India not only helps build bridges and infrastructure, but also builds bridges of trust. Now I'll just talk a little bit about the Navy. To my mind, the Navy can be a crucial enabler as India attempts to negotiate this competition continuum and the changing character of conflict. First by helping winning the peace on a day-to-day -day basis, by leveraging foreign cooperation, being credible partners, engaging as equals with the navies across the Indian Ocean region, being first responders for littorals, remaining forward deployed, ready to respond, do the heavy lifting in the neighborhood, take leadership role in common challenges, HADR, piracy, drug smuggling, training, even training is a in a competitive space, capacity building, all these. Second, Navy can use geography, leverage our central location as a resident Indian Ocean power to enhance our influence, our location aids, reach and sustenance in the Indian Ocean region, which are very important to navies. I think India is truly blessed the great maritime geography which we need to use. Third, build trust with like-minded nations. Ties do not develop overnight. Trust cannot be surged. It needs painstaking effort and commitment in peacetime. We must continue interoperability with the larger navies, like-minded navies. Recent US doctrine even talks of interchangeability, moving ahead from interoperability, where once assets can operate from the others, ships, etc. Like we see we're happening with the US Marine Corps F-35s embarked on Queen Elizabeth to the Royal Navy. We can help forge collaborative 
frameworks. As I mentioned, Iowa is one of the less integrated regions, and IONS was a great initiative, uh, started in February 2008, and has made significant strides in pro pro promoting collaborative engagements. So aim is to offer compelling alternatives to what our adversaries offer, converge not always on principles, but issues. Convergence then can lead to cohesion. Also, I feel to be effective and uh, to contribute, Indian, uh, so Indian Navy needs to pay greater importance to the aspect of persistent surveillance. The surveillance is the key. Watch developments closely, not wait for the problem to reach large proportions. Therefore, the focus on maritime uh, domain awareness and the intent to emerge as the maritime information hub of the Indian Ocean region. Because information leads to awareness, awareness leads to understanding. And finally, the focus of when I was in the chair was to coordinate efforts across the government of India stakeholders so that response to any adversaries transgressions are applied across multiple levels and domains. This is the reverse of the autocratic shop power that I talked about. So the aim was to break silos in the maritime domain, continuously work at bringing together disparate stakeholders in the maritime domain, aim to develop integrated maritime capability to allow response options, like I said, across varied situations. And this calls for closer interaction, Coast Guard, DG Shipping, and other ministries. I'm sure when the National Maritime Security Coordinator, uh, which is on the anvil, happens, this will make things easy. So as we look at the competition continuum, I feel the navies remain well suited to be effective in such a paradigm to in inherent flexibility in orchestration of forces, location, domains, as well as levels of response. Aim is to harness these, not only through new tactics, new technologies, but also through new thinking. So in conclusion, uh, we are in a period of uh, geopolitical flux. Where the contours of competition and conflict are undergoing considerable change. As we face sophisticated adversary, the way to counter it over the long term is to increase India's, India's influence and CNP while chipping away at the adversary's influence. And militaries, navies in particular, need to rethink their strategies to remain effective in a competition continuum. We not only need to win in conflict, but also win the peace on a day-to-day -day basis. And this perhaps is a way, is one way that we can help our country secure and promote our interests in the unbalanced and aggressive strategic environment of today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir for setting a roadmap and vision for today's conference in a very clear and precise terms. It is a privilege for me to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Lieutenant General S. N. Narsiman, sir. Lieutenant General S. L. Narsiman is an infantry officer commissioned in 1977. He has done graduation in mathematics, post-graduation in defense studies, and holds a PhD on India-China relations. He has been awarded four times for his outstanding contribution to the Indian Army by the President of India. He served as defense attache in the Embassy of India in China for three years, a qualified in Chinese language, and has been a keen observer of China for the past 18 years. His expertise spans international relations and internal issues, economy, and defense-related subjects of China. He has taken part in many track two dialogues, both in India and abroad. A pleasure to have you with us, sir. I now kindly request Lieutenant General Lesson Narsiman to kindly deliver the keynote address. So what do you Thank you very much, <clears throat> Admiral Karambir, uh, Commodore Wasson, and my course mate, General Shankar, and other distinguished uh, participants in this, in this webinar. At the outset, let me thank the National Maritime Foundation and the Chennai Center for China Studies for giving me this opportunity to speak at this seminar. Admiral Karambir has actually laid out a very clear and concise kind of a, an outset for this webinar. In my disposition, what I'm going to say is I've drawn from the concept note which the Chennai Center had sent, sent earlier. I'm going to look at the immediate strategic environment I'm going to look at the extended neighborhood and also the global strategic environment and then come to say a few words about how India can secure itself 
and promotes its national interests. Coming to the first part of the uh, first part of my remarks, firstly on the on the on the neighborhood part of it, the strategic environment that is existing in the neighborhood, we have a we have a Pakistan which is teetering on instability all the time which has got a tenuous civil military relations it promotes terrorism and it, it it the terrorism emanating from there affects us in in our country and to my way of thinking kashmir is actually a diversion to retain its importance i don't think they are serious about the kashmiri muslims or the issues involved there but what it what they actually intend to do is to keep it as a as a key to this bilateral relationship and also to gain the importance that it seeks to gain out of two things one its strategic location and second the uh, as a champion of the islamic cause its participation in alternative islamic group that is something that we need to keep in mind and keep watching like for example, a couple of years ago, it started getting into a smaller group between Turkey and Malaysia and Pakistan. Particularly when Pakistan was shunned by the other Islamic countries in the West Asian region. Pakistan's role in Afghanistan is something that we need to keep watching. Pakistan needs Afghanistan for its strategic depth which, lacks, which it lacks because of the geographic location. Its dependency on China is going to be constant and may be increasing constantly again. Its relationship with Saudi Arabia helps it to overcome the financial difficulties it faces very often. So if you put this as one, one particular block in the matrix, you find that this, this particular country is going to be on our radar in the neighborhood for I would say posterity and eternity. Eternity. As far as China is concerned, its support to Pakistan is going to continue, but the Shilak will look for its pound of flesh from Pakistan. It is clearly visible when Pakistan, when China did not reschedule the loans that Pakistan was to meet, uh, the, the repayment schedule that Pakistan was to meet, and Pakistan has to resort to various other means to drum up the funds to service the debt. China-South Asia relations are something which we need to be constantly be looking at. And two important things have come up in the recent past. One, the South China-South Asia emergency supplies reserve and poverty alleviation and cooperative development. China started holding these meetings with the, with the South Asian countries in the last about two years, year and a half and more. And it probably looks at a, a china sark kind of relationship, less India. So you find frequent meetings taking place and China putting in place such, such, uh, uh, such organizations like China South Asia Emergency Supplies Reserve. Even after a year or so, it has not taken off is a different issue. But what China aims to do is something that we need to always be watching. Second is the Forum for Development of Island Nations of Indian Ocean. This is something that has been that has been proposed by Foreign Minister of China, Mr. Wang Yi, when he visited Sri Lanka recently. This is a development again that is going to impinge on our on our strategic environment in the neighborhood. So these two events, I would say, are of importance that we need to keep considering and keep monitoring. China-Myanmar relations, they are on the outward looks very close and very, um, uh, very in in intimate. However, there are a lot of undercurrents that we see and lack under suspicion in the minds of the Myanmar junta on the China's role in the Myanmar is relationship is something that is striking. Bangladesh has been actually chary of relationship with China, even though they have got some military equipment, but they have been extremely careful in accepting the One Belt, One Road initiative projects 
into Bangladesh. They need the money for the investment and the infrastructure development. However, they have been very conscious of the fact that they should not get into a debt trap. China-Sri Lanka relations have been extremely good for a while, but in the recent past, there seems to be some kind of balancing that is taking place between China and India by Sri Lanka. The reason for that is simple. The kind of financial situation that Sri Lanka sees itself in, finds itself in, is actually forcing it to rethink that relationship. Recent visit of Prime, um, uh, Foreign Minister Mr. Wang Yi did not actually result in the rescheduling of the loans that they were seeking. And so to overcome the immediate crisis of fuel, food, and also the debt servicing that they need to do, China has turned, uh, sorry, Sri Lanka has turned towards India for assistance and India has rightfully given that assistance. So there needs to be, I, there will be some kind of a balancing because of this particular aspect. China's role in Afghanistan is again very important. China is not going to jump in and put physically enter into Afghanistan. They have learned their lessons from the US and also the USSR. However, from the backstage, they are orchestrating a lot of things in Afghanistan. They have direct links with Taliban. They also operate through Pakistan. And then they also enter into some kind of a cooperative engagement on Afghanistan with the Central Asian republics and some other countries like Iran. <clears throat> so this is something that, that we are going to see. China will also increase its role in Afghanistan. They have, there have been talks of China extending the China-Pakistan economic corridor to that particular uh, country. However, we don't see it as yet. Also, there has been a lot of talks about uh, China looking at the resources in Afghanistan. Again, we have seen some kind of reconnaissance being undertaken, but not much has taken place after that. But I, our feeling is once the stability returns to Afghanistan, you will find China get, getting more and more involved in Afghanistan, but in an indirect manner. COVID diplomacy has assisted China to get enter into this region in a big way, particularly after the second wave, when our efforts to supply vaccines and medical equipment to the neighboring countries was uh, took a backseat because of our own requirements. However, we are now coming back into the game and a lot of these exports are taking place at this point in time probably this situation will get reversed. We also need to look at the extra regional parts and China in the Indian Ocean region. And we'll currently spoke about it in detail. I will not talk about it much, but what I'm going to say is something that we need to keep in mind that we need to be getting used to the, the presence of extra regional parts in the Indian Ocean and China also will be increasing its presence. Coming on to the second part, in the India's extended neighborhood, China carries out a proactive diplomacy in groups of countries. I would say six or seven groups that you can look at. One is China plus Central Asian republics called C plus C5. Then China South Asia about which I spoke about a little earlier. China ASEAN, West Asia, European Union, and South Pacific Islands, in addition to, of course, the US and the Russia relationship. In this context, wherever the visits have been taking place, for example, in West Asia, China has been proposing a five-point initiative on achieving security and stability in the Middle East. Why I am saying this is, they are trying to project projects or project some kind of policies which actually keep attracting the group of countries to China. It is not to say that all is hunky-dory in all these relationships. All these relationships have got their own problems and uh, issues. And India's reaction to this, I'll cover it a little later when I come to what India needs to do on this. The third is the global strategic environment consisting of India's engagements with major powers like the US and Russia. U.S.-China and U.S.-Russia relations will continue to be tense. 
and we need to be uh, getting used to this unless china changes its path or or us changes its path both don't seem to be in the offing in the near future china will consolidate its position in the south china sea that is very clearly visible but what we are going to look at is something that we need to be looking out for china's push towards the second island chain it was in their it was on their cards some time ago they don't speak about the second island chain in the recent past but my understanding is once they have the complete influence in the south china sea you will find that the push towards second island chain will start that is something that we need to be watching constantly bilaterally india china relations may stabilize a little bit contrary to what we read in the media etc my own reading is that things are not so bad as it looks on the ground uh, on on the media and i get a feeling that india china relations may not deteriorate further however it will take a long time i if not a long time at least some time to get back to the pre 2020 levels technology and innovation or something that we need to be looking out admiral karambe spoke about the technology i fully agree with him on this technology and innovation and the contest for the cutting edge technologies will continue will continue in the future and standard setting is something that we need to be looking at constantly china has been taking a lead in this we have also been trying to fight back but we need to do a lot more on this the introduction of the 5g i standards in the 3g pp was a success that india faced but that is not adequate china has put in place a huge huge kind of a setup for ensuring that standards are set as per its as per its development that are taking place in our country so therefore we need to be constantly on our toes to contest this and then ensure the standards that we want are actually put there climate change is something which is going to be an important issue on which pressure will mount on countries like india to step up please understand the green financing is going to be a major major problem as far as this particular aspect is concerned climate change and working towards climate change is easy to say but extremely difficult in terms of achieving it therefore green funding is something that we need to be working at and probably we need to set our goals correctly so that we achieve the 2070 goal which our prime minister has enunciated the supply chain resilience will continue to progress but decoupling is going to be extremely difficult we know that from the last bilateral uh, trade figures that have come up between india and china despite their efforts to decouple you find the trade figures have gone up to 125 billion dollars which is almost a 40% increase from the previous years and so therefore the supply chain resilience we can talk about we can work on but decoupling is something is going to be difficult is something that we need to understand i come to the last part of my uh, my remarks how to secure ourselves and promote our national interests one is the economic growth the first point i would like to talk about basically because all the countries that have that have actually uh, shown power or extended its power is through economic growth which admiral karambir also mentioned about based on which the development countries have wielded the power therefore we need to be constantly growing at at greater percentages than what we are looking at at this point in time and second is we need to invest a lot more in technology and innovation investment in r&d is something that we need to be looking at china did 420 billion dollars worth of r&d funding last year even our prime minister has mentioned about a 7% increase in the r&d expenditure on a yearly basis but we need to constantly look at this in addition to that in most of the countries where the government drives the r&d the industry's participation in r&d is extremely important our industry actually shuns r&d 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 abilities or r&d investment risk taking and long term investments are also something that our industry needs to look at modernization and upgrading of manufacturing actually looks uh, looks a little bleak at this point in time but we need to be working on this a lot more 
the internal stability particularly in terms of radicalization and counter insurgency efforts is something that we need to be constantly looking at on the technology front harnessing talent is something which is very important china has is running approximately 200 projects <clears throat> to attract talent from abroad and that is something that we can take a lesson from leapfrogging is something that we need to be looking at the reason for that is we are still struggling with 5g whereas china has already started deploying 6g if you are still going to do this we will be also be found wanting in 6g implementation therefore we need to leapfrog wherever we need to on select kind of technologies that we want to uh, want to excel in Uh, diplomacy is on the right lines i told you the kind of blobs of countries that china is dealing with as groups if india's diplomatic relationship is something to go by in the recent past you find that we also are concentrating on those countries and those groups of countries so that is on the right lines to my mind european union is going to be the pivot in all this and we need to be concentrating on the european union a lot more which i think is in the it's in the offing at this point in time lastly on the military side we need to build deterrence i agree with admiral karambir when he said deterrence is, is defensive in nature but at the moment i don't see an offensive capability building up in the near future therefore we need to continue to build deterrence and we need to stop competing we need to understand where we need to go we set those goals and thereafter we need to work towards them there are a lot of operations below the threshold that can be done that we need to continue to look at cooperation in the maritime domain and we need to be prepared while cooperation in the maritime domain is feasible we need to be prepared to go it alone in the continental domain and towards that extent we need to build our capabilities capacities and the infrastructure i'll stop here my time is up i'll stop here and uh, uh, i'll hand over the stage back to the mc thank you very much for your patient listening thank you sir thank you very much for the insightful and uh, comprehensive address it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our distinguished speaker ambassador saurav kumar who will be setting the stage and tone through his opening remarks to introduce our distinguished speaker ambassador saurav kumar retired from the indian foreign service as ambassador of india to the international atomic energy agency united nations industrial development organization and the un offices in vienna including outer space affairs drugs crime and to austria in october 2009 prior to this he served as ambassador to ireland and vietnam he also held other senior appointments in the cabinet secretariat and ministry of external affairs his areas of special specialization during his tenure in the government of india were nuclear as well as disarmament and international security issues He was a member of the Indian delegation to the third special session of the UN General Assembly on disarmament in 1988, and to the UN Conference on the relationship between disarmament and development in 1987. Ambassador Sarukma speaks Chinese, having begun his diplomatic career in Hong Kong and Beijing in the mid 70s under late President K R Narayan, who was then ambassador to China. Apart from continuing professional interest in China, including nuclear, space, and other strategic security issues. and multilateral international affairs in general his current academic interests include development economics and international economic relations the negotiation process apart from that physics and psychology it's a privilege having you with us sir uh, with this i would like to hand over the virtual floor to ambassador saurav kumar to uh, complement this uh, effort uh, his speech is also uh, displayed on the screen due to a, a minor mic issue with this uh, ambassador saurav kumar the floor is all yours sir Thank you, Bala. <clears throat> Thank you for that very kind introduction, generous introduction. Can you hear me? Perfect, sir. Strength five, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commodore Wasson, Chennai Center for China Studies, uh, Admiral Karambir Singh, head of the National Maritime Foundation, for organizing this very good event and for inviting me to share some thoughts. and thank you also general narsimhan for your presentation both the speakers before me have been so good the stage is already set but let me just try and <clears throat> share a few thoughts which i had prepared in anticipation of 
the military and the uh, hard security aspects being covered very well, uh, knowing the speakers. And I thought I stepped back from the day to day and uh, share a few thoughts. Please bear with me. If you, if the uh, display is, uh, I had taken it as by way of a second uh, string to the bow because I was not confident of my mic. But if the voice is audible good enough and this is a distraction, we can do without it. Please feel free to, uh, organizers, feel, please feel free. I think you can do without it because uh, we can hear you well. Okay, as you like. Yeah. So uh, the, the uh, thought I had uh, as in the concept note, as General uh, Admiral Karambir Singh also mentioned and General Nasiman, the wider need for a wider uh, view of security going beyond military security uh, to encompass all fields that go into the making of what in Chinese political lexicon is called a term comprehensive national power and with Chinese political discourse, you know, discourse posits as a continually ongoing contestation between nations uh, mirroring, uh, in my view, somewhat the game of chess, Chinese chess, Wei Qi, uh, undeclared and unacknowledged, with CNP as the primary determinant of the outcome, as uh, in keeping, uh, I think that is how Admiral Karambir Singh is also view. So uh, this is an attempt to look ahead at the Indian strategic firmament in crystal gazing mode in that uh, framework of CNP, stepping back from day to day issues. Three major point, uh, tipping points or inflection points <clears throat> uh, in Admiral Karambir Singh's language again, I found it so good that all his words are coming back uh, repeatedly. Uh, three major tipping points will kick into play for India within a few decades that will have an important bearing on its strategic outlook in the not too distant future. First, the reversal of the current favorable youthful demography of the country. Second, <clears throat> likelihood of climate change globally beginning to affect the Indian subcontinent, particularly harshly. And lastly, the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, we all know the technologies, that is already underway, but with its ramifications yet unclear, and which will unfold in the not too distant future fully. So, <clears throat> it's difficult to estimate the timeline of these turning points, but they are all equally important. And <clears throat> the first is perhaps the most definitively delineated with little doubt about its imminence and less uncertainty in the time left for its manifestation. It might seem odd to talk about it today when we are at the beginning of that cusp, but then just to remember that it is not going to last forever. And the second is a little more uncertain in the time it will take to make its impact felt, but only a little, I would say, possibly sooner rather than later. More importantly, it is it comes with far greater uncertainty in the magnitude of its impact than can be anticipated today. And the third, the technology angle in comparison is a wild card. No knowing which way and how far it will go or take you with it. Several possibilities, most in the category of known unknowns, true to the nature of variables in the strategic domain. These ticking time clocks, I would like to suggest, <clears throat> form the overarching backdrop to any cogitation on the strategic environment of the nation. They are the building blocks, the perceptions that can be, in my opinion, a useful starting point for any strategic analyst exerting himself or herself in strategic planning mode putatively to identify the boundary conditions within which the standard SWOT analysis taking ground realities <clears throat> into account in a more granular way that SWOT analysis is undertaken for gaining clarity on the action points or options as our concept note calls them which taken together in a, as a coherent whole, when woven together into a coherent whole, it can complete with the instrumentalities for achieving them, could constitute a possible grand strategy for the nation. So all these are well known. We don't really need expatiation. I would only like to make a few observations on each. 
see the demographic dividend, for example, yeah. <clears throat> in 2018, India entered the phase when the working age population began to outstrip its dependent population, the beginning of the dividend period. This happy circumstance has been modeled by demographers to last until about 2055, <clears throat> when the ratios are expected to begin to reverse. So these three decades and a half are thus a golden period in any weighing of the strategic potential of the country. <clears throat> but that potential will be realized only if the bulge in the working population segment is put to productive use, obviously. <clears throat> that is, the youth and others constituting that bulge are employed gainfully. <clears throat> a prerequisite for that, quite obviously again, is that they be employable in terms of the range of skill sets they encompass collectively vis-a-vis -vis the requirements of the productive, that is the manufacturing and other business sectors of the economy. If there is a mismatch <clears throat> between the two, as unfortunately is the case at present, the potential will lie dormant and even be liable to turning into a liability. The proportion of working age population actually working gainfully has been falling over the years, as we know, and is not even 50% today. Either or both of these two poll, uh, polls, that is the available skill sets on the one end and available productive opportunities at the other, will need to be altered, steered, so as to bring them closer, if that dormancy is to be avoided and the potential demographic dividend prevented from becoming a demographic drag or worse, turning into a demographic demon. Skilling has to be undertaken in overdrive, no two opinions there, to close the skilling gap, but that is easier said than done, as is evident from the tardy progress of the declared national program for skilling. And despite a commitment to it, at the highest levels of leadership in the country. The problem to my mind is a cognitive one of determining how to attune the skilling programs to the requirements of the market. The dynamic nature of the skills in demand in an economy seeking to upgrade itself technologically makes it a shifting target. And this is bound to get worse with intensifying induction of AI in the economy because of the much more rapid pace of change and obsolescence in the digital age. That has, in fact, already begun to happen in an incipient way. Global warming and climate change, <clears throat> the likely irreversible and possibly catastrophic environmental and ecological changes on a planetary scale, setting in in two or three decades, hold the prospect of creating a stark conflict between economic growth and ecological balance. And actually no more than a dozen years maybe, if the more desirable, but possibly already infeasible goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees over pre-industrialization levels is taken as the reference point. So it has long been, long been recognized that there has to be a shift away from preoccupation with economic growth of any kind and at any cost towards truly sustainable development. But that again is easier said than done, as is evident from the state of play worldwide, not just in India, in the last three decades or so since that concept came into vogue. Lip service to that desideratum has not been accompanied by commensurate action. It is, to my mind, a cognitive problem again. And there are no easy answers, neither in the domestic context nor internationally, each for reasons of their own too well known to be recounted here. Technological type, <clears throat> the highly creative, but at the same time hugely disruptive technological advances of the fourth industrial revolution in an entire gamut of fields, AI of course, <clears throat> big data, robotics, genomics, bioengineering are likely to be, these are likely to be the most pertinent dimension of CNP in the future. 
the game changing impact of technological advances in the security and military fields above all is already pounding the politico economic horizon with new and hitherto unimaginable normals and mind boggling socio political and socio economic implications here it is not so much a cognitive problem as one of the nation's capacities institutional and politico managerial for embracing the emerging technologies and nurturing and spawning its offshoots in case of the first three industrial revolutions india could only tail and trail the leaders but that was all that was possible for it to do because of the historical circumstances of the day that is just not good enough now in case of the fourth industrial revolution in which we have to find a way of getting ahead of the curve to ensure technological efflorescence particular mention has to be made in this context of ai which is increasingly being recognized to be not just another technology but something with much wider ramifications including most notably potential to outsmart and even rival the human species itself all powerful ai engineered algorithm driven black boxes are likely to be the alpha and omega of manufacturing in an ai's world which is predicted to be characterized by obsolescence of the economies of scale rationally that underlay mass production in the second and third industrial revolutions that is because of the possibility of low cost and yet flexible and customized 3d printing and internet of things manufacturing suited to the varying needs of a diverse clientele opened up by ai there would be complete near complete replacement of repetitive unskilled jobs by ai driven routines that would bring down the requirement of labor inputs drastically and also reduce the share of labor costs in the overall cost of production with obvious implications for choice of location of manufacturing for investors in the future back to the developed world with gainful employment opportunities only for a few at the upper end of the education training skilling continuum i have a few more observations on the AI, on ai because of its importance but i think time uh, will i not permit so i will skip these and simply underline that each of these challenges leaves us with no more than a few decades to undertake uh, to do whatever it is that we wish to do else it might be too late we don't have an eternity and this is true even individually for each of the challenges and so much more with all of them acting together so to my mind this brings home the importance of the time factor in strategic discourse something that is well known of course but not oft remembered in my view and leisurely strategizing often mistaken for considered strategizing if that sounds a little over consider that 3 years out of the 36 or 37 that we have that is 8% of the demographic demographic dividend period have already gone by with no sense of loss or urgency felt apparently in the government's decision making machinery so a finite resource a finite thing is being lost but without a sense of crisis additionally there is the impact late the latest mega trend to hit the strategic firmament worldwide and in india too that of the onset of pandemics of contagious diseases brought home in a tellingly harsh manner by covid which has roiled economies and life the world over including our own this is something that is not going to go away as we know and the capacity of a nation to withstand mass infections without letting its health management systems knuckle under clearly is going to henceforth constitute a major element of cnp it's part of the politico managerial institutional capacity which i want to refer to earlier and want to emphasize as a key element of the strategic firmament so <clears throat> this is the main point i wish to draw attention to the limited window of opportunity the nation has left to make it good or not at all 
the exact time span available is not important. The mere fact of its being pretty short should be enough, in my view, to turbocharge the strategic establishment. The impending centenary of the Republic in 2050, approximately three decades from now, provides just the right time period, I would submit, for a determined national effort to be launched in mission mode, with that target date as a deadline for accomplishing appropriate preventive and remedial action in each area. So <clears throat> with that we can of the over, these overarching trends also point to the direction in which we need to move, but we need to turn our attention away from the destinations also to the ground realities of where we are at present in order to be able to chart a route to go from where we are to where we wish to go. Here I would wish to, I would submit that geopolitical fault lines are not the only realities to be factored in, important and primary though they are. And they were so well outlined by both the previous speakers. Uh, the neighborhood, importance of neighborhood, the two C's, uh, Admiral Karambi Singh mentioned, is very good coinage preferred so security partner and um, in place of net security provider or even supplement could be both preferred security partner as a net security provider and his emphasis on winning or sustaining not just the wars but also the in the competition continuum winning the con competition piece and the very nice quote chinese point of view wars will not be fought don't think that wars will not be fought because we should win Balancing, which is par for the course, I would have a few, one of the very correct, there's no question, and the environment is conducive, so why not? But some questions about its reliability always need to be borne in mind in the, in the international diplomatic domain, because it's a dicey game. And the very good points General Nasimar also implies, the picture of the neighborhood he painted, technology and innovation, standard setting, importance, the importance of sustaining a high rate of growth. So these uh, China intent, uh, all these, uh, the geopolitical fault lines, geostrategic, China, a uh, China intent upon seeking to bend India to its will in cold, albeit crazy miscalculation about its power potential. And I am not one of those here, I may say, to concede, which we often do a little too easily, of a vast differential between the power potential of China and India. <clears throat> and it's often taken as a starting point. There is asymmetry, no question. But we need to also keep in mind or bear uh, sometimes how much is it and is it always a kind of you know 10 feet tall situation it's not so china challenge then bracing up for a two front scenario and so on so i would like to foreground only one aspect and that is squarely in the domestic domain which is the institutional and political managerial capacity of the indian state which to my mind is a very important component of clp because to bring to bear the uh, advantages of all your other elements of power, hard power and others, you need the political managerial capacity and the institutional capacity, not in an individual sense, I don't mean. So, and touch upon one in the external diplomatic domain, namely US-China relations, that impinges and is likely to impinge even more on India's strategic fortunes in the future. And there are many others, of course, but cannot all be covered in a brief presentation. I see that I tried to, but I have not succeeded in managing my time. It's close to 20 minutes. So may I just conclude with a very brief and passing mention of these uh, the two points that I have in mind and, and uh, make a few uh, ideas for which I thought as options or, or action points I prefer rather than options because options don't exist. Options suggest that there are things lying on the shelf 
and you can pick them up off the shelf. I think it's uh, there are more action points. Options is something that can only be created and by practitioners in a closed door setting. Um, my favorite example is the Bangladesh war. If uh, uh, con confabulation had tried to identify options in the uh, first months of say, 71, it would not have been in anyone's mind what happened, what was done. That was a, an option that was created in the by the practitioners of the day. So options is always something which is non-existent but brought into existence by a determined. So uh, on the US-China relations, the obvious thing, of course, see the environment has turned conducive for India. And there is worldwide concern about China. So it's a no-brainer to not to do balancing, counter, countervailing power. Uh, no question, it has to be done. But we all know, we can most recently, the shenanigans that go on over Ukraine, the innate proclivity of some of the leading countervailing powers that we uh, are hoping to invoke of blind spots where the, the, the treatment meted out to formal allies in the recent past all of them will need to be borne in mind and very carefully looked at when it comes to concretizing what it is that can be done together and with what in mind. So beefing up what is again a no-brainer, absolutely, and there is immense room for action. I again am not one of those, there are, there are people, our discourse is full of opinions, berating what, if you look at the early thing and all the way up. So dismissive were we ourselves. So I am not at all one of them. I value it very much and I think there is immense scope and this is not the place to go because again there are things which are more appropriately done in closed settings. But from a strategic uh, analysis point of view, the potential is immense and there's no question. But I would only say that apart from the more tangible military aspects, which again are quite a few, and, but that's not my field and that's not necessary in such a distinguished gathering. It is the others which also offer science and technology above all. Even basic science and technology because it's the stepping stone for technology of tomorrow. So many fields which the thing and we have already expanded and brought the quad in that direction. But I would say much further room for action is possible there. So the, in the US China angle, there was only that little caveat I put about reliability and on, and on countervailing power balancing caveat about reliability of external balancing because it is always driven by naturally by the interests of the other state. So a concern about China or containing China is a very broad brush concern, not less always adequate for <clears throat> basing concrete strategizing. Conceptual strategizing, yes. The other aspect, because time very quickly, institutional capacity is General uh, Admiral Karambir Singh outlined so well. I think the Rand study he mentioned the seven points which capture what was going on and also illustrate my point. We did not see in the Indian discourse recognition of any of those seven points or that kind of thing for a full eternity almost. 
country was at a loss to understand what are the Chinese up to in 2020. We were somebody, Eastern sector, Western sector tactics, gaining ground, territory. It took so long to figure out that this is a coercive game and so on. I am not asking for the moon and possibly practitioners within the system understood it much better and much earlier and we do not know so it's not but i do feel that institutional capacity to comprehend trends strategic trends can do with much improvement I'm not criticizing individuals. I am myself part of that discourse. I can't claim any clairvoyance. Uh, uh, thing. So it is not an individual thing. It is the institutional capacity. And I don't need to labor that point, I think. So I will leave it there time again. So very last, some ideas in terms of action points. Some are more or less obvious to my mind. So no need for me to try and retreat. But these are a bit out of thing but i request you to bear because to my mind there are no easy short term answers or they are obvious answers they don't need underlining it is the longer term more difficult answers that might need bear mention because we lose sight of them in the context of strategizing or push it up to the higher levels as outside our domain but i i submit in all humility that the strategist strategic analyst domain cannot be partial domain. There is no such thing as partial strategizing. It has to be comprehensive strategizing always. So from that point of view, there is no escaping revamping of the ecosystem for S&T R&D, which is the key to everything. We understand that we need to buy time. India has lots of potential, but it needs time to realize that potential. We, the whole strategy is a strategy of buying time. So while we focus on the interregnum during that time, which is very important, that is immediate, we also need to see what it is that will take us out of this in the, immediate, in the medium or long-term future. And technology, obviously, is the key to that. So it should be the linchpin of our external diplomacy relationship. It is, and yet it can be better. In, to my mind, a constant exercise by the SNT establishment to identify, when Nassiman mentioned, the cutting edge technologies, which are gaps, and there will be always gaps, plenty, which we could do with in collaborative mode. And then mandating of Indian embassies with appropriate scientific uh, personnel, uh, which are their scientific attaches, but as far as I know, only in uh, one, two, three places but almost everywhere because every country has some strengths so i then with on the basis of a clearly identified collaboration potential mandating of the embassies to seek focused and dedicated partnerships with countries in their jurisdiction uh, and realize them we have so little time that's my whole point so in these two so it cannot be in. so <clears throat> similarly low cost mass education linked to the alleviation of the problem of unemployment, which is, to my mind, the most vexing one. Nobody has an answer. And new ground has been broken by government recently, by, by the Prime Minister himself, uh, always with original ideas, to appeal to the youth not to seek of being employed, but, but to provide employment, i.e. entrepreneurship. So that is the direction, but how? The, the literature, new ideas are talking of the entrepreneurial state and grooming the entrepreneurial citizen and the eco infrastructure ecosystem needed to spawn that. So these are strategic choices, strategic decisions. They are not very, very far away because there is no answer uh, as I, for the reasons I outlined in these three decades to be to get their results to deliver. So another, for example, of this one, harnessing of AI and drone technologies in mission mode to empower the myriad economic and social undertakings in the unorganized and informal sectors. 
which are the backbone of the economy and of society. They are not the talking classes, but they are the backbone. All figures we all know, whether in terms of population, employment. Funding. So Kirana stores, for example, who still form 80% of the distribution, if they are empowered with AI-driven and drone technologies, it can be of much greater benefit in addition to leaving the large scale private sector, which is there and which does its job, which should be facilitated, but which need not capture all our attention. Likewise, in MSME manufacturing, which is really the manufacturing. So to foster AI, there, KVIC and other farm threshold uh, 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 you know, agro-based industries. So these will need to be done through a PPP model, public-private partnership led by the government, as it is not something that can be left to trickle down from to the bottom rungs of the social economic ladder under the ages of the corporate sector or a free market. As that, then they may never come to be, or, or too late. Trickling down may happen too late. And finally, likewise, a social security net for the urban poor, which was demonstrated most tellingly and harshly during the migrations of the COVID crisis, because these make pins meet of strategizing, to my mind. So they are not far fetching. I thank you for your patience and my apologies for exceeding my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for setting the ball rolling and setting the stage for the forthcoming sessions. Uh, I consider myself fortunate for getting the opportunity to present this vote of thanks on behalf of the Chennai Center for China Studies and National Maritime Foundation. We express our sincere thanks and gratitude to Admiral Karambir Singh sir, Lieutenant General S. N. Narsiman sir and Ambassador Saurav Kumar sir for their kind presence despite their busy schedule. It has been our fortune to find such eminent and distinguished speakers in most of our endeavors to understand the state of affairs in India's external environment. As we have seen, this inaugural session has set a roadmap in very precise and clear terms. We all present here take note of the vision expressed in conducting further proceedings of this conference today. Sirs, on, once again on behalf of Chennai Center for China Studies and National Maritime Foundation, we greatly value your presence here and would like to express a gratitude for taking a valuable time to be with us. As organizers, we look forward to having you move and Jai Hen. With this, we come to the conclusion of the inaugural session. And we shall now be moving on to our session one. And it is my pleasure to introduce our chair for the session, for the session one, Sri M. R. Shivraman IAS, sir. Sri M. R. Shivraman IAS retired, joined the service of Madhya Pradesh Kada. He's a qualified pilot, started his major assignment as collector at a very young age of 25. He held several important posts as Joint Secretary in the Government of India in the Ministry of Finance, was Finance and Planning Secretary in the Government of Madhya Pradesh for over five years, while being Additional Secretary in the Ministry of Commerce, was appointed to DGCA India and made noteworthy contributions in the training of pilots, air safety audit, aerodrome manuals and privatization of the Indian skies among many others. Subsequently, he was appointed as Revenue Secretary of the Government of India, where he was responsible for introducing major tax reforms. He introduced the pan and income tax and started the computerization of the functioning of the central excise and customs of India. Subsequently, he served as executive director in the IMF in Washington, DC with the rank of ambassador to the US during 1996-1999. Sri M. R. Sivraman pushed in the IMF the case of the emergent market economies to use PPP-based GDP for determining quotas and voting strength, which ultimately the IMF adopted. He was also one of the first advisors chosen to the newly formed UN Security Council Committee on counterterrorism, in which role he played the UNSC to prepare member countries to implement the UN Resolution 1373 passed after the 9-11 attacks. Thank you, sir, for accepting to be a chair. And uh, I request Sri Shivraman, sir, to uh, quickly give his chair remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Bola, for that very the comments that you have made on me. It was my good fortune to have served the government of India for nearly 40 years and also to serve the country outside India. And as far as we 
subject matter of the session is concerned, I don't think I'm qualified enough to speak on that because I'm going to speak on another subject which is a very important subject and that will be Indian economy, particularly in the context of the neighboring countries, geoeconomic situation. Because we are very distinguished speakers like uh, Lieutenant General Shankar and Air Marshal Vartaman and also Group Captain David Chandrasekharan, I would not like to encroach on that time. So I would straight away request Lieutenant General P.R. Shankar to make his presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. Thanks for calling me over. At the outset, uh, my greetings to the chair. Thank you, uh, Commander Vasan, sir, for calling me over. And uh, a great hello to my friend, General Narsimhan. Regards to Air Marshal Vartman. And a hello to Mr. Saurav Kumar, who gave a nice talk just now. Uh, I'll talk on India's uh, complex strategic environment. Uh, I'll go along with it. I'll just outline what is the complexity which is involved in our environment. And I'll uh, share a presentation with all of you. One minute, I'll just share my screen and then we'll go. Bala, can you see the screen? Uh, it's coming up, sir. Yeah, it's come? Uh, yet to, sir. You just have to go to your presentation, sir. Yeah. Can we see it now? Yes, sir. Can you please make it full screen, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. We are okay yes, with it. Thank you, sir. Strength five. Good, good to go, sir. Right. Thank you. Uh, morning, gentlemen. I'll go over and you know run over the uh, complex strategic environment which you are facing. Uh, I might not give you great solutions, but I'll outline the problem at least. We know that there's a shift in the global economic power from west to east. It's not only uh, global economic power; it's all kinds of power. And we also know that India is at the center of major populations. Right, and that actually starts defining the complexity of our you know, strategic environment. And if you have a look at it, India is central to all conflict zones, also, right? Whether they are in Africa, Middle East, and West Asia, South Asia, and Asia Pacific. And uh, very interestingly, India is central to big spenders and net defense importers. All those in red are net defense importers. All those in blue are net defense exporters. So we are in a, and each of these factors uh, makes our whole life complex. And this is important. We will come to climate change and disaster. India is central to most disasters in the past, you know, about two decades, which I've mapped out here. Now it is in this context that we should first start when you look at our con complex. Uh, environment what are the national interests no one has laid them down but if you look at the uh, preamble to the constitution it's very clear it is protection of our land borders coastline island territories and sea land from external aggression when you talk of external aggression it goes without uh, saying it's we talk of china and pakistan and when you're talking of the indian ocean region from the gulf of Aden to the malacca straits we have our interests there right it is also to internally protect the people and the constitution against terrorism, insurgency, and militancy. Very often, we forget this fact that we have to protect our constitution. Right? Here, I've only put the issue, internal issue, but there is also an external aggression onto this, which complicates our environment. And when you also look at it from a little different point of view, our national interest involves protection of people in out-of-area contingencies and natural disasters from abroad. After all, even two years back, we had to evacuate people from Wuhan. We had to evacuate people from Yemen, and so have you. So this is all this complicates the strategic environment in which we exist. Right. Let's look at this strategic environment in a slightly different manner than what it is being spoken of so far. We'll talk of it through the Mandala theory. We'll talk of the internal issues, the immediate neighborhood, near neighborhood, what do we face, the intermediate neighborhood, 
what are the opportunities and problems and then the strategic relations that external to all of this and we'll i'll take each of this and give a broad brush on all now let's look at our in immediate neighborhood which i consider to be pakistan china and the indian ocean region we know that it is adversarial and direct these are our main adversaries it's constantly challenging us it's constantly threatening us there's a huge threat of collusivity and we are on in the middle of a intense nuclear environment we also are in the long term proxy and gray zone contestation which has been explained earlier by the naval chief and all before me and i think this is one of the most complex environment historically and across the globe right and we are in the center of it i'd like to speak a minute on china we all know that china is our main adversary and a lot of people have said look china is going to do this china is going to do that i have a different view but but that's it for a different day i'll make just one or cup, a few points china is going through a period of intense revisionism the china we saw for the past 20 years is not the china we're going to see in the next 20 years ambassador sarab kumar spoke of a demographic dividend and a problem which is going to come ahead that's 30 years ahead china has already entered that problem is going through a period of uh, demographic decline and with it economic decline for many many people say that china has peaked right but then does it make it less troublesome no china will be the most troublesome neighbor we are going to have and as against what general narsimhan said i'll leave it to you will a nation which is over militarizing demographically declining be altruistic towards india to maintain its relationship and stabilize its relationship when india is one of the most major its most major competitors is a point which all of us have to think now when you look at the near neighborhood there are neighbors afghanistan maldives sri lanka myanmar bangladesh bhutan and nepal they are all been prone to turmoil and our relationship with them has been episodic sometimes good sometimes bad and sometimes hot and sometimes cold they keep constantly hedging against india this is something they sh- we need to realize we are the big brother for them around the overbearing big brother whichever way side we turn we crush them that's their view right and it is through these countries that we get an indirect but a dangerous threat what is happening in myanmar is not a cake walk for any one of us if china gets a foothold and if that china myanmar economic corridor comes through and they get hold foothold into the kaikaf you port please understand that india's flanks would have been turned permanently then all this fighting across the lac loses its meaning the same thing happens if in the next 30 40 years hamban dota becomes a chinese naval base that's how complex it is and then we come the our southern coast comes under direct missile threat right and there is also an ethnic issue which uh, you know triggers our internal matters the challenge india faces and which we need to be cognizant of at which jal narsimhan also spoke and uh, mr sarab kumar also spoke is to keep all these people in our sphere of influence in some form or the other when you look at the intermediate neighborhood and you go little away you're talking of central asia south korea japan asia and australia africa and middle east here india has to be in a competitive and a co- stroke cooperative mode on and off our competitiveness might be with some of our partners in some of these places as also our adversaries we have tremendous energy and trade links especially with the middle east and the central asia being a energy deficient nation we also have historical linkages especially with asia and and africa and this will lead to contestation with china as an emerging power right and these all areas also are prone to turmoil and are big battlefront for big power contests we know what's happening today 
in Central Asia and East Europe, Ukraine and Russia, Middle East, Africa, and of course, South China Sea. We also have good strategic partnerships in this intermediate neighborhood with Japan and an emerging one with Australia and a very stable relationship with uh, South Korea. The challenge here is how do we leverage these to our advantage? The immediate neighborhood, intermediate neighborhood is part of the ongoing conflict zones. And this just complicates from our near to the intermediate. When you look at the strategic relationships far away, you look at a whole lot of interdependency. We know that in the past 70 years, we've not been able to achieve uh, a great amount of strategic autonomy. We are still dependent on Russia, we are dependent on France, we are dependent on Israel and USA, and to a large extent on the EU for strategic purposes, whether it's nuclear, whether it's weapons, whether it is technology. Why am I saying we are dependent on technology? While we are a great technology powerhouse, have we been able to put things together for ourselves? No, we depend on others to put things for us. Again, we are going to have a co cooperative and a competitive uh, landscape in this area. And we also have to be clear that we are going to have changing power equations in this area. Right. And that brings me to the crux of the issue. And the most complex of our strategic equations that are our internal issues. The day we can get off our, over our internal issues, I think we will be a power of in our own uh, right. And I just listed them off the cuff. Some are okay, some are not okay. We know that we are energy deficient. Are we making enough effort to offset this? Is a moot question. We are going to be subject to climate change. And we are going to be subject to climate change in a big way. And it's already happening. Right? And we are going to be water deficient. The day we are going to be getting into the water scarcity zone, is a day when your economy is going to get roiled because we still are an agricultural country and dependent on water intense crops like rice, wheat, sugarcane. Are we doing enough for ourselves? We are in one of the most disaster prone areas. The kind of earthquakes we've gone through, the kind of uh, you know other disasters we've gone through is not funny, whether it's mudslides, earthquakes. And I'm sitting in a place which is affected every year by tornadoes and cyclones. But that is a different story. The gut of gut is our partisan politics. We are looking at a situation where even on national issues of national importance, our politics are competitive in nature and offer bitter and acidic towards each other. Gone are the days when oppositions and the ruling parties could look above a threshold at national issues. And this is going to be our biggest challenge. And like I said, we are still strategically dependent. There is no place, there is no sector where you can confidently say in India that we are strategically independent. And this dependence complicates issues far beyond what we can think. Then, of course, we have this problem of lack of strategic culture, right? And that is something which we don't think beyond a point. And this lack of strategic culture and our partisan politics take, doesn't take us too far. It actually makes us underperform. It actually undercuts the potential which India has. We have far greater potential than we actually perform. We have to contend with our proxy war in JNK, that is a given. The insurgencies of the Northeast, say about four or five years back, seem to have vanished. But they have now come alive again for many reasons. And whatever the situation in Myanmar is happening, they're going to be plaguing us for a long and they're going to be a dead weight on our progress. The new problem, which is increasing by the day, is a, are the ethnic and religious uh, fractures which are manifesting themselves in myriad ways across the political and the geopolitical spectrum.
unknown caller. Right? One minute. Now, besides this, we lack a defense industrial base and we have inadequate budgets and capacities. But to offset all this, we still have a demographic dividend, which is propelling our fastest growing economy in the world. You can't deny that. The challenge before that, us, is how do you, you know, handle all this and put it in the right time frame. Right. We also have an issue of continental versus a maritime debate. Admiral Karambir touched upon it in the outline. But let me put it across this way. There is no debate in the way, way I look at it. The continental and the maritime have to coexist. If you look at it in the near future, the continental is uh, alive and kicking. After all, you have a gorilla on our head in, the, in China uh, along the, the LAC, and you can't wish it away. It wants to change the status quo every second day. Right? And then, of course, you have a toxic neighbor like Pakistan who's fueling all kinds of things into our hinterland. So, if you look at the near term, it is a continental which we'll have to pay attention to. But if you look at, at the long term, it is a maritime which we have to look at. And the, the complexity we have is how do you manage both these in a balanced manner. Right. I'll leave you with a military thought, being a military man. The question which most of us ask ourselves is, are the Indian Armed Forces more modern enough to defend India? Are we strong enough? The answer is yes. You just have to look at our space, nuclear technology, missile program, our shipbuilding efforts, our gun technology, aircraft technology with Tejas having come in, and our communications prowess. And the answer is very clear. Can we defend India? Yes. But let's look at it a little larger than this. That's where the complexity of our environment comes in. Are the Indian Armed Forces modern enough for a regional power, which is destined to be the third largest economy shortly? The gap is here. How do you bridge this gap is the thing. And the answer is not it, unless we shift focus to be a sea power. That's why I said the maritime is as important as a continental. The continental is today, the maritime is tomorrow. We need to fill in major capacity gaps and attune ourselves to the oncoming storm of disruption in military affairs. And this disruption in military affairs is going to happen along the technology spectrum. I could speak for two days about it, but I'll desist. This has been touched upon earlier also. What is the opportunity? Like I said, China has in some instability. It's got a cooling economy. economy. Its BRI has a pushback. Its military is in transition. And most importantly, its population is in decline. Pakistan is economically defect, defunct. And this, to me, gives a window of opportunity for us to set our house right and move ahead. With this, I thank you and Jai Hind. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving this patient hearing. And I'm, uh, I'll take on any questions uh, later. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Lieutenant General Shankar, sir. Uh, you have been the Director General of Artillery in the Indian Army, having holding vast operational experience and has held many important command, staff, and instructional appointments. And you have also given a great impetus to the modernization of artillery through your indigenization efforts, having a deep understanding and experience of a successful defense planning and acquisition planning over a decade. Thank you very much, sir. You have touched upon many aspects for throwing light on immediate neighborhood uh, strategic relationship and uh, having put forth uh, India's internal issues and you also touched upon the continental and maritime debate. It is my pleasure and privilege to call upon our uh, next speaker for today who will touch upon the uh, role of air power and stable strategic environment will be presented by Air Marshal Yes Vardaman sir. The officer joined the Indian Air Force as a fighter pilot in 1973. In his remarkable career spanning over 39 years, he flew 4,000 hours in over 40 different types of aircraft. He commanded a MiG-21 squadron in the Northeast during the Kargil conflict in 1999. He coordinated the aircraft upgradation that proved instrumental in the success of air campaign. In 2001, he was in command of an operational air base on the western border when the country was close to a war with Pakistan after the attack on the Indian parliament. 
His diplomatic assignments include a three-year deputation to Paris, responsible for defense cooperation with France, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. On promotion to Air Marshal, he was appointed as a senior air staff officer responsible for air operations of the Strategic Central Air Command. Thereafter, he was promoted and appointed Air Officer Commanding in Chief of Eastern Air Command during a crucial period of the nation's India's Look East policy. This command spread over 12 states of the Indian Union and is very critical to India's national security. With this, I would like to hand over the floor to Air Marshal Yes Vardaman, sir. So over to you, sir. Uh, so you're muted, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Bala. Uh, the chairman, uh, C3S, uh, Commodore Vasan, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for giving me the privilege uh, to take part in this uh, day-long uh, security dialogue. Um, I will just share my screen. Is it visible? Uh, yet to come up, sir. It's coming up, sir. Yes, sir. Right. <clears throat> uh, this morning, we've had some very interesting uh, talks and the very foundation for our uh, uh, strategic uh, future has been established. Um, the problems that uh, come over in the future, in the immediate neighborhood to the future, have been covered very, very well. Now I'm just left to cover on the air power aspect uh, uh, in uh, in India. Um, what I will do is uh, I will talk a bit about history to emphasis, emphasize the role of air power, our doctrine, which is the Indian Air Force doctrine, and how the Indian Air Force has been battle tested. I'll give a few examples. And what is our strategic reach? When uh, the general talked of the intermediate neighborhood and the strategic uh, uh, environment, uh, we need to have the strategic reach as well, so I will uh, dwell on it a bit. And how does the Indian Air Force fit into interoper interoperability as a global air power, as a global air power? So how do we fit into the scheme of things? If we talk of Quad, if we talk of AUKUS, and one fine day, we think that uh, the Indian Air Force should uh, uh, involve in a global air operation. How do we fit in and how are we assessed internationally? Uh, we'll talk a little bit on the post Galwan, the defense of the nation. While we have an offensive posture, the Air Force basically looks at an offensive posture all the time. We are not defensive in nature. We, we look to go well beyond the international borders and to strike where it hurts the enemy. And while we do that, we are very careful to ensure that the Indian nation is protected from any air threat. A uh, little bit on the human, humanitarian and disaster relief operations, our force multipliers, which is actually our uh, Achilles heel. Um, the Atman Nirbar Bharat, which uh, the general just talked about, the theaterization, couple of slides on the theaterization, and uh, then I will conclude. Uh, I will use extensive number of uh, slides basically to uh, give a better understanding to uh, the uh, audience that we have, where you find the knowledge and uh, let me say the various uh, weapon aspects of the Indian Air Force are generally not aware. So I'll use them extensively. Uh, when we talk of the continental and maritime debate, the air power straddles both of them. So whether it's a continental uh, campaign or a maritime campaign, the Indian Air Force will straddle all across. And hence, we find that we play a very, very crucial aspect uh, uh, in our uh, area. Now, are we ready? Let us see. Um, when we talk uh, about the history of the Air Force, we started sometime in 1903 with the Wright brothers. And thereafter, we have, uh, the air power has influenced the uh, outcome of almost all wars in the last 118 years. You name any of the air, uh, uh, any of the wars that have happened on, on the globe. And uh, the air power is a destructive power. It's got immense destructive uh, capabilities. Uh, we've seen it in Pearl Harbor. We have seen it uh, in the uh, mass bombing campaign over uh, Germany. You can see here an example, 1,000 bombers struck the uh, city of Cologne during the night. And the next morning, 
there was uh, no Cologne on the map of uh, Germany. Um, yeah, of course, everybody knows of the di nuclear disaster over Hiroshima, the Vietnam War, where uh, almost the entire North Vietnam was plastered with uh, millions and tons of uh, bombs. The attack on the, uh, Saddam's palace and how uh, within a matter of 48 hours, uh, uh, Iraq was almost crippled for uh, uh, the Gulf. Uh, um, uh. In the hands of a terrorist, the air power is a dangerous and deadly weapon. Uh, everybody knows of the 9-11 uh, where uh, uh, the America was brought down to the knees on the destruction of the world, world Trade Towers. As far as we are concerned, everybody, I mean, we all know about the Purulia arms drop when uh, 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 Latvian national brought in a whole heap of arms, almost uh, four tons of weapons into uh, West Bengal. The LTT air raid over Colombo. Uh, fortunately, during this period, I was the head of intelligence of the Air Force and uh, was uh, uh, deeply involved in the, uh, trying to analyze this particular campaign. And here was a simple light aircraft, a Zlin 143, which could fly at a maximum speed of about 260 kilometers per hour, and it could carry 200 kg bombs. The kind of panic and havoc it created over Colombo is unbelievable. And these two aircraft had created enough damage uh, before they were uh, shot down. <clears throat> Matthias Rust, sometime in 1987, landed in the center of the Red Square and uh, woke up all the nations that, uh, you know, the skies are open to be exploited not only by the Air Force, but uh, by commercial operations as well as intruders who can penetrate anywhere. The latest weapon now, when as uh, the things, the air power keeps evolving, is uh, the drone warfare. And we have seen enough instances uh, um, being used of, or in the recent past by the Yemeni Houthi uh, rebels over Saudi Arabia and UAE. The IAF doctrine came out sometime in 2012. And it is an open document, it's declassified, and it is, uh, it is uh, expected that citizens will be able to suggest or uh, um, uh, improve upon this IAF doctrine. And it basically states air power is inherently strategic in nature, and its tactical application to own, it would only fritter away its prime advantage of creating strategic effects. It's so very relevant in the seminar of today. The seminar talks of strategic nature and air power is inherently strategic. The doctrine by itself is not a dogma. It changes and it evolves. Like for instance, today we have a new threat in terms of drones. So we keep evolving and handling the emergencies that come up and the new weapon systems that come up uh, as a threat to any nation. When we talk of the area of operations, it, this map actually uh, um, transcribes the region which uh, the general just spoke about, the intermediate uh, neighborhood. So sometime in 2005, when the defense minister, I'm aware of that, of course, when the operational directive came out for the Indian uh, military, uh, the area of operations which was defined, that way we should have influence and we should be able to impact, started from the Gulf of Aden on the port of uh, uh, Mombasa on the on the East African coast to the Straits of Malacca. So this is the area of operations for uh, the Indian Air Force. And the Indian Air Force has gradually expanded in a manner to handle this area. And this is a big change because uh, during the time when I was a combat pilot, all I had to do was go, go 150 kilometers into Pakistan and come back uh, after bombing uh, Pakistan. But today, we talk of Straits of Malacca, we talk of Mombasa, we talk of Somalia. So there is a complete uh, difference in the kind of strategic reach the Indian Air Force can. So uh, ever since 1971, our Indian Air Force has been tested every uh, uh, tested many times and has proved worthy every time. The Op Cactus, when we saved uh, Maldives, it was in 1988. Uh, Ock Pawan in uh, Sri Lanka, we had a crucial role to play along with uh, uh, the Army and, uh, and the Navy. 
Op Megdod, which is still continuing over the Siachen Glacier, and uh, we have been uh, continuously, daily, daily op uh, operating with uh, the Indian Army over the icy heights. Uh, Operation Safed Sagar in Kargil, where uh, we played a crucial role in the turn of events uh, uh, during uh, Kargil, and uh, uh, we contributed to the victory along with the Indian Army, and of course uh, the recent uh, one in Balakot. Now, uh, uh, the Indian Air Force has not been called upon frequently, but when it has been called upon, we have always been ready to hit um, uh, uh, at the shortest possible uh, notice. And one of the cleanest campaigns uh, uh, attack which happened in a matter of uh, 10 to 20 minutes was the recent strike on Balakot. Now, when we talk of the intermediate neighborhood, and the we need to have the strategic reach to make sure we are able to make an impact in the area that is within this area. Now, if you look at it, we have our aeroplanes, the Su-30 MKI, the Rafale, and the Mirage 2000. It can go and touch the African coast. It can go and hit the Straits of Malacca and come back to India, on to the Indian mainland. That is the kind of reach all these three aeroplanes that we have. And we have 270 of these uh, Su-30s, we have 36 Rafals, and we have almost 50 Mirage 2000s. This is a huge uh, um, uh, weapons, uh, weapon force, I would say, which can go far into the, uh, into the neighborhood and strike with precision. I also want to make one point here. If you notice, the Rafale, which comes from, uh, which is flown in from uh, uh, Marseille, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the west coast of uh, France, flies nonstop from France to India. And that is the kind of uh, range the Rafale has. Of course, it has to be refueled in the air, and that is the Achilles heel, which I will talk about in uh, subsequently. When we talk of uh, the transport operations, where we have the C-17 Globemaster, which is the largest military transport aircraft on this planet. And we have the second largest uh, Globemaster fleet on this planet after America. Uh, there is no place on this planet where the C-17 Globemaster cannot reach with almost 50 to 60 tons of load. The IL-76 is our war horse, which carries about 40 tons, and we've been using it ever since the early 1980s, and it still continues to be the bulwark for uh, the support into Leh and Ladakh. The C-130 Hercules is the largest sold military transport aircraft uh, in the world today. Uh, it is a proven record of almost 50 years, and uh, we have two squadrons of them. And the reason we bought this airplane was primarily as a strategic forces aircraft. That means it is able to penetrate low and hidden into enemy territory and rescue Indians who are uh, kidnapped or being held hostage. This is the primary role of the Hercules. And it is configured, it is designed for such operations. We also use it for transport operations. So the Hercules, and you can see it's got a refueling probe. It can reach any part of this planet uh, as long as you provide it aerial uh, refueling. Post Galwan, we had to do rapid mobilization and uh, to show uh, and uh, to make the Chinese aware that we can mobilize very rapidly. Uh, and the world's largest uh, C-17 fleet was at Leh. You can see this it is, uh, I mean, this is a picture which uh, shows uh, uh, the gigantic uh, scope of what the Indian Air Force can mobilize. And uh, you can see half the fleet is here on the airfield at uh, Leh. And we rapidly mobilized and brought uh, all that is necessary for the army to uh, uh, buttress itself uh, against the Chinese. The, uh, the highest airfield in the world is the Dolotbeg uh, Oldie Airfield. We operationalize it and you can see here the C-130, which landed at Dolak Bay Doldi, it's, uh, it's uh, not far, if you look at the map, not far from Galwan and uh, the operational area of the Depsang Plains. The Chinooks uh, moved into Leh and Ladakh 
and um, uh, rapidly moved all our heavy weapons uh, into the operational areas. Also, we moved in the Apache gunships, the 22 uh, gunships that we have got uh, recently from Boeing, uh, the United States. Uh, ever since the Azerbaijan uh, conflict and people have been talking more and more about loitering drones, the fire and forget uh, variety that there are, I must tell you all from the mid 1990s, we have been having these loitering drones uh, and we have been keeping it as a very secret uh, weapon. Both are from uh, Israel, they are a fire and forget weapon and this can create panic when it is on orbit circling over the enemy territory and it can suppress, uh, uh, you know, ra radiation activity to targeting to anything it can uh, suppress. Uh, it's a very uh, handy weapon and we've been using it for 25 years. So we are very good at this. So when we talk of interoperability and where does the Indian Air Force fit into global operations, uh, we have over a period of time uh, uh, integrated with uh, World Air Forces to be something like a form fit function and primed and trained to fit into any scheme of things uh, uh, with other air forces operationally around the world. Now, let me talk about it. So, uh, one of the things which came out is that uh, the world's air forces realize that Indian Air Force is an air force to fly with and learn. And if you haven't flown with the Indian Air Force, you haven't arrived. That's the way the world talks about and everybody competes and says, please join us for an exercise. We want to fly with you. That's the state and the level that the Indian Air Force has reached. So we started with the flying regularly in uh, the red flag, USA, Cope Thunder in Alaska. We fly every alternate year with France in the exercise Garuda series. Every alternate year with UK in the Indra Dhanush uh, series, we interact. Uh, we oscillate between the mother country and uh, us. We uh, take part with Australia in uh, pitch black, which is held over Australia only. Uh, blue flag in Israel, where 16 nations have uh, taken part, which includes uh, uh, the Greece, France, Germany, uh, of course, I Israel and many other uh, air forces. Excise desert flag in the UAE, Excise Eastern Bridge in Oman. Uh, Excise uh, Shinyo Maitri with Japan, Avia Indra with uh, Ru Russia, the Syndex with Singapore, the Golden Eagle with South Africa. And when you look at these, we have almost flown with about 35 foreign air forces. So how, uh, what we have learned over a period of time is firstly, of course, how international air forces operate. And thereafter, we developed our skills and thereafter, we have uh, learned our uh, uh, ropes so well that uh, we are uh, one of the uh, premier air, uh, air forces in the world. <clears throat> also, in case of uh, necessity and there is a global uh, uh, campaign and then there is a, a war effort that needs to be done, we are almost ready for a plug and play with any air force, at least with these 35 air forces in the world. Now, while we took a look about uh, the neighborhood and, uh, and the area that I talked about, the area of operations uh, uh, right up to the Mombasa and the Straits of uh, Malacca, we also have to be careful to protect ourselves from uh, an attack, which could be preeminent or it could be during the campaign or post. So we, uh, the Air Force is ta tasked to protect uh, the nation from any external and threat coming in from the air. So we have a various ranges of uh, missile systems which uh, can destroy a threat starting from a drone uh, to a cruise missile, to an aircraft, to satellites, and you can, I mean, uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles to everything. And the recent one is, of course, the S-400 uh, air defense system, which is now uh, 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 what you call moved into Punjab. It will be operational in the next three months. Very soon we will have five of these systems. And you can see when you deploy these five systems, how these systems, and it's just a tentative uh, deployment I've seen, I've shown here, how it can cover a huge area. Uh, in fact, if you look at it, we just two S-400 system is enough to take care of Pakistan. 
and we're going to get to five. Our primary threat is uh, China. So uh, the, we are able to cover a huge part of the threat emanating from uh, uh, China. So how do we handle the ballistic missile defense? So uh, the, uh, one of the major uh, threats from China, and I think Chinese will use this as a first option always, use their 1,200 uh, um, the ICBMs which they have and launch to attack, attack India and soften us. So our job is to make sure that these missiles do not hit the targets and are uh, destroyed in the stratosphere. So the ballistic missile defense will finally come to the Air Force and we have finished uh, uh, the evaluations which is being developed by uh, the DRDO. So we have the Prithvi and the advanced air defense uh, uh, two component missiles that there are. One is uh, able to handle the missile incoming threat exo-atmospheric and uh, the advanced air defense missile will hand handle the endo-atmospheric uh, targets. Non-kinetic activity is an important aspect of nation building, aerial diplomacy, and uh, perception management. And I think the Indian Air Force has excelled all over this uh, uh, planet. It started in uh, uh, 2005 when our IL-76, you can see here, landed uh, in, um, um, uh, in, 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 in the US to give uh, support after the disaster uh, wrecked by Hurricane Katrina. And thereafter, we have continued. Our HADR uh, aspects have been known all over the world. And anywhere on this planet, we make sure that uh, we bring back our Indians safely home. Not only that, we help foreigners and uh, the others who have been stranded in those countries and brought them back. Just as a point of emphasis, uh, when we evacuated uh, from Yemen, uh, 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 from the port of uh, Aden, uh, we, ev we evacuated 30 foreign nationals uh, from there. And of course, our COVID airlift is uh, known all over. And our IL-76s and uh, C-17 Globemasters were all over the uh, world, in from Europe to the US to uh, China to Singapore to all over to get uh, the oxygen tankers that uh, came in. We also helped in demonetization when we flew 625 tons of uh, fresh currency notes all over to the areas that needed to be sent to. Force multipliers are an essential component. If we find our uh, the aircraft, the Su-30 can go and hit Mombasa and come back, it needs to be refueled from the air. If there are no petrol pumps, like I would say, in the air, it cannot go very far. And the full, uh, full uh, potential of the Su-30 or the Rafale or the Mirage cannot be exploited. And we have uh, quite a few of them. The AVAX is one, which uh, we have three platforms, the airborne warning and control system. And these three platforms, if all three are airborne at the same time, can cover the whole country. <clears throat> the aerial tankers are actually the force multipliers. And you can see here, the aerial tanker is refueling the Su-30. Uh, here is an aerial tanker that is refueling our uh, AEWC, which we call uh, made on the Embraer uh, platform. We can refuel. It can also get refueled in the air. You can see a um, uh, Russian tanker refueling our AVAX uh, in the air. So the tanker is an essential and important component. We unfortunately have just six. When we talk of Atman Nirbar Bharat, I'll just quickly flash through them. Uh, the AEWC was developed by DRDO on an Embraer platform. Uh, uh, the AEWC uh, played a very crucial role in the Balakot strike. Uh, it was the eyes and ears of the strike which went into Pakistan. The Brahmos is an indigenous uh, weapon along with uh, the Russians. It's very much in the news today. Our first exports to Philippines has come through. Um, uh, here is the Brahmos uh, launching an anti-ship Brahmos uh, which, with a range of 290 kilometers. So when we talk of threats in the sea, you can, rem you can imagine the uh, Su-30 can handle it, uh, a threat from the sea at a distance of 290 kilometers. When we talk of airborne warning and control system, uh, three is not enough. 
uh, we originally planned six of them. Um, uh, we have stopped bringing the IL-76 as a main platform. And one of the things which uh, the DRDO is taking up is uh, uh, buying the Airbus 320s uh, or the 321 from the Air India and uh, put the uh, radome on uh, top. So this is the, uh, what do I say, one of the uh, uh, routes that India is going to take to develop an indigenous a AVAX, three of them. The Tejas, all of you know the Tejas, uh, we have two squadrons of them. Uh, the Airbus C9, C, C295, uh, we have already signed for 56 uh, aeroplanes. And this is a significant change in Atmanirbhar Bharat. So far, all aeroplanes were produced by Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. The Tata's, the private company, has now put the foot into the door. And this will completely transform the aviation uh, Atmanirbhartha, which uh, India has been seeking. Well, we'll buy 16 of them from Spain. It's from Airbus. And uh, 40 of them will be made in uh, Hyderabad. Um, the ALH has developed into the uh, Rudra, and uh, thereafter we made the light combat helicopter. And recently, this is uh, nearing certification, basic, basic trainer, the LCT-40. Um, when we talk of integration of uh, air command and control center, I'll give you an example. Uh, the Balakot strike, and thereafter the subsequent strike uh, the, the next day, uh, when the air combat happened uh, west of Srinagar, it was controlled from a cabin in Ambala, which is almost 700 kilometers away from where the actual combat was uh, taking place. And that is by virtue of this IACCS, something we Indians should be very proud of, completely developed within the nation. The whole nation is integrated. And if today the C3S has a node in in their complex, you will be able to see the entire air picture or control a combat uh, uh, sitting in C3S. The software-defined uh, software radio, uh, when the air combat happened and Abhinandan uh, was uh, shot down, one of the issues that came about was uh, poor communication uh, radio. So today we have the software-defined uh, radio, which is uh, from Rafael Israel. It is going to be manufactured in Hyderabad with a company called Astra. Already 1,000 uh, sets have been uh, ordered. And uh, once this communication gets into the Army, the Navy, and all the aeroplanes, it is impenetrable. You can have secure uh, SDR. And actually speaking, it is a technological leap as far as Atmanirbharata goes. The Akash system. And uh, now coming to the theatrization, there is many aspects. This is just my view. Uh, when we talk of uh, the Su-30, the, uh, the Rafale, and uh, 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 the Mirage 2000, it has a huge mix load of weapons. You can see the Su-30 arsenal is this. From air to sea, from air to air, to air to ground, deep penetration, you name the kind of weapons it can carry. It can carry a mix of this as well. So what happens? When the Su-30 is airborne, it can drop the bombs and get into air defense mode. It can drop the bombs in the east, and uh, if you give it refueling, it can come and do air defense uh, without landing anywhere in the west. That's the swing roll capability of all these modern uh, airplanes. So when you pocket it into one region, into a theater, you, it is an under-exploitation. Same is the case uh, with Rafal, which is developed with string roll capability. The, this is the arsenal of the Rafal. And when we talk of theaterization, we have to remember, instead of 42 squadrons, we have 31. We have only three AVACs. We have only six aerial tankers. And when you talk of three and six, if out of three AVACs, we are able, able, to, able to put up two, is very good. Out of six, uh, tankers, if we are able to put up four, it's excellent. So how do we put this into penny packets uh, anywhere? When you talk of the Balakot uh, mission, um, uh, the, the aircraft, I mean, it operated in the theater of uh, the Western uh, Air Command, controlled by the Air Officer Commanding-in-Chief uh, there. But the aircraft, the Mirage 2000, the main weapon, came from Central Air Command. So what are the challenges? 
the challenges are many. The aerial tanker is a huge uh, deficiency, and the country is thinking of uh, leasing for the first time the Airbus three three zero MRTT. If this comes in, uh, it's going to be a huge booster uh, for us. Uh, uh, a simple example would be the, this tanker can take a formation of six Su thirty from India to London nonstop, carry the uh, ground crew also on board. So it's a package. So there is no place where our Indian Su thirties or the Rafale cannot reach. Ramp up manufacture. We have two squadrons of the Tejas uh, uh, in the Indian Air Force, and unfortunately, both squadrons are still not full with their aircraft uh, uh, numbers that they are supposed to have. Very poor uh, rate of uh, production. So we have to do something to start producing rapidly. And uh, it's not only a manufacturing issue. It could be uh, the defense MOD. It could be the services issue. Whatever it is. But we have to work unitedly to make sure we ramp up manufacture. When we look at Airbus, the Airbus factory rolls out two Airbuses a day. We can't roll out uh, six LCAs in a year. So that is the the unfortunate uh, rate at which we manufacture. So what are the future threats? The future threats. I'll just uh, mention it. I got a few minutes. The IED, which is the aerial IED, the improvised uh, explosive device that. Uh, uh, is now creating havoc all over the world. They are so miniaturized, and uh, they can target individuals. And we do have in the Air Force uh, different ways that uh, these things can be handled. And the defenses of uh, handling these uh, miniature mini drones is something the Air Force needs to focus on. Uh, it's also uh, a delivery executive. Uh, today evening, you're going to see these swarms uh, over uh, uh, beating the retreat over uh, Rajpath. Uh, these swarms, uh, uh, the enemy could use it, uh, we could use it. We have to evolve. This is a threat. We have to find a way to handle these swarms. This is the immediate threat uh, that is coming up uh, for all our forces in the world. Uh, we are there are systems coming up to counter these. Uh, with that. Uh, I complete uh, my presentation and uh, with a quote of uh, uh, Marshal of the Royal Air Force, Lord uh, Trenchard in 1920. It is not necessary for an air force in order to defeat an enemy nation to defeat its armed forces first. Air power can dispense with the intermediate step, can pass over the enemy navies and armies, penetrate the air defenses and direct attack direct the centers of production, transportation and communication from which the enemy war effort is maintained. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, sir. Before I introduce our next speaker for today, I would like to request our distinguished chair, uh, Sri MRS, sir, for comments, if any. Uh, sir, could you please? A masterly presentation, both by General Shankar and uh, Air Marshal Vartama. It is a pleasure to hear them. Now, as far as the presentation made by General Shankar is concerned, he listed out 12 or 14, I think, uh, complexities, strategic complexities which a country has to face, particularly India. Now, when I look around the world and I've studied most of the countries, I've been to most of the countries, I've led delegation to these countries, these complexities are being faced by almost every country in the world, excepting a few. India, of course, has got a little more complex problems to solve because of caste, religion, hundreds of languages, etc. But nevertheless, it, they have been with us for the last few thousands of years. So what is important is to stress what I think Saurabh Kumar stated, to what extent we can improve our governance capability, to what extent can we improve the way in which we tackle all these problems. So that's where the entire uh, problem lies because we are not dynamically evolving our government system to face these complexities because they emerge very fast. To some extent, I think we have created organizations, institutions, interactions between institutions to deal with climate change, to deal with disasters, etc. But as far as the economy is concerned, to which I will uh, I mean, refer to in my talk, uh, I don't think there has been that much of coordination or that much of governance initiative which has been taken. Now, the presentation made by Mr. Vartaman 
uh, I was in the National Aerospace Laboratories as a member of the Governing Council when the building of the Tejas started. That is several, almost decades ago, several decades ago. I was observing how they were designing each and every part of the aircraft. I was seeing the first wing being laid by Dr. Raju, who was the director of NAL, he used to sit there 24 hours and lay the wing. Now, the problem there again was a coordination and cooperation between different agencies. I think that some of these issues got sorted out when Air Marshal Rajkumar got involved in the final designs of the aircraft and final specification of the aircraft. So we have governance issues in most of these things. In fact, uh, Air Marshal Vartaman may, be, uh, may know that I was one of the important persons leading the, in the delegation to conclude the negotiations on Mirage 2000. I was in France several times during that uh, process of negotiations. In fact, I was instrumental in getting the cost of the aircraft reduced by a personal equation between me and the finance minister of France at that time. So there are many things involved, many complexities involved in a democratic country. It is not like China, where one order you see percolates down the land and it gets done. So we have to look at these deficiencies in these countries also. As I said, we have to look at the evolution of governance in this country with about 34, 35 states in this country, 15, 20 different parties running the governments of these countries. The complexities are very, very difficult in these countries to manage. Within this constraint, I am really proud that our armed forces have done extraordinarily well. And I congratulate them. I congratulate uh, General Shankar, congratulate uh, General Vartaman, uh, Admiral K.B. Singh and others who have kept this country very safe and sound. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It is my pleasure to introduce our next distinguished speaker, who is again from the Indian Air Force, but with a different tinge. He'll be speaking on the topic externally aided internal instability, presented by Group Captain Dr. A.V. Chandrasekharan, sir. Group Captain Dr. A.V. Chandrasekharan joined the Indian Air Force in 1984 and has held various appointments in a career spanning 34 years. Various duties of security, counterintelligence, and infrastructure building. He was posted as a chief administrative officer of frontline fighter bases, commanding officer of a counterintelligence unit in Jammu and Kashmir sector. He was also responsible for the physical security of all Air Force bases in the four southern states, where he comprehended all protective force orders, plans, procedures, and processes, and emergency actions while exercising safety and security measures. He was also posted in the Andamana Nicobar to oversee infrastructure building to enhance the Indian Air Force operational capability in the region. He holds a PhD in strategic studies from the University of Madras and is also author of a book, Counter Insurgency, Insurgency and Counter Insurgency, A Dangerous War of Nerves. Uh, group Captain, over to you, sir. I'll be presenting for Group Captain Dr. A.V. Chandrasekhar on uh, behalf of him. I'll just make the presentation, sir. Uh, thank you, Bala, for the generous introduction. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. A special thanks to Commodore Vasan for having extended an invitation to speak in the Salib gathering. I also deem it a big privilege to be talking in a session chat by Mr. Shivraman and immediately after two illustrious veterans of the Indian Armed Forces. I've been given a very, very sensitive topic. It's externally aided internal stability. A sensitive there uh, where you can, uh, 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 Bala, please go back to those where you know you're bound to ruffle feathers and uh, touch raw nerves because it's extremely sensitive. And when anything is externally aided, you know, there'll always be a possible deniability, it's not going to come out in the open. You take a country, it's got a population of over 1 billion people spread over a massive area of about 3.1 square million square kilometers. It's got seven main religions. It's got 16 languages. Even among the religions, you have sex and sub -sex. Among the languages, you have various dialects. And when there is a cohesion, socially, economically, then this diversity, you'll have a unity. Now, what happens is all you need is some external interference to disturb this harmony. All you require is one small spark that can cause a flame 
or a small dose of poison that can cause a death. And I'm sure the external forces which has got inimical interest towards India will always try to exploit this particular thing and cause a lot of disturbances in the country. Bala, the next slide, please. You know, the first thoughts about externally aided internal instability is nothing new to this country. When you talk about the Shanti Parva, which happened in the Mahabharata, at the end of the Mahabharata war, when Bhishma was lying in the bed of arrows, Yudhishthira was asked to approach him for some sane uh, political advice. And the advice which was rendered is normally referred to as the Shanta Parva, Shanti Parva. In that, he also mentions about how a king should rule the country, how he should watch out for the enemies, internal enemies as well as external enemies, externally aided internal enemies also. Our own saint Thiruvalluvar in his scroll number 882, which says in Tamil, Anjagar, Kel Pol, which means you do not have to worry about an open enemy who wields a sword because he's an open enemy, he's not a snake in the grass, but you will have to watch out for people who smile and come towards you, but who's got inimical interests. Chanakya, he talks about four kinds of threats, external threat, internal threat, externally aided internal threat and internally aided external threat. We're going to talk about the third threat, which he mentions today. Next one, Bala, please. Okay. Now, when you carry out a small security assessment as to why countries outside try to fan a little bit of unrest inside this country or try to create problems for this country, there are multiple of reasons. Some of the reasons immediately which came to my mind, I just tried to pen it down, it starts with Indian military might. When I say Indian military might, let's take Pakistan. Pakistan is absolutely sure that it will not be able to fight and win a conventional war. And the best way, as General Ziaul Haq brought it up, bleed India through a thousand cuts. And that's how the K2 program started, where Kashmir and Khalistan program started. The Kashmir program continues now. That means, in case you can't take a country conventionally, try to tie them up in knots by cutting them into multiple places. Economic well-being, the moment, you know, when you have two countries, if one country is prosperous, the other country continues to languish in poverty, it creates a lot of problem for the other country. The people always tend to compare their country with a neighboring country. So an economic well-being is always a sore for a neighboring country. So which will always try to undermine. Democracy, a vibrant democracy, like for example, China is an authoritarian regime. India is a vibrant democracy. We've been having elections and our elections are accepted and applauded by the entire world. And they ask observers from the Indian Election Commission to come and oversee elections. So we've been having free and fair elections. People are able to express their views freely. So this vibrant democracy, when people in China compare to that of India, where they are stifled, where they're not permitted to speak. So compared to that, when you have a vibrant democracy, it again creates a problem for the regime there. So they'll always try to undermine. And when they undermine, the, the, the affected government is forced to take certain harsh measures. And these harsh measures fuel unrest. Business competition, absolutely, because I, I can go, what immediately comes to my mind is in case, uh, you know, when you have a competitor trying to make some big ticket sales to this country, the competitor will always try to create fuel and unrest towards a particular thing and ensure that particular uh, item which the country proposes to buy is kept in the sidelines or, or it always faces controversy. You can talk about Rafal, you can talk about any ticket, big ticket purchases which India has resorted to. Religious ideology it doesn't require much of amplification. Uh, this is one sentiment which is constantly exploited by inimical forces outside the country. This is Levinstrom. The living space is Bangladesh is, uh, you know, doing it uh, in a very, very systematic and a subtle manner. On the open, they are absolutely all, uh, you know, sugar and candy to us. But the amount of people who have migrated from Bangladesh into India is so enormous that, you know, I, I, may, I, may, I may sound, uh, you know, like a spin doctor or, a, you know, uh, I, I won't be surprised probably in the decade, uh, you know, a decade after this, 
West Bengal itself may have a Muslim separate uh, state, which uh, their majority, because the amount of people who migrated inside, they are able to influence on 120 assembly seats and 20 Lok Sabha seats. And these are all, whatever I'm saying, they're all documented. A great amount of documentation is there, which people can Google and see. That is the amount of influence they have already exercised in this country. Investors, tourism, in case you have to go away tourist, uh, you know, investors from tourism, from investment and all, you can always fuel unrest. Like, I don't know, the Foxconn, they say, which happened in Chennai, was also fueled by China, Karke. it came in the news because Apple was starting to manufacture things here. So things of these kind of things can also take place. Then the last is indigenization, as Air Marshal Vardaman brought over both pages, Mr. Shivaraman also brought about Tejas. In case India starts manufacturing its own weapons and all, and the arms industry are the biggest industry as far as the, you know, the, the purchases are concerned. And a lot of kickbacks are likely to suffer, and they would never like India to be self-sufficient as far as arms are concerned. So there is always a possibility that externally aided disturbances will be there. Next one, Bala, please. Decades of decade, right from the time we got independence, if you see, through and through, we've been suffering from externally aided problems. Started off in 1954 when we had the problem in Nagaland. Everybody knew the Nagaland, the, the Mizoram, the Manipur, all these problems were fanned by China. Chinese arms, Chinese sanctuaries, everything was there. 67 saw the birth of Naxali movement in Naxalbari, in a village when you go from Bardogra towards Dulabari. It's a small, indescript village. That's where it started and it continues to haunt the country even today. 1979 was Ulfa. Unfortunately, Ulfa was started because of this mass migration and uh, it's grown into a full-fledged terrorist movement. And today, the same guys who are against the Bangladeshi migration into the country have sought refuge into Bangladesh. That's the unfortunate part. 82, we saw the birth of Sikh militancy. It died when Mr. Narasimharao, Mr. KPS Gill and all was there. It is showing signs of revival today with externally aided forces, especially from Canada and all. 1990, we saw the beginning of the Kashmiri uh, terrorism, where initially it started with all the pundits being forced out of their homes. And today, about 30 years hence, it's shown no signs of debate. 2000s to 2020, we saw a number of attacks across the country. Could be train blasts, could be blasts in a temple, could be attack on the parliament could be attack on bases, it just continues. And 2020 has seen the new type of warfare, the grey warfare, where uh, psych psychological operations and cyber operations are ruling the roost. Next one, Bala, please. Okay. What fuels this abetment? What fuels external abetment? Why are they doing it? Because we have certain problems, we have to accept it. We have a defensive strategic orientation. We are basically reactive by nature. We are never proactive. We are reactive. We always try to put a band-aid for a bullet hole. So that is one of the reasons. We have Mr. Ajit Doval, who's probably one of the uh, most uh, highly accomplished uh, intelligence czar who's sitting there as the national security advisor. He's through in his second term, but still we do not have an internal security doctrine. Forget internal security. We don't have a national security doctrine. Unless you have an internal security doctrine, national security doctrine, which from which flows the internal security doctrine, how do we plan the internal security of the country? That is one thing which is woefully lacking. Border management. We have multiple agencies guarding the border. In addition to guarding the border, these people are deployed for anti-terrorism and anti-insurgency roles also. You have ITBP, you have SSB, you have BSF being used in anti-terrorism roles also thereby blunting their efficacy in the borders. <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> Very inferior cybersecurity protocols. I'll say why do we have uh, inferior cybersecurity protocols in the subsequent slides? We have a lack of expansionist military tradition. When I say lack of expansionist military tradition, whenever we had an opportunity, we have always failed to capitalize. We had four wars. We had four different prime ministers. 62 war we had Mr. Nehru. 65 Mr. Shastri, 71 Mr. Sindra Gandhi, 99 was Mr. Vajpayee. 62, the Indian Air Force was not pressed into action despite being uh, technologically superior, which could have turned the tide of the battle. We didn't do that. 65, we won Haji Peer. We just battered away Haji Peer. We did not have it. It's a very, very crucial thing. 
You see, 1971, I think Mrs. Indira Gandhi was in a win-win situation with 93,000 prisoners. But what did we get? Nothing. And we were not able to you know, expand our victories. They say there was a lot of pressure from the Americans and the Russians, but whatever it is, we squandered a God-given opportunity. <coughs> I'm sorry. 1999, we had Mr. Vajpayee, who also happens to be a right-wing uh, prime minister, where we thought there would be slightly more robust action, but uh, that was not to be so. Under no circumstances were we allowed to cross the border. When we were able to garner the sympathy of the entire world, we were not able to exploit that particular situation and teach them a lesson. So that's what I'm saying. We don't have an expansionist military tradition. We are very good in defending our territory. We are very good defending forces. But when it comes to offense, there is a certain amount of hesitation in that. And you know, we have ethical, ethic, ethnic and communal disharmony, which is being exploited by inimical elements. Next one, please, Bala. Okay. Now, when you say instability, how is this instability fuel? There are four ways, according to me. One is aiding, arming terrorists and insurgents, which is an overt way, what's happening in uh, uh, Kashmir and other places. Second thing, the most important, the second, third, and the fourth are the ones which are prevalent and which are wreaking a havoc in the country. Second is cyber sabotage. Third is social media. And fourth is the smart warfare. Next one, Bala. Okay. Now, when they carry out an attack, whom do they, like for example, when the inimical forces want to target this country, whom will they target, especially? It starts off with the political activists. Now, in case, uh, you know, there, there's a marginalized politician who is vying for attention, who's absolutely unhappy with the things are happening, he's a very, very likely candidate. You have leftists with sympathies for Maoists. I wouldn't like to name them. There are a number of them. All of you can Google and find out. These guys always have secular posturing and they keep, you know, doing virtue signaling. You know, it is basically, you know, it's wonderful to preach, but very, very, you know, difficult to practice and follow. That's the thing. So these are the, the, the main chaps who can be targeted. And the second lot is the academic and research organizations where in case they are able to penetrate into this particular group, they'll be able to mold the mind of a generation. And for the next one decade plus, they'll be able to sway, hold sway over the country. And, uh, you know, they'll legitimize and they'll support anti-national views through think tanks, through textbooks, and through history foundations. Third most important is media which can be exploited the most because they are the ones who have a narrative control and the same narrative, if it can be manipulated, information manipulation, this is a fantastic means of linking information warfare along with their strategic thinking. I think, you know, winning a war without firing a bullet is the main thing. And the best way to do so is basically using the media to brainwash the people you know, it could be like, for example, the way the media has gone about China, you always think China is invincible. You always think that China can just run you over. You always think Chinese are 20 feet tall. They start making you uh, into a defeatist attitude. They always start making you think that the Indian armed forces are not capable of taking on China. And there are a number of, uh, you know, media personalities, including, I'm sorry to say, ex-defense military officers who normally indulge in such kind of rhetorics. Sectarian leaders, it, it, it requires very, very, very little amplification because they always, uh, you know, portray minority victimization. You know, perceived injustice, because even if injustice is not meted out, you perceive that I've been wrong. I mean, you know, that, that the other guy from the different community has always been given a preference over me. And uh, false neglected peripheries. See, they manage to live in a particular society, in a particular area, they do not allow others to come. And they say they always live in a neglected periphery. So these things are very, very ably exploited using the sectarian leaders. And the last and the most important thing is the criminal syndicates. We do not have a common law, a national law to punish the criminal syndicates. When the criminal syndicates operate in a particular state, it becomes a responsibility of that particular state and not the country as a whole. 
As a result, there is no proper coordination between the states. In case a weapon is brought in through Maharashtra and an attack happens in Orissa, then it becomes a responsibility of two states. So it brings in a lot of uh, you know problems in coordinating and all. And these criminal syndicates are able to act with impunity because they use corruption, they use violence, and they're able to bring in drug, firearms, and human trafficking. When they say human trafficking, it's very easy to bring in terrorists using these syndicates to bring them inside and make them create a lot of problem for the country. And you know, in case there are some people who are unwilling to, you know, uh, cooperate. There will be threats, there will be coercions, and also judges can be threatened to obstruct justice. So this is a multi-pronged attack which these people will resort to. Next one, please, Bala. Okay. Now coming into cyber sabotage, uh, the four main things. Everything flows from one main thing that we got a very poor cyber, the cyber hygiene. Okay. And when you see all these facts, whatever I'm given, I've taken it from the home ministry sites. India is the top most fiber attacked country in the world. And surprising, the cyber attacks originate from countries like Serbia, from Ukraine, from Mexico, because all of them, you know, when they carry out cyber attacks, they route them through these countries. So where it immediately, you know, it almost becomes impossible for you to backtrack and find who exactly is the person who has perpetuated the thing? Okay, it is basically designed to detail you. The second thing is, you know, the, the, the Indian computer emergency team, it has confirmed that in 2020 alone, 1.5 million cyber attacks took place in 2020. It is a 20 fold increase from 2016. Between 2016, 2020, 1.5 million in one, one year. Okay. Why do they carry out these kind of attacks? Basically, they wanted to have a resource control. And what are the most heavily attacked uh, targets? It basically includes defense, finance, industry, oil and natural glass plants, and power grids. Okay. And they basically have cyber troops, like I told you, where all it you know originates from, where it becomes difficult for you to identify them. Now, when I give you some incidents, some incidents all taken from the home ministry side 2017 i think uh, we were hit by that vanakrai cryptos ransom bomb it wreaked a lot of havoc 2018 there's a cosmos bank in pune which was robbed of 94.42 crores 2019 after chandrayaan was launched the scientists were targeted but fortunately they were able to take out those worms and they were able to prevent further damage 2020, after the onslaught of the COVID, Dr. Reddy and Lupin Labs, they were attacked. A lot of patients' data and the research which was being carried out were hacked. And also, we saw the Mumbai power grid attack, which is one of the most dangerous things, because they carry out an attack. And for you to react, what they do is, they do something like a bot attack, in the sense they'll jam your communication systems also with fake telephone transmissions. As a result, in case you need immediate help to sort out the problem, you will not be able to resort to. What were the uh, you know repercussions of this cyber sabotage? Your vulnerabilities are mapped. Your vulnerabilities are totally mapped and kept for posterity. It maximizes the enemy's ability to demonstrate power in future conflicts. In case he knows which is the Achilles heel, in a subsequent battle, he is always readily available to target that particular thing. It creates a lot of chaos and exerts pressure in times of crisis. Like in case you have a major power breakdown in Chennai, in the morning when people are going to the office, when the electric trains are stopped, you can imagine the number of passengers who are standard on the road, tempers running high, weather doesn't act as a very motivating factor. You can imagine the cures it will create. And in case you have two, three of them in a span of about two to three months, you will have a huge change in the public opinion towards the government. This is what they aim to do. Psychological and physiological consequences, I told you, because in case they get subjected to such attacks, tomorrow they tend to turn violent. There will be a huge law and order problem. Next one, Bala, please. 
Okay. Now coming into social media, I'm sorry for using the word. It's a weapon of mass manipulation. Okay. Now which are the ones? We start off with troll forms. Okay. Troll forms are available in plenty in Pakistan, in China, in various other places where they may, I am trying to go into the basics. I am not a cyber expert. I am trying to go into the basics only. Okay. It's a wave of online misinformation which are doctored. They are, you know, misleading. And what they also do is they try to, you know, pump in a lot of outdated videos and images which you are seeing. An act, you know, a, a, a killing or a bombing which has taken place in Palestine is shown as having happened in Kashmir. They can doctor these kind of things. That's called a troll form, which they use it very, very effectively. Twitter, they use it for platform, uh, platform manipulation. I may be having a Twitter handle. I may be having a connection, but using me, they can, you know, mislead. And, you know, they can, they can, uh, using my thing, they can hack into my account and uh, uh, indulge in bulk, aggressive or destructive activity through fake accounts. Now, what happens when you continuously see these kind of things flowing? Uh, you know, there are certain strong people, there are certain gullible people. The gullible people or the cats on the wall will always tend to get carried away by these kind of propaganda and they may try to question the, the, the veracity of the happenings. Then we have deep fakes, which happens here. It's a digitally altered and fabricated videos and audios. You can never, you can never ascertain the genuity. The real voices can be manipulated, and uh, you know, probably uh, uh, important political leader, important bureaucrat, important military leader, making a national statement, telling something of importance. If the entire thing gets manipulated and he says something which is not said, so imagine the backlash it is bound to have. And then you have something called the astro turf campaigns. That is. You mask the real sponsor, the originator. That guy is masked. And, you know, it, it comes, uh, like, for example, let's take Naxalism or let's take the grassroots Naxalism. It will probably come from one of the top guys, one of the top divisional commanders or somebody will be posting a message. But then when you see this, you will feel that the grassroots, the villagers, the, the, the foot soldiers of the Naxalism movement are trying to voice their opinion. This is another way by which they can try to manipulate you. Next one, please, Bala. Smart warfare. When I say smart warfare, it's a silent war. We have to learn from Russia. There's a person, Russia, there's a person called Alexander Dugin. This person wrote a book in 1997 on the geopolitic of Russia. Karke. I think it is something which everyone who is interested in strategic affairs should read. A book which was published in 1997 brings out that number one, Georgia, especially Ossetia, should be invaded and annexed. Number two, Ukraine should be brought under the control of Russia, including uh, Crimea, where you have access to the uh, you know the warm season all. Number two, number three, they talk about. A Germany Russian relationship based on Slavic relations. And if you see the paper which happened about a couple of days ago, saying that uh, about as far as the Ukraine thing is concerned, Germany has been slightly guarded in its remark. They have not been very offensive or aggressive in their remarks. And uh, probably in their case, economics is trumping uh, ideology. And uh, this, this book brings about Russian uh, German relations because of the Slavic thing. And the fourth most important thing is they are talking, you can never trust China and you have to use Japan to counter China. Now, what is happening is Japan is also opening a Mitsubishi factory in uh, Russia, but then it is not able to come out of the sphere of the American stronghold. So now in case they have to, because the, the Russians are absolutely unhappy that uh, they are pulled to a you know number three position as far as the, the, the uh, power positions are concerned. What used to be bipolar became unipo unipolar. Unipolar was still acceptable to Russia. Today it's become tripolar. So they are not able to accept being pushed into the third portion. So they feel that China has to be cut. Now there are only a very few countries which will be able to take on China. And in case they are able to fan a war between India and China, and certainly it will affect both the countries. They couldn't 
bother much about India, but they'll feel that China will be pushed back. So it's a silent war. This is my theory. I may be totally wrong. This is my theory. Then they carry out the cultural terrorism. You see the number of movies which are being shown. Most of the movies, when I say most of the movies, I'm not making a sweeping statement. Most of the movies are being funded by the underworld and money for production of these movies come from outside the country. Now these movies, it's, it's, it's a surprise how it manages to escape the censor board or the censor officials also being uh, you know bought over, I don't know. Because they always portray that the educated person is a villain. You have a rowdy, you have a rickshaw puller, he is always portrayed as a do-gooder. He might be an underworld chap, he is portrayed as a do-gooder and he always wins. And over a period of time, you have made the people feel that to be educated and to be enlightened is a shame. Plus, there are movies which shows anti-national uh, you know, feeling which are being openly brought out about uh, movies which are taken on Kashmir without knowing the ground reality and they vilify the military. And unfortunately, it is not only these movies are shown, these movies win about six, seven awards. So this is a kind of cultural terrorism which they are carrying out quietly and subverting the minds of the intelligent people. Agitations, when I go to the next slide, I'll say about the number of agitations which has been sponsored. The fourth most important thing which we don't realize, they create a preoccupation by engaging emotions. India by nature, we are a very, very emotional people. Our emotional quotient is very high. As a result, what happens is they are able to, you know, indoctrinate a particular idea in your mind that that particular thing, you know, the, the fourth and the fifth point is almost interlinked. You know, you just get obsessed with that particular point. You are not able to get it away and they use this by engaging your emotions. And then when you say, you know, with this, they are able to, you know, shift the masses thinking. A person coming from the office is expected to go home probably help his family, help his children do the homework, nothing of that nature. The personal needs are kept aside. He's already brainwashed in such a way. His personal needs are kept outside. He starts concentrating on highly fabricated outside priorities, which may be totally false. They have been able to do this particular thing very, very effectively. Next one, please, Bala. Okay, when I say agitations, I think all of you know, Kudankulam. They held a national project to ransom. And, you know, the surprising thing is not only a land, they used amphibian tactics, a protest from the sea. And they always feel women. This is a standard operating practice which you have seen in JNK. They always feel women old and the children in the front line. And the firing always takes place from the back. And when you try to retaliate, you talk about the innocents being killed. And they left no place for negotiations. We had Mr. Manmohan Singh, who was the prime minister who went on record to say that this particular agitation was sponsored by external forces. He also went to the extent of saying that America and Scandinavian countries were behind it. They almost brought everything to a standstill. Look at sterilite. I would not like to go into the aspect of whether they are actually poisoning the water, causing a lot of uh, you know health hardships to the people. But what is more important is, instead of shutting down the plant, would it have been more prudent for the government to ensure that all proper health precautions are taken place and then allow the you know the, the, the factory to function? Imagine by closing sterilite from export surplus. We used to export copper, instead of that, we are importing copper. And we used to also used to export copper to China. So, in one way, we have lost a lot of foreign inflow. Plus, there's also a trade imbalance between India and China, which China has been effectively able to do that. You saw Jalikatu because there are no information which is available openly as to who sponsored it. But what we saw was the entire thing was sponsored through mass media only. Mixing, <coughs> sorry. It was only through WhatsApp it was sponsored. And there was a huge spontaneous crowd which happened in the beaches. And you also brought a particular government to the knees and say a system can be held to ransom with this. That was the most important thing. Farmers' agitation, it is there. Seeks for justice, they control a prominent number of Gurdwaras in Canada. It is documented on record, it is there. And, uh, you know, very, very surprising that uh, these people were uh, uh, sponsoring and, uh, you know, they, they were trying to give a lot of support for this particular 
education. CAA cross border chatter was caught by the Home Ministry, Home Ministry saying, where, you know, the Pakistani agents saying that not adequate amount of things are not done as far as, you know, fanning up the thing was concerned. So you saw in various things, you see the, when you see the photographs, the one on the extreme left is Uday Kumar, who's peer-headed. The one on the, the, the top left is Fatima Babu and a person called Samarendru Das. He's a UK national. A UK national, he says, okay, my job is to ban sterilite everywhere. Karke. That's how he came and, uh, you know, he, he was helping the people to do the agitation. The photograph on the right top talks about the farmer's agitation as far as Canada is concerned, the support which is rendered. And the fourth is during the CAA protest where you had stone pelting and all those things. Next one, please, Bala. Okay, now we have to watch out for certain things. Most important thing which we have to watch out for, which is seldom heard, is an organization called Canvas. It's Center for Nonviolent Action and Strategies. It was basically founded in 2004 by Popovic and Dunovic. It was in Belgrade. Adequate amount of uh, uh, proof exists that it is being funded by CIA. The Orange Revolution in Ukraine, they were ones who were responsible for that. They have been able to, you know, overthrow governments in a number of countries and they continue fueling unrest in Venezuela, Belarus, Iran, Kazakhstan and all. And they have regular courses. They call people to conduct courses. They say how to fight things democratically. That's what they say. But it's basically a subversive organization. And then you'll have to watch out for BBC. When I say BBC, at every point, they always say Indian occupied Kashmir. Why at no time is it said about England occupied Ireland? Why should it be only Indian occupied Kashmir? They are partisan. Then there is a you know organization called Siras. It is founded by a lady called Daya Varma. They are also they they you know it's it's basically in Montreal. They spew a lot of venom. New York Times. New York Times was very surprising when abrogation of Article 370 and other things took place. They spoke about a bloodbath in the offing. It's two years you know down the line. I, I don't think we have seen any bloodbath. So this kind of partisan reporting is extremely dangerous. And they also work in the garb of charity, NGOs, religious institutions. And of late, we've been having a number of Turkish NGOs in India with sponsoring students from Kashmir to go for higher studies and other things in Turkey. It is also an extremely uh, you know, worrisome aspect which is happening. I'm sure the government will be taking notice. And you have something called the United States Council of Muslim Organizations. They are associated with a number of Pakistan occupied Kashmir groups. Okay, it is, you know, it is uh, founded by a lady called Habsa and, uh, you know, uh, Ghazala Habib, friends of uh, uh, Kashmir, Ghazala Habib is also there. They also, you know, have a lot of programs which are anti-India in nature to fan different kinds of dissension. Next one, please, Bala. What is the way ahead? It's always, you know, easy to give you the problems. Little bit what I thought. We have to increase the non-military capabilities. It's not only that the military capabilities, uh, you know, is good. Because a weak state with strong military is counterproductive. You will end up like Pakistan. So you have to improve your anti-terror apparatus. You have to have a sound intelligence. You have to try minimizing crime. We have to address energy and economic security and strengthen your cyber security. And second thing is, instead of going gung-ho against the people who are doing Try to take the people into confidence and bring out the facts. The people who have to go and bring out the facts, please discredit the enemy's narratives. Connect the people to legitimate governing strictures. Please bring out. Instead of going, arresting, killing and all, that's not very important. Most important thing is the people should know this is what the government is doing. What the other guys are doing is just false propaganda. Third, you also have to have a comprehensive deterrent system. Because I told you we are reactive. Basically, we react to situations. We are never proactive. So you should be able to have an effective system by which you're able to forecast, you're able to preempt and pre-position resources there where you anticipate an attack is likely to take place. And you should deter attacks of both direct and indirect violence. And the last thing is, the sooner we implement the national security doctrine, the better it will be there for the country. Thank you very much. Next one, Bala. I finish. Thank you very much, Jayan. That was an excellent presentation, Look at and from the Shaker. Thank you, sir. Extremely well researched, very, very informative, very comprehensive. I wish you could send this to the MEA.
thank you sir <clears throat> thank you very much sir we are now moving on to the question and answer session where my colleague ms sapna will take up the questions and direct it to the concerned speakers over to you sapna thank you sir uh, going into the question and answer session let me first ask a question to the first speaker of the session uh, lieutenant general shankar sir the question is from balu subramanian the question is sir what are your thoughts on china deploying robots at india's border and what is the impact on morale and operational capability of india sir you muted sir thanks a lot for the question uh, china deploying robots and along our border human can't survive there so where i don't know how robots will survive right i mean practically there are issues for energy i mean unless you go and sit there you will not understand what the limitations of a robot are okay uh, there are too many things that's far fetched and let's not get too much carried away by this business of robotics a one all like they got limitations ultimately remember man has to live on ground and wars will be fought on borders all these big talk of cyber and this and that all that will come down to one line which you have to defend and then blood and guts matter and nothing else matters okay your ability to de deliver firepower matters your ability to work through your basic three domains of land air and you know sea matters so i find many of these webinars blow up all these peripheral things and that is also part of the disinformation system we are being fed into comprehensive national power it is a bloody sausage in galwan what matters is the ability for you to face that bloody chinese chinese for and bloody knock him to death that's it yeah thank you any sir. other question um next question is directed towards air marshal vasamanta the question is from mr uh, rajaram the christian what is the view of the sanction strength for the iaf for the evolving and expanding area of operations and increased theaterization of operations and the pressing levels are re uh, raging and replacements are delayed yet there is a reluctance to move uh, take on more stages nk to do you see this as an area of improvement so you mute it yeah uh, i think i'll first answer the tejas uh, mark 2 he says there is a reluctance how does he say there is a reluctance i think uh, already there are orders for the mark 2 when will the mark 2 fly maybe 2 years from now or 3 years when will it be produced and be ready as a weapon of war 5 years okay so you all have to be realistic just don't read the paper and say why can't what is where is the reluctance on mark 2 so if it becomes a weapon of war in 5 years time we have done big work so that's the tejas mark 2 as far as uh, Uh, the reduction in force levels are concerned yes we are very badly depleted in fact uh, uh, the three of the mig 21 uh, squadrons have no business flying at the moment and uh, we cannot remove them uh, from the fleet uh, because uh, we we don't have uh, squadron strength notwithstanding that we should be able to manage what the defenses of the nation requires i didn't understand the very first part what he talked about uh, so the first question is what is the view of the sanction strength of the indian air force for evolving and expanding area of operation and increased theaterization of operation yeah yeah uh, as far as expanding the area of operations i have already mentioned what is the area of operations that we are uh, we have chosen and uh, that remains even with the increased number the area of operations remain we have no uh, strategic interest in going and occupying islands and territories uh, anywhere we don't covet it at all marshal this is rajaram my question was slightly different the sanction strength for the indian air force squadron was uh, something that was fixed maybe and revised in the early 80s but now as you rightly mentioned the area of operations has increased 
so should there be a subsequent or a consequent increase in the sanction strength of the iaf was my question thank you sir yeah i'll answer you uh, the sanction strength of the air force was 39.5 squadrons that is 39 and a half in 2005 when the uh, uh, op directive came and we increased the area operations from the straits of malacca to manbasa it went to 42 that's what it is today thank you sir very clear thank you so much um i request all of you to kindly post the questions on in the chat box and not ask so the second question is from uh, sri subramanian sridharan sir to air marshal vasuman sir why has it in cope india taken place in recent years uh, as far as i think i think uh, we have had it in 2019 uh you see uh, exercising costs a lot of money number one number two a huge amount of our budget goes into the exercises that we uh, con- uh, we conduct uh, the way it is done is uh, we do alternate uh, that is every two years let's say we have cop india every two years when we have exercises every two years the two years one such is in india and then after two years it is in the us that way if i recall i think the last exercise was in 2019 uh, when uh, the us came for cop india to west bengal that's what i uh, remember it came up in uh, december so i don't think there are any breaks as such uh, the second aspect which you all must understand is are we getting the best bang for the buck if we are going to invest enough money and budget into exercises are we learning enough so we have to compromise on that we are not today we uh, we are not in the market to play with everybody we are in the market where we gain every time much more than previous if we find that that country is not putting his best foot forward we don't exercise why should i waste my time so we are on the side of dictating terms you come with your latest in force levels or uh, the weapons we take part otherwise we don't so let me say we are dictating more than just saying please come and we will exercise with everybody no <clears throat> thank you sir the next question is to group captain uh, chandrashekar sir uh, the question is from mr raja ramudi krishnan so do you think that indian polity is aware of the new trend of influencing elections by external agencies does does this seem to have engaged strategic community in india yeah i think if i'm aware that uh, they are trying to manipulate elections i'm sure the government must be fully aware of uh, you know external forces trying to you know play a role in the elections i'm sure there must be measures in place by the government and uh, i I'm, i'm sure the government may not be able to make public all of them but uh, we have to have a certain amount of faith that they must be knowing what's happening the next question um is to lieutenant general shankar sir and air marshal varsaman sir um the questions from bala subramanian china in recent times has been looking a lot into integrating land air defense systems where do india's combat flat platforms stand against china yeah can i take it on sir yeah see first and foremost china is trying to integrate their land and air we have done it long back please understand in 1971 we just wiped out the you know uh, pakistani air force in bangladesh completely and it was a completely integrated air land battle you know the last time when any major air drop took place and a vertical envelopment took place which involves a lot of air land uh, you know coordination was in bangladesh after that the world has not seen it okay so to think that we don't have air land uh, cooperation is out plus the fact from the 80s till now we have so much of operational flying and operational cooperation and operational existence we do in the north and the northeast unless you go through those places and i've been air maintained my unit has been air maintained you know how big it is to air maintain a unit what kind of co- coordination and cooperation which is required i have been the colonel adam of freedom 
this present place where eastern ladakh is taking place i used to count onions being you know, loaded in uh, chandigarh which have to go to siachen that remain uh, demands a huge amount of uh, cooperation if a air force pilot can tell me how many kgs of onions he is loading and taking it to a particular place he can tell me how much ammunition is also taking that's the kind of cooperation we have the chinese are just discovering it they didn't have a decent half decent air force they don't know how to fly they they have aircraft carriers on which aircraft can't take off look a lot of capabilities of china is blown up capabilities not factual capabilities not actual capabilities like someone said earlier we should be proud of what we are many or more often than not we don't even recognize our own strengths and i leave it to air marshal vartman to conclude because he is the more experienced and he's had a got a wider vision than i have over to you sir Sir, you're muted, sir. Vartman, sir, you're muted. I'm so sorry. Yeah, um, I agree with you completely, General uh, Shankar. Uh, there is no way uh, that uh, the two services do not think alike. Now, I've commanded the uh, East, and uh, my uh, colleague who was the East Army commander was General Bikram Singh. We thought together. we planned exercises together we worked together i mean there is no way you it's not uh, you know a stand alone uh, warfare so we worked together there's no question about it and uh, general shankar has uh, brought out how beautifully the results have come out in every uh, campaign uh, that we have uh, um, uh, i mean the country has got into so there is no question it's proper very well Uh, uh, procedurized uh, integration and joint operations thank you sir the next question um is to group captain um chandrashekar sir the question is from kamlur rs vasan what more can be done knowing the inadequacies of the capacity and capability of the nation's security architecture that's a huge question sir <clears throat> uh i can only talk as far as the cyber is concerned sir because i don't think we have to talk about the military the aspect and other things i brought out certain uh, you know way heads also like earlier also mr rajara master question about uh, trying to peddle into our elections we have the you know uh, cambridge uh, analytica which is their uk based we have mr george soros who is openly making statement that uh, you know about the prime minister about a particular country and all those things we do have certain mechanism in place uh, you know uh, you know we have organizations like silver tower and we also take a lot of uh, inputs from an organization called hasbara i'm sure most of you must be aware and uh, if you go through hasbara their activities you see a lot of things uh, you know it's basically an israeli i won't say a propaganda organization it's a pr organization we do take a lot of inputs from them and we do put them into action sir so uh, this is what immediately comes to my mind sir thank you sir so um the next question can you suggest suggest how to combat misinformation and disinformation especially in a democracy where fundamental rights and privacy comes in the way of maintaining security and integrity of india the question is directed to um, group captain chandrashekar sir yeah that's what the government will have to come into play because you have to be you know you have to be uh, able to weed out milk from water that is how the agencies will have to come into play you have to put people into position where they'll be able to carry messages to the government so you know instead of you know banning terming people urban axles and other things please bring out the narratives that whatever they are trying to portray are all false the people should know and the government has got a huge machinery the information and broadcasting ministry is there 
they should use they should bring out and you know bring out that all the narratives are not correct that is how they should be able to reach the masses the the ability to reach the masses rests with the government so the moment you have been effectively able to prove what are the wrong doings by those people and what remedial measures or what active correct measures have been taken by the government i think you would have been able to achieve your objective thank you very much sir due to time constraints we won't be taking any more questions but i promise you the questions will be noted and will be taken to the panel thank you thank you uh, very much sapna uh, it is my privilege and honor to thank all the distinguished uh, 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 please allow mr shivaram to have the last word he is a moderator thank you commodore this was an excellent presentation uh, both by air marshal vartman general shankar and finally group captain chandrashekar very erudite very comprehensive and a lot of information that has been given to some of us i hope in a modulated form we will be able to bring out these ideas in our c3 website so that it is open to larger public and they will be able to understand better what is happening in this country unfortunately this is an era of social media so therefore there is a lot of counter propaganda lot of divisiveness being created amongst different uh, services in this country so all these things now can be set right by well articulated articles being published in recognized think tank websites like yours and like many i mean like ours i must say like many others that are there in this country we do find very good articles in some other think sites including ours but it is extremely essential to focus this articles particularly on those people who are very gullible and who are prepared to listen to everything including intelligent people because i know for certain the amount of effort that has gone into in the development of the tejas and how much people are coordinated with the air force in the final stages of the evolution of this aircraft people seem to believe all kinds of things that is said about tejas and i have heard from the mouth of those people who were testing this aircraft in the aircraft testing center in bangalore the group captain various group captains and i think one has become an air marshal now so i was talking to them they were all praised for this aircraft people just don't understand because unfortunately these people cannot speak out in the public so it is very essential that c3 side should carry out this public purpose of educating the people by extracting lot of information with the consent of these people who presented here and presenting it in an intelligible form to the public thank you very much thank you very much all of you you are an exceeding well thank you right bala bala is bala is bala having a problem no sir my mic was oh, okay great issue right. thank you thank you very much sir uh, it is my great privilege to uh, present a vote of thanks to the distinguished chair and the uh, distinguished panelists for having taken their valuable time to uh, be with us uh, we express our sincere uh, thanks starting from our session uh, distinguished chair shri amar shivraman sir lieutenant general p r shankar sir air marshal s vardhman sir and group captain dr avi chandrashekhar sir for all the insightful presentations and having taken their valuable time to uh, be with us thank you very much once again sir and we uh, break for lunch for 30 minutes and we uh, meet back again at uh, 13 five hours for the okay, session 2 13 half now break 13:15 sir yep with the first presentation by india and geo economic environment by shri mr shivaraman sir followed by india's comprehensive national park 2022 challenges and policy options to be presented by shri pratap hedlikar sir and chaired and moderated by amador vijesh sir thank you very much and we meet again at 115 hours welcome back everyone to the second session this uh, let me begin by introducing the session chair amador vijesh kumar garg executive director c3s Kamnor Vijesh Kumar Garg VSM was commissioned in Indian Navy in 1984. He is a naval aviator and an anti-submarine warfare special 
specialist with very rich experience of flying from aircraft carriers and ships. He was trained in the United Kingdom and France in advanced flying for seeking 42B aircraft. He is an alumnus of IIT Roorkee, Indian Naval Academy, DCCS, DSSC, Wellington, and CDM, Second Rabat. He holds PG degree in Defense and Strategic Studies and another PG degree in Management. He has also served on the uh, on the uh, faculty of College of Defense Management and the visiting faculty for College of Air Warfare. In his long career of over 35 years in the Indian Navy, he has held numerous, uh, numerous staff training and command appointments. He has commanded three naval warships, one naval air squadron, two naval, naval air stations, and Delhi Naval Area. His last assignment was Deputy Director General of NCC Directorate, Tamil Nadu, Pondicherry, Andaman, and Nicobar Islands. He was a recipient of the Vishishta Seva Medal by President of India in 2013. He was also awarded a silver uh, beaten by the Governor of Tamil Nadu in 2018 for his uh, dedicated initiative towards girl empowerment in state. Currently, he is a visiting faculty at IIT, um, LI, LIBA, NIFT, and MET Chennai, and Executive Director of the Chennai Center for China Studies. I welcome you, sir, to the session too. Thank you so much, Shakma. Thank you so much. The first speaker for today's session um, is Sri M R Sri uh, Shivaraman IAS, former Revenue Secretary of Government of India. The topic will be India and geoeconomic environment. To give a brief introduction, Sri M R Shivaraman IAS retired. He joined the service in Madhya Madhi Pradesh. He is a qualified pilot, started his major assignment as collector of the famine affected districts of uh, uh, Jabu at the age of 25. He introduced innovative methods of providing relief since adopted countrywide, held several important points as Joint Secretary of Government of India in the Ministry of Finance, was Finance and Signing Secretary of the Government of Madhya Pradesh for over five years. While being additional secretary, Ministry of Commerce was appointed DG, DGCA India and made noteworthy contributions in the training of pilots, air safety, audit of the Indian uh, skies, um, five among many others. Subsequently appointed as Revenue Secretary of the Government of India, he was responsible for introducing major tax reforms in India. He introduced the PAN in income tax and started the com uh, computerization of the functioning of the Central Excise and Customs of India. Subsequently, he served as ED, IMF in Washington, D.C. with the rank of ambassador to the U.S. during 1996-1999. Sri M. Uh, Shivaraman pushed in the IMF the case of the emergent market economies to use CTP-based GDP for determining quotas and voting strength which ultimately the IMF adopted. He was also appointed by the UN to be one of the first advisors to the newly founded UN Secu uh, Security Council Committee to on counterterrorism, in which in which role he helped the UNSC to prepare the member count uh, member countries to implement the UN Resolution 1370 passed uh, after the 9/11 attack. I welcome you, sir, to the session two. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. <laughs> Most of the things I might have forgotten already. Um, what I'm going to speak here may sound a little bit technical, but I'm sure it will be comprehensible to all of you present here. So before we look at India in a geoeconomic situation, particularly in the neighborhood context, it is better to look into India's current economic situation. So starting from 2000, in the first five years, the gross value added. Gross value added means you can say it is GDP minus taxes, but plus subsidies. That is the actual production, production of goods and services. The growth was 6%. Next five years, 2006-2011, it was 8.6%. In 2011-2016, it was 6.7 percent, and between 2016 and 20, it was 7.3 percent. So, if you look at the last 20 years, 
we have had a very healthy growth of 7.1% on an average. And that is a very impressive growth for a democracy. Now, if you look at the IMF figures, the purchasing power parity, which I post the IMF to adopt, in purchasing power parity dollars, India grew during the same period at 5.2%. And in the case of China, it was 6.2%. So the major difference is only the, the difference is only one percent, but when you compound it, it becomes very large. But if you go back in history about thirty years, China grew at a pace which is two point five percent more than that of India. That is why if you compute it in a compound rate of growth manner, that is why you find China is about five to six five to five times more than India's GDP on nominal dollar terms. But if you look at on purchasing power parity terms, China may not be more than three times the size of India's economy in PPP dollar terms. So all this uh, talk about China is 15 trillion economy, 20 trillion economy, and all we have to look at it from a purchasing power parity basis. Because I have been in China, I have traveled uh, quite a bit in China, and the prices are very high there compared to India. Now, what is the problem that we can see savings rate in India, which was 36.9% against 48% savings rate in China, which even now it is about 40%. In 2011, it is now only 31.3%. It has even come down sharply during the pandemic period. It is only 29%. But the household savings, which is actually contributes maximum amount of savings to the entire economy, that has declined to 18%, which used to be 23 to 24%. These are serious issues which we have to look at. So my first policy prescription, I don't know what the finance minister is going to do. Savings in the household sector must be promoted. There are several ways of promoting household savings, which have not been done for the last 10 years or 15 years, which previously we used to do a lot. But now they have all been eliminated. But it is time now to rethink on this subject. Government has faced several problems in the last few years. There are three years you can say. Pandemic expenditure, phenomenally known, catered to the growing needs of the defense forces because of the various border problems you are facing, periodic elections, and huge expenditure on these elections, which nobody looks into in great detail, accepting the auditors and the uh, government departments concerned. The last year relief expenditure has been phenomenal and it has sucked into the state's resources also. <clears throat> and they also affect the general capacity of the country to produce goods and services, particularly in those areas which are disaster affected. Then the international obligations of India, like for the pandemic in neighboring countries, assistance to Sri Lanka and all, which I will touch a little later. So economic growth in India in the last few years has been subject to various stresses and strains. The other serious problem in India is regarding employment. I'm touching only the fundamental aspects of the economy. Employment in India has not grown satisfactory in the last few years. If you look at the latest survey which has been done, participation rate, in the, there is a growing unemployment in India. The participation rate is only 46%. 46% of the people are only working in this country. Compared to 66% in Indonesia, 56% in Bangladesh, 57% in Myanmar, and 50% in Pakistan. Now, the recent, some of the recent surveys have shown people do not want to work. Why do they not want to work? This is something which you people have to think over. The reason being, a lot of freebies are being provided by different governments, which is now becoming a matter of agitation in the Supreme Court. Now in India, in Tamil Nadu, for example, one need not work at all. You can just sit at home, gamble, and take whatever freebies that are being given by the government. So if this kind of situation continues, what happened in England? during the 18th century is likely to occur. When in England, every parish started providing free freebies to all the parishioners who said that they were all destitutes. 
Then came a situation in which the industries could not get labor at all. Even in Tamil Nadu, where I travel to many villages, people say, the farmers say they are not getting labor. Even though there is gross unemployment in the rural areas because people are getting freebies. So this was the situation in England and ultimately the, this was known as the abolish of the Poor Laws Act. There was a Poor Law Act by which all these freebies were being given throughout the country. That is abolished. That is that has been a subject matter of several books also uh, in the United Kingdom. What has the government done about it? In my opinion, as I have been in the administration, thick of administration, including being finance and planning secretary in Madhya Pradesh, there has not been any focused attention in the generation of employment in the sense that farm labor can be transferred to more productive employment opportunities. The latest survey shows that 42.5% of the labor force in the country is employed in agriculture. But agriculture gives only 15% of the GDP of this country. So therefore, per capita wise, agriculture is almost giving virtually nothing at the uh, per capita level for the labor force. So poverty, that is why you find, is quite perceptible in all the rural areas. No government has paid attention as to how to transfer this labor from agriculture into other areas. People think automatically they will be transferred. But if you look at the map of the industrial map of this country, industries tend to get concentrated only in certain areas. Wherever facilities are available, infrastructure facilities are available. Now, for example, I used to wonder, in fact, I used to talk to some other joint sectors in ME or some other places. What is the problem in locating an Infosys office employing 10,000 people in Nagaland or in Jabua, where I was the first collector of tribal district, or in some other place? There is no problem at all. Because after all, everything is now connected. Whatever software they prepare is going to be beamed to the satellite. Only thing is, they do not want to develop these centers in these interior areas. So I talked to another, they talked to the joint secretaries. They told me, sir, they tried the level best, but they were not willing. I do not know why they were not willing, because they are all eminent people. Chandrasekhar, for example, has been given Padma Shri or Padma Bhushan. Why can't you set up some of these TCS uh, centers in the interior areas of Tamil Nadu or interior areas of Bangalore or Madhya Pradesh or less developed states in Bihar and all? What is the problem? I don't think there will be any technical problem in this, in setting up software development centers in these places. In fact, I'm told one of the very important software companies located in Chennai, I don't want to name the person, he's probably known to some of you here. He takes people only from the rural area for developing high-tech products of his company. Not only software, but also hardware. The 4G um, uh, chip which he had designed, he himself stated they were developed by people who were taken from the rural area. If that can be done by one company, these are rural area lacking in talent if they are properly trained? I don't think so. There are people who are porters who have joined the IAS. They are, yesterday, I was looking into the uh, YouTube of one girl. She was somewhere in uh, uh, Chak, uh, in Basta, a tribal girl. She is now a collector in North Malabar district of uh, Kerala. If that can happen, what is the problem in some of these industries, which are huge profit-making units? Why can't they set up and spread the benefit of their uh, uh, benefit to the rural areas also? Then, if you look at even those who say they are employed, they are not employed. They are underemployed. What is known as underemployment equilibrium, that is what is prevailing in our country. In many places, people work only for two hours or three hours. And when you go to take a survey, they will say they are employed, they, but they are not fully employed. These are some of the problems which we are facing. Today, I was somewhat uh, happy to note that the Economic Times says that government of India is going to develop 700 districts. There are 720 districts, I think, 700 districts as export centers. But I did not find anywhere in the news item uh, the word employment. If they are setting up export centers, those export centers should generate employment for the rural people. And people who are having only half an hectare of land, 500 square feet of land on which they are cultivating, they should be asked to move into these centers of manufacture. Now, that is not probably politically acceptable because so far, so long, 
all these people have been talking about kisan jai kisan jai jawan jai kisan jai jawan so the kisan has started accepting the fact that he has to be born as a kisan live as a kisan die as a kisan only now i blame the politicians for creating this kind of an atmosphere in the rural areas why are they not saying that these farmers should go into a higher income level some of those people can go with the result our farm says can also grow now that kind of an attitude will change if it does not come we are going to not going to have that sustained growth nor are we going to in any way reduce the income inequality which is increasing in this country so there has to be a program of methodical shift of people through training into non agricultural employment areas the government of course gave a lot of incentive to the uh, medium and small industry sector in the form of loans in the form of paying their epf dues so that those people can continue the employment during the pandemic period that is going to end probably in march and they are all demanding it should be extended further but as it should be wise to extend it further so that these msmes do not die out in the case of china i'll just give an example i was i am reading a book known as dying for an iphone it's worthwhile reading this book and i will advise all the young uh, people in the c3 to read this book dying for an iphone foxconn has got more than 1 million people or 1.2 million people employed in china terry go their chairman you must read how foxconn functions each laborer works for 12 hours a day 12 hours a day and they are all underpaid the profit sharing between the people who are manufacturing assembling and selling iphone developing iphone the apple company gets 58.5% of the net profit 6% only goes to the foxconn mm-hmm. company which produces this assembles it and gives it away the remaining goes to marketing people and other people so that is why today apple company is a 3 trillion dollar company which is probably larger than the economy of india and they are all built on the bones the blood and the sweat of the people who are working for that for apple please read the uh, book dying for an iphone now the other problem is if you find uh, in india is asset asset creation is not taking place at all in this country because asset creation will take place only when the people are able to employ get a proper employment and they are able to save something now i come to mass migration in this country the total number of migrant labor in this country domestic migrant labor is 17 million of this 40 million is accounted for by uttar pradesh now uttar pradesh chief minister announced quite some time ago before the election code of conduct came into force that he was distributing 4000 crores to medium and small industries so that these people can be absorbed now this takes us on to another problem if amongst 40 million people let us say in 20 25 million people stay back in uttar pradesh or in bihar what happens to those industries where they were employed no those industries are very happy because they are using robotics they are using artificial intelligence they are in- introducing new management techniques whereas Where, by which they can give up these people, and with the result, their profitability is increased. How has their profitability is increased? You have been reading in the papers that the income tax revenue has gone up by forty percent, forty six percent, forty eight percent. How the hell can it go up when the production has not increased uh, in a commensurate manner? Of course, I have been in charge of income tax in this country. I know how much you can increase by administrative efficiency, how much you can increase by plugging the loopholes in one particular year. but it cannot go by 39 to 40% that is because of increased profitability increased incomes of those people who have been able to generate this income at the cost of the poor people down below and even government itself has accepted that the poor people have become poorer by 43 53% so these are all structural issues facing this country another point which i want to highlight very sharply is because i am in the field of uh, uh, encouraging people in agriculture to increase their productivity India's average yield of paddy is three thousand eight hundred and seventy-eight kilograms per hectare, compared to the world average of four thousand six hundred and seventy-nine kilograms. So that means we are one third, we are less productive than the world average. So even if we come to the world average, you can imagine the quantity of paddy this country will be able to produce. In the case of wheat, the difference is marginal. But if you look at the case of maize, 
the uh, world average is 5,924 kg. India produces 3,024 kg. So there is a long way to go in increasing the productivity of various commodities in the agriculture area. Now, what will we do with these products? Today, we have 100 million uh, tons of food grains in stock. What are we going to do with it? India can become an exporting country. So, and again, this will also generate a problem of embassy. Minimum support price. If all these commodities are going to be given minimum support price and we are going to produce such a huge quantity of uh, uh, commodities while reaching the world average of production, then what will happen to the amount which we will get much less while exporting this? That will have to be borne by the government. That itself will pose a very major issue. This is again a major policy decision which the government has to take. How much of food grains have to be produced in this country? How much of horticulture project has to be produced in this country? There is already a committee working, I am told, a working group by which certain paddy areas can be converted into sugarcane because we require molasses, we require methanol for our uh, uh, fuel pumps and certain uh, areas which are not conducive to producing sugarcane will be converted into paddy. So these changes will have to take place and they are not being pursued vigorously because again the problem of farmer, farmer resistance. <clears throat> now the other area in which we suffered very badly was the tourism sector. As you know tourism sector is the sector which employs the maximum number of people globally including India. Now when aircraft were down, they were not flying, ports were not open, Airports were not open, tourist centers were not open, trains were not moving, taxis were not flying. The people who were affected were all locally employed people in these areas. Now that I found out what 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 was the assistance given to a, a guide, a tourist guide. See some of these fellows with a the badge, they will be moving around in various Sarnath and other places. So I asked one of them, what is it that the government of India? They said government of India agreed to give them 5,000 rupees loan. Now, loan is not a thing which is going to take 5,000 rupees. Now, in the United States, what, what did uh, Biden, no, what did Trump do during the first stage of pandemic? The $5,000 will be credited in everybody's account. No, we did not have the courage to do it. We should have had the courage to help all these poor people. Then demand would not have been constrained. If demand had not been constrained, production would have taken place. That didn't happen in this country. We were all very, very clerical oriented in some of these decision making. Now, there is something which will be astounding when I tell you this. Out of 61.8 lakh sanctioned post of teachers in this country, for which the government of India has got accurate data, 10.6 lakh teachers posts are vacant in the schools. One-sixth of the sanctioned posts of teachers are, are vacant. Where are they vacant? Most of them are vacant in Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh alone accounts for 2.1 lakh teachers posts lying vacant. Bihar accounts for another 2.1 lakh posts lying vacant. The rest of the country, about 6 lakh posts of teachers are lying vacant. Why should the teachers posts lie vacant? If you look at Tamil Nadu or uh, Karnataka, you won't find this kind of vacancy position. But you will find this vacancy position in many of the North Indian states. Why is the government not pers persuading these people to fill up these posts? Government itself will be able to generate 1 million employment. 1 million employment in no time in their own books. Similarly, 4,000 4, judges posts in trial courts are vacant. When you talk about slow, uh, slow justice, when you talk about speedy justice, you must think about the number of judges available. 4,000 judges post sanction strength are lying vacant and these posts are to be filled by the state governments and most of these posts are lying vacant again in northern Indian uh, states, not in south Indian state. Tamil Nadu's position is much better. Then similarly, high court judges posts are also vacant. So what happens from a governance point of view, which is being emphasized by many of the speakers before me, we find that governance cannot be good. If you do not have delivery of justice in time, if you have all the posts of judges vacant, if your teacher's posts are not being filled up, how do you say that India is going to get educated? How is it you say you can have a, a, a skilling of the people in the rural area? You can't. So some of these areas are being neglected by the country 
because of populist schemes. I know there are certain schemes which are very well implemented, like for example, the rural water supply scheme, where people are getting tap water in their houses. I've seen myself in many villages, people are started getting tap water in their houses. Gas, free gas supply, that's all fine. I'm not saying that those should not be done. I am only saying where it is going to provide what is called endogenous growth. There, are, there is what is known as endogenous growth theory in economics, which says if you do well in the education sector, if you do well in the health sector, then your country will automatically grow. This is what happened in the Southeast Asian countries. I have studied it very carefully as a director in the International Monetary Fund. These countries were setting apart minimum of 6% of GDP for education and health, whereas we were setting apart 1% of our budget for even now we have not reached the level of six percent perhaps in the health we have reached on account of the uh very serious situation which we face may i request you keep your time sir beg your pardon may i request you just keep a time in my mind uh time i think i'll exceed the time to some extent so you'll have to pardon me for that so as far as the uh india and its neighborhood is concerned let me jump certain things and i'll go to india and its neighborhood india according to the world has been the first responder in all natural disasters around us. There have been 25 natural disasters in the last uh, 20 years, 23 years, and India has been always been the first responder, which provided maximum assistance through its armed forces, through its other agencies, and particularly in the case of Nepal, we have done tremendously well. So the world recognizes our assistance to the neighborhood. And similarly, India's this current year's budget, 2021-22, we have provided 5,000 crores as assistance to our neighboring countries. 5,000 crores. Bulk of it will go to Bhutan, where we are building power stations, and we have agreed to buy back the power. We have also provided assistance to Mongolia. We are providing assistance to Myanmar. We are providing assistance to all these countries on from our budget. So therefore, when you look at India's neighborhood economic policy, recently we have given $1.9 billion assistance to Sri Lanka. We have never fallen short of providing assistance to them then where have we gone wrong? So when you look at the uh, criticism that is against India, if you there is, there is a huge volume of literature on small countries, huge volume of countries, how the small countries manage themselves, are they good, are they bad, how do they look upon the large countries? So they find that the small countries, in particularly in the case of the small countries around India, India is overawed. They are overawed. No, I don't think anybody is overawed. If they are doing it, that's wrong. And we should never think of when we are providing assistance to Sri Lanka, that it is some kind of a charity we are doing. Sometimes probably this is the kind of feeling the Sri Lankans get or some other country whom we assist we get. In fact, the media was stoutly condemned by the international media. Indian media was condemned because they were overawing people in uh, Nepal and they were bossing them around. That you can go into the Google and you find the way in which it has been done. So as far as uh, the neighborhood is concerned, in my opinion, the mindset of Indian officers should change. Mostly it is at the bureaucratic level where all these exchanges take place. I have led many delegations to all the neighboring countries. I have interacted with them. And whenever you interact with them, be generous, be uh, humble. Do not try to show that you are superior to them or anything. If a Maldives foreign secretary comes, he is as good as a foreign secretary in international fora as a foreign secretary of India or a foreign secretary of the United States. So we have to treat them on an equal footing. Then only I think we will be able to create some kind of a trust in us. Now, I think uh, this, some of these points were touched by, um, uh, I think, uh, General Shankar and uh, one of the speakers before me, that we, while we have a very good uh, uh, equation in all these matters with the neighboring countries, we have not created that sense of trust and the trust of, uh, that they can always trust India. They, some of the, some missing link is there by which you will find there is a flip-flop in Sri Lanka, sometimes it is India, sometimes it is China. Even in Bangladesh, of course, now they have come back to Nepal. There is no reason why we should have a strained relation with Nepal. There is no reason at all. But from 1947 onwards, if you read M.K. Rasgotra's book, uh, his biography, uh, his autobiography, from 1947-48 onwards, there has always been some kind of a love-hate relationship between India and Nepal. And of course, China, of course, I can say, I think uh, one of the speakers said that already, I think there, there may be a thaw in our relationship. Our trade relationship has gone up to $120 billion between India and China. This has gone up. And I don't think any country would like to break it, the least of all China. China may be slowly start realizing it. 
with our armed forces uh, might being shown there and that they will never be able to cross the barrier uh, of the Indian armed forces. So it may probably thaw to some extent. I don't know when it will thaw, it may thaw. Uh, but in the meanwhile, we should be able to at least bring around the neighbors in a form of true friendship with us and creating trust in them. Pakistan, I don't want to comment here. So let me stop here so that uh, uh, the next speaker can take on and proceed from here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commodore Vasan. I don't want to thank C3 because I am part of C3. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for analyzing the Indian economy in, in, in the right way. What is ailing economy and what can be done, what should be done by the government of the day? And your experience being a former revenue secretary, being the world organization, brought it out so nicely. Thank you so much, sir. Gentlemen, next speaker of my session is Mr. Pratap Havlikar, though he doesn't need any introduction. He's a very eminent speaker. He is an ex special secretary of cabinet secretariat with 38 years of experience in various appointments, which are very secretive, in fact. So I won't name them. But he has a great experience in insurgency and counter insurgency appointments and his experience. But currently, he is the manager trustee of the Institute of Contemporary Studies in Bangalore, ICS, and is a partner with uh, C3S with RRU affiliation, as Commodore Vasan mentioned earlier. He is a certified info security practitioner, and he is a visiting professor, adjunct professor. If I name the universities and colleges, the list is never ending. He is such a demand in all the college and university in Bangalore or across abroad as well. With this very brief, brief introduction, may I request uh, Shri Pratap Havlekar to convey his uh, talk to us on comprehensive national power, challenges and option for India. What do you sir? <coughs> Thank you, Komro Garg. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I owe thanks to the Chennai Center for China Studies and the National Maritime Foundation for the invitation to come and share my views on the subject of uh, national importance. The presentations and views of the previous speakers has provided us perspectives from several economic and cultural aspects. I think it has been a wonderful forenoon and early afternoon to look at these things in their perspective and to decide as to how we are going to assess the situation and create policy options for the future. Uh, when it was proposed that I should speak on the subject of uh, comprehensive national power or comprehensive national economic strength. I had earlier made a small note on this in the year 2008 when I was in service on India's comprehensive economic strength and how India needs to leverage it in uh, the pursuit of its national interests and national objectives. So the, uh, the comprehensive national power has its roots in uh, uh, the Chanakya's uh, works, it deals mainly with elements of sovereignty and how uh, a ruler decides to uh, exercise his economic power to make his country powerful mm -hmm. so that uh, it does not become vassal to a neighboring state or become subordinate to a power uh, that seems to be in a position to subordinate. However, the popularity of this, uh, the concept, the uh, comprehensive national power, was actually popularized by the Chinese mm -hmm. Communist Party in the mid 90s, when it became part of the national security doctrine of the Communist Party of China. I think that's where uh, each, uh, all of us have been looking at what is China's uh, comprehensive national power, how, what is China's uh, comprehensive economic power? What does the Chinese Communist Party intend to do with its national security doctrine? What are China's national security interests? What are China's national security objectives? 
and how does it articulate them? What are the uh, tangibles and intangibles in this policy? I think these are some of the things that uh, China has uh, you know, told us that, uh, that this, this, this form part of its, uh, the Communist Party's uh, guiding principles. However, uh, in, today, in today's terms, in today's parlance, uh, comprehensive national power is based on an acronym called DIME, that is uh, diplomacy, in, importantly, economic power. All of these four are the four pillars of uh, comprehensive national power, and each of them brings to the fore a large other concomitants like geopolitical location, your economic strength, natural resources, your population dividends, and uh, such important parameters that create the uh, national, the national uh, uh, <clears throat> comprehensive national power. Uh, this was some, some something I thought <clears throat> I would like to have as an introductory remark. <clears throat> but I would like to place some of these in the Indian context. Uh, some of them are very, very interesting, which I would like to share with you. Uh, since independence, India has conducted <clears throat> four in-house reviews and one interministerial report uh, on national security management. The first one involved China. The one was terrorism related and the rest were Pakistan centric. I'm talking of uh, 1962, it was China centric, 1965, 1971, 1979, which was uh, again Pakistan centric, then one terrorism, which resulted in uh, what we saw in Mumbai in uh, 2008. But <clears throat> most of these reviews, as we have seen, focused mm -hmm. on India's defense and foreign policy matters. They did not focus entirely on internal security issues or other issues that should have become part and parcel of the national security management system. So the, uh, the uh, Cargill Review Committee report for the first time, uh, the Indian political top brass came together, sat together and created a document that gave a comprehensive look at India's uh, national security management systems, what it ought to be done in the future, and what were the other areas, other departments, and who were the other stakeholders in the quest to secure India's national security uh, systems. This was followed by the report, what is generally called as the Naresh Chandra Task Force Report on Intelligence Restructuring and Management. Uh, I can testify because I appeared before this task force thrice to, to speak about the role of intelligence and how security has to be managed and how security and intelligence are not diverse from each other. And what needs to make India's security much stronger and more uh, effective. Uh, this was followed again in 2017 by the General Shekatka's report which recommended uh, <clears throat> measures to India's measures. Balanced defense expenditure to create a much, uh, you know, uh, stronger and more effective uh, organization. So I think uh, apart from the uh, four reports that focus mainly on uh, uh, defense and uh, external affairs, the ARC, focus on a bigger canvas, looked at things which are today even very relevant, and some of them have become have laid the foundations for effective uh, management uh, on the subject. The Shikatka report has led to a large number of changes within the armed forces, is how to the theater, the theater command concept and what it means in the next 5, 10, 15 years when it gets fully operationalized. Having said all this, I think in one of his uh, uh, public discourses, late General Bipin Rawat, when he spoke at the Vivekananda International Foundation last year, dwelt on the subject of theater commands. I think he 
did well to lay to rest some of the rumors and some of the innuendos that had been swirling around uh, this particular uh, subject. But in the course of his, uh, uh, his articulation of the subject, he also mentioned that uh, the, uh, the, the reorganization of the defense forces did not stop in the Ministry of Defense, that it would include the Central Armed Police Forces and some of those organizations in the Home Ministry, which he thought should come to the same level of training and officer-led and things like that. I think it was a very, very, very focused thing. And I think this has been one of, as I say, one of the best uh, methods where to project that India's internal stability is going to play a major role in creating a comprehensive uh, national economic power. So that's what I felt that uh, uh, was happening in the last five, seven years. I think there has been greater and better direction uh, the country is taking in this national security management. <clears throat> I think uh, on Monday, the Institute of uh, Defense Studies and Analysis uh, lecture on late Mr. K. Subramaniam, who was the one who uh, gave effect to some of the recommendations of the uh, Kadir Review Committee report. And he also was a man who brought a greater amount of understanding of the subject. And it's going to be uh, a very, very important uh, presentation in the IDSA that the Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies Analysis. And I think I would recommend people who have uh, a liking for this subject to register and uh, you know uh, participate at the event. It's going to be very, very interesting. Why I was while I was talking about <clears throat> the, um, the reports which had been created in the past, for example, we have the Pradhan and Balachandran report, which went into the um, uh, why the Maharashtra police or the Mumbai police were not able to react to the seaborne attack on Mumbai. Uh, it made a lot of difference, and how um, we were not uh, in sync with some of the international or national developments. For example. Uh, the Mumbai attacks of 1993 brought to the fore the need for greater interaction between the Union government and the state police forces to deal with foreign-assisted internal security challenges. I think there is a certain hiatus between what is happening in the states and in the center. There is need for the gaps in intelligence management and intelligence sharing and execution of this intelligence to become much more uh, pronounced and more organized. Uh, in the um, context, Commodore uh, um, Wage, Commodore uh, Gurgilat, forgive me, I'll have to switch off my video because I'm experiencing uh, uh, bandwidth problems. I hope no, I'm sure, sir. Right. no, sure, sir. You can switch off your video, sir. Okay. So, in the context of uh, the comprehensive national power, India has two major challenges that need to be addressed sooner than later. The first emanates from the fact that our institutions of governance state, are based on sector-specific knowledge and management systems. They are unable to collaborate in delivering multi-party, multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral responses to emerging national or international emergencies. The second challenge lies in changing the enduring notion that national security should only be understood in, should be understood more in a comprehensive manner than in narrow military terms. I think this, we need to understand that today there are more states. Many years ago. Secondly, the, the third, the third fact which I want to stress upon is to look at how we can uh, do away with the silo system that is in existence today. We have seen uh, the silo system has not been able to deliver the goods. We'll have to see how we can bring about salience across the spectrum to bring the best possible results to the fore, where um, we need to have a better sense in the way we spend or expend revenue 
in the prosecution of uh, various uh, government policies and programs. I think that the three things are very important that we need to uh, create a better understanding of national security priorities across the departments, not only in the union governments, ministries and departments, but also in public sector undertakings. And to bring up the state governments to a platform where they can also understand what are India's national security requirements, at least the internal security requirements. Eight, what happens in some of the other states indicates to us that no state in India today is isolated from the challenges that are within the country or come from outside the country. We have now we have been we have seen that right from 1947 to at least 2008, the country's natural defense mechanism stretched from what we say from from nine o'clock in our watch to three o'clock in the watch. You had that the defense and security mechanism is absolutely well placed, but you look at Peninsular India we still had to create mechanisms that will ensure that Peninsular India remains stable and safe. Now, Peninsular India also attracts a lot of uh, attention from inimical forces. The uh, surge of what happened in Sri Lanka in 2019 has expressions in Peninsular India, especially in, in Kerala. Some of the southern states also are breeding grounds for some of these ideas, extremist ideas, which exist. So we need to understand that the peninsular states are not free from the problems that our states in the north and the northeast or the west have faced. I think we need to open our minds that we are looking at greater and even more challenging uh, future. So I think uh, we need to, that's the first one. The second one, we have to cooperate across the existing compartments. We have to create uh, uh, management systems to react to situations. We are not looking at uh, situations where we need to act as a fire brigade. We need to act as something beyond that to bring about you know, greater cohesion in uh, activities. And <clears throat> so why I say this, I can underline this by the fact that the coronavirus pandemic of 2019 it's now acknowledged nationwide that it has exposed the fault lines in our systems of political governance and national security management. I think now the status quo which presided at that point of to ensure that whatever we have seen during the pandemic, we are prepared, like we did the third wave of the pandemic, we are much better prepared to face the consequences of it rather than allow it to overtake us in the uh, medium term. So <clears throat> the other thing which has happened, which we all need to focus as you know, students of uh, security or as uh, practitioners of security, that our <clears throat> traditional security scenario, uh, which had has now several more factors onto it. We have two areas of um, the security scenario. One is the, the traditional one. When we talk about defense, we talk about the role of the army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, the, uh, the, the armed forces in Union of India, the Central Armed Police Forces, the Central Police Organization, and agencies like this. And now on the non-traditional side, you have uh, suddenly the, uh, India has become the pharmacy of the world. Pharmaceutical industry in India today has now become an industry of national importance. So it shifts to the traditional side. You have to make allowance to protect this industry from being affected. Likewise, you have water, you have climate. For example, when you talk about climate, we talk about migration. There is There are reports which we feel need to be, you know, um, given greater focus is that when uh, in, in by the year two, 2040 or 2050, when you have um, uh, climate change and uh, things taking effect in Bangladesh, you will have at least 15 to 30 million people waiting to cross over to India. 
because Bangladesh is like a horseshoe, three sides India and the fourth side is the Bay of Bengal. So we are looking at some of these challenges, not only for the present, for the future. So I think uh, <clears throat> we, we need to uh, create um, for ourselves the capacity to think, to be proactive, as, at least in the, uh, the national security arena. <clears throat> now, I think um, having dealt with some of the past and the, the, the present um, uh, so security scenario, and now I just like to <clears throat> place before uh, the, the today's um, audience uh, somewhat of the the policy options that we have in the prosecution of our uh, comprehensive uh, national power. In my own view, <clears throat> The first is to create narratives in several areas of the national security where absolutely, absolutely necessary. The first and the foremost in this, in this narrative is India has to clearly state its national security interests and objectives and define what our, our tangible and intangible interests, and how do we uh, protect uh, this and how do we leverage all this? For example, China has made it very clear in its uh, national security doctrine that the future of Tibet, the future of Taiwan, the future of trade, the future of its uh, land borders is not negotiable. China will not negotiate with you or with anybody else who wants to talk, talk, talk about it. Or, China is willing to negotiate on certain other issues which it feels that it does not have any major bearing on its national security uh, interests. I think the time has come that India also needs to talk about these things in a very, very focused manner so that you know, not only the, the, uh, the instruments of state, but also the others understand what India needs to do. For example, uh, the prime minister and some of his colleagues has spoken up. He has, uh, you know, views on maritime security, on cyber security, on international cooperation in terrorism, and what needs to be done. So I think at the highest levels, we have uh, uh, utterances of the government, uh, which gives us the idea that this is the direction that we are going to take. But these are all contours of a policy. We require a PAKA policy to tell us that in defense, in security, in strategic affairs, how do we do, who's responsible for this and how do we take these things forward? At least then there's clarity in the minds of people like us that a political directive is given that this is going to be our national security uh, doctrine. For example, the government of India today speaks of maritime security. The prime minister has spoken about Sagar. He speaks about projects where we feel that India can play a very positive and a proactive role. I think that's the first uh, first option of, for my side is to create a narrative and be able to fulfill that narrative by using your comprehensive national power. I am not equating a $4 trillion economy with China's $16 trillion economy. I'm talking about where India can leverage its strength in a manner you don't have to compete with. I think India has got far more uh, to offer than what others can offer. In fact, Mr. Sivaraman also alluded to this in his uh, presentation earlier. So now, uh, for example, uh, can we uh, think in terms of creating a counter narrative uh, for what China's national security interests and objectives are? I can just go back to October uh, to, to the year 2020, when four think tanks, the Chennai Center for China Studies, my own institute, the seminars, where we focus entirely on China. And uh, it is not surprising that we had over 70 eminent speakers at that point of time. People across the uh, spectrum spoke, and we were able to garner such huge amounts of information which we could you know use in the uh, best way possible private think tanks are going to be another area which the government can leverage 
in trying to send out its uh, signals to people concerned. I think we need to be upfront. We need to speak boldly about where we stand on certain issues of our national security. The, the third narrative, in my view, India in its neighborhood is a bully or a threat. But underline the fact that India is an opportunity. Today, if you look at the northeastern part of India, it sits in a it's an area where it has access to a billion people, not only from Nepal, Bhutan, southwestern China, you talk about Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Southeast Asia. If you're able to harness the uh, natural and other resources of the Northeast, you're creating a huge market for yourself. And countries like Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, who depend on us, uh, they're dependently much more, Myanmar, for that matter of fact. I think we need to look at how we can place ourselves as a market for these people to you know, come and uh, join us in this uh, economic union or a union where we could do a lot of business together. In fact, none of these countries uh, are in, are good. In fact, I think India has, in its uh, dealings with Bangladesh, uh, reconciled, uh, resiled from uh, some of the, the territorial maritime claims we had. I think India has a, a lot that India has offered. India has made this offer to our neighboring countries. And I think we need to project ourselves as an opportunity and not as a threat. For example, uh, just three days ago, the uh, Sri Lankan High Commissioner to India in an interview with Economic Times said, there are eight sectors of Sri Lankan economy which want to integrate with India. And he's named them. And if I look at it, all of them are low hanging fruit. The government of India has itself. I think the government of India has given Sri Lanka in excess of $4 billion line of credit since um, 2002 or 2003. And it's a, it's a great uh, you know, foreign development assistance that we are giving that country. May I request sum up, sir? Sorry? May I request to sum up, sir? OK. Uh, I think um, now I, the, the same, the, the, same uh, the narratives need to be done for our for our neighboring countries or countries in ASEAN or countries in the Indian Ocean region. For example, you look at uh, Seychelles, Madagascar, Mauritius. Uh, we don't need to look at uh, having naval bases there. You already have a close association with the French and France has got some of the outstanding na naval bases in those. I think that there are narratives that we need to think about. There are narratives that we can you know, handled, and there are narratives that we need to exploit. I think <clears throat> uh, time has come for us to uh, not to worry about what's happening in our neighborhood, what the Chinese are doing. As you take note, we are not in competition. We are not there to, uh, you know, run away from the opportunity. We have opportunities, but we need to be very, very uh, fair in our assessments, how we are going to do these things. But the governments, the government's efforts needs to be buttressed by the private sector. I think uh, old age saying uh, uh, the flag follows commerce. Let the private sector take advantage of the condition that exists today. I think that would be something which I would say how India's uh, comprehensive national power can be addressed, how it can be taken ahead. And the narrative and you follow through with the narrative. I think that's where I went. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Very nicely put across that comprehensive national power is not just looking narrowly on the defense. It is across whether your industry, as uh, before uh, the speaker, Sri Shivraman brought up the economics, internal economics, and the your connection with the world, how you can take the opportunities. He just mentioned, uh, Mr. Hapalika just mentioned opportunities, low hanging fruits. The question was, how do we encash them in the right time? And he mentioned very three very important points and his options, the narratives. We got to make the narrative, and uh, I saw one chat box uh, suggestion. Defense has come out with their, their, their naval merit strategy, Air Force strategy, Army strategy, doctrines, inter in, integrated doctrine. But as Mr. Shivaran said earlier, that we don't have a national security doctrine until now. 
Pakistan has come out recently. How bad it is, how flawed it is, they are different, but they have come out one. China has one. The time has come for us as a nation. Let's analyze and proactively with cohesion, let's do a capacity building based on this analysis as a national security doctrine. I'd like to thank my both the speakers, Shri Shrivaman and uh, Shri Havlikar for putting out the thoughts very clearly for the, for the audience mm -hmm. and bringing out the thought process in the right direction. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Over to you, Sapna, for question answers. Thank you very much, Vijay, sir. Uh, now we are moving on to the question and answer session. The first question is from Mr. Rishi Atreya. The question is, to, uh, is directed to both the speakers and the chair. The question is, why is there no defense of foreign policy white paper or strategy document released by the civilian bureaucratic government? Either head well, researcher or... Rishi, I'm going to address to chair. I will start with moderating that way. This is a topic which is in the domain now and is being addressed that military has come up with some doctrine, but military alone can't make a can't be alone power. It depends on the economics. If you don't have mula, you can't buy the ships. But they are competing requirement in the nation. There's a poverty, there's a there's an industry requirement, there's the requirement to generate employment, the education, the health care. When you put together, yes, there is a requirement which Mr. Hablika just said that we need to cohesively think, proactively think, and come out with a doctrine, which, yes, is a need of a time. It will come, I suppose. Let me add to that. So earlier, we had the planning commission. So once in five years, we used to prepare a five-year plan detailing everything on national economic strategy. The planning commission has been wound up now. Now we have the Niti Aayog. Niti Aayog comes out with a separate kind of plans for different sectors. So you do not see a unified picture of the country as a whole. There has been the big loss for the country, for the academicians, for everyone. Because you, all of us used to participate in the preparation of a state plan document and which is to be integrated into a national plan document. Where we could see which are the areas in which investment is taking place. Now, evolution from that would be the national strategy document, which national strategy could include military strategy as well as internal strategy as well as uh, the uh, strategy for economic development. Now, they are all integrated. They, the, the lines are very blurred between these three. Domestic uh, security, border security, and economic security. These are all uh, areas which are all now integrated and they, the, the, the lines are very blurred. So if you want to prepare, I have seen the Pakistan uh, national security document, which I don't think uh, I would talk much about it. If you are to prepare a national security document for this country, it is a very complex, it is going to be a very, very complex document. Because of the fact we have got so many states, all of them are going for elections. They, they have got different parties, different ideologies, different beliefs, different strategies. And all of them, if you want to bring and integrate into one single national document, particularly from the point of view of domestic security as well as domestic economic growth which are intertwined, it's going to be highly complex. Just as every state government, if a central government is in power with a, in a, with a different political party, a party in a state government which is diametrically opposed to that party in power in central government will immediately negative it. Whether right or wrong, they will say no to it. And there are a lot of bureaucrats, a lot of people who will support them. So even bureaucrats who have been in power, as you see in the case of recent case of IAS rules being changed, I strongly support this change in those rules. But there are a number of bureaucrats who are opposing it because I know the reason why they are opposing it. Some ideological reasons, some for personal reasons. So the national document, whichever way you want to prepare it, it is going to be cut into pieces by the state governments with their chief ministers and others with different ideologies. And bureaucrats will have to toe their line. Even if the bureaucrat, the chief ministers are opposed this kind of a policy on an all India service by the government of India, they would be in the heart of our feeling it's a good policy because they get an opportunity to go to government of India. I know a number of officers here in Tamil Nadu government who simply were denied to go to government of India. So these are all complex issues when you look into the details of it. Like for example, Mr. Abdika said about the, uh, the, the coastal security. 
Now, coastal security up to a particular limit from the coast comes under the state government. Now, it is integrated with the coastal security beyond that limit also. So, you have to work with the coastal security coast guard. Then beyond that comes the Navy. So, there has to be an integration of with all these things. The one state government says, no, 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 we are all independent. This is federalism. Federalism is being violated and all that. How can you prepare a document which will be acceptable to all? I think, I mean, I'm not there. I was not there in, or never associated with this kind of a thing. I feel that must be the major constraint facing the government in preparing a comprehensive national document. If at all they prepare one, it will be only national security document concerning the military strategy. For domestic purposes, it will be very difficult for them to prepare. Thank you, sir. Hebrika, sir, would you like to come? <clears throat> yeah, I think <clears throat> um, as far as uh, the Pakistan document is concerned, or the world in China is concerned, uh, these are byproducts of a system where uh, there's one one particular uh, agency or one uh, organization which controls all the levers of power. So it's, it's very simple for them to articulate what they think that they ought to be doing. But uh, in a democracy like ours, like what Mr. Sivaraman said, we have um, multiple uh, agencies, multiple views, and um, you know um, you have um, political um, ideologies that um, contribute to the slow uh, development of a national security doctrine. But yes, I think uh, at the beginning of this uh, in BJP led India government in 2014. There were a um, lot of um, uh, hopes that the Modi government would try and reach out to the um, state governments, especially states having international borders or maritime borders, to think about an integrated uh, security plan. But um, even that um, is very, very slow moving. For example, an organization called the NatGrid was to be established. It was approved in 2008. And it has just seen the light of the day because uh, NatGrid had jurisdiction which was pan India. And some of the state governments had very grave doubts of how NatGrid would function. So I think uh, there is a need as to how we look at maybe it's one of the narratives that we need to create. How do we close this, bridge this gap? And if we have if we have consensus on defense and uh, national security related issues, I think internal security related issues do require a lot of uh, assistance. For example, you talk about the national uh, disaster management system. Every state gets the uh, assistance of the union government at this point of time. So why is it that the same alacrity or uh, urgency is not shown in other cases? I think there is a case to uh, look at this in a very holistic manner. It may not happen uh, overnight, but certainly take time. But India needs, for example, what I'm saying is by the government of India is now thinking in terms of a 2047 centenary celebration, uh, some 25, 26 years from now. And that's how it's being planned. Maybe this could be one of the items that we put in there. That, you know, as you progress from a three to five to seven trillion dollar economy, let's also try and see how we can create synergies that all of us are on the same same platform, same page, as far as this subject is concerned. I think there is a lot of scope. There is hope it can be done. There is only one point I have to make. Very recently, Government of India extended the jurisdiction of the BSF along the borders to some more uh, areas in the border areas of the border states. Look at the kind of opposition that is there from two state governments. Other state government did not protest, but two state government violently protested and they are still protesting. So these are the complications which the government of India faces while preparing a nationally acceptable document. Uh, very validly put by uh, Mr. Pratap. Thank you, sir. The next question is directed to um, Shivraman, sir. The question is from Parthi Sharma. The Oxfam, Oxfam report states the economic divide between rich and poor in India, in India is India is 22 percent hold the entire wealth. So, should the taxation policy on wealthy must be more stringent, or will it cause capitalism flight? No, I think uh, see as far as taxation is concerned, in order to bridge the economic inequality, taxation alone will not serve the purpose because that is a negative approach. 
the positive approach would be to see how big well as i mentioned in my talk that how much you can transfer agriculture labor from agriculture into other more productive areas that is where the crux lies where you can reduce inequality in income yes you can tax people more to some extent there will be capital flight capital flight is taking place even now and capital flight legitimately is taking place and illegitimately also it is taking place and once you put a very heavy tax the it will be accelerated further so these things will have to be kept in mind while uh, trying to create a balance between taxing the rich and developing the poor in a manner that will take their income levels also rise thank you sir the next question is from um, mr bala subramanian the question is to pradap hebliker sir in terms of uh, comparative national power we have the concept of perceived power on these lines china always fares ahead although india has enough muscle we portray knee jerk reactions rather than responses what can be done to improve on this perceptions of india and build narratives this <coughs> is a very uh, very interesting question from bala uh as you know we have uh, in the last china center for china center for china studies has been looking at these issues in a very focused manner and uh, secondly that we have over several webinars established the fact that um, in a manner of speaking um, we seem to have sometimes overestimate the the chinese prowess or the chinese power and um, to we also need to understand that um, as far as india is concerned india has not been a pushover india india has the uh, right attitude we could st stand up and tell the chinese way to get off but that only will happen if you are creating a narrative where you are going to take on where you have to understand how to take on the chinese and how to create a situation where you will be able to deliver effectively and without any problems for example uh, the question which was asked to me once by bala himself about the chinese ambassador's visit to jaffna uh, the chinese ambassador did come to jaffna it was the first time that such a visit had been publicized he did come to the warm, warm waters of the indian ocean to look at uh, india from whatever binoculars he was wearing but that was a chinese way of projecting its uh, influence over the sri lankan government telling the uh, government of india that uh, china will continue to practice what uh, it preaches and it will it will you know <clears throat> demonstrate its diplomatic and other uh, powers but mind you today <clears throat> uh, china is very unpopular in most of our neighboring countries having served in sri lanka i have seen how sri lankan defense forces officers who had been nominated to undergo courses in pakistan and in china said that they prefer to go to india can you get more uh, vacancies for us it happened in the case of sri lankan policemen or others india is, india is popular in the way the man in the street uh, is in favor of india there is just no doubt about it but it is the media Uh, entrenched media in Sri Lanka and certain sections of the Sri Lankan uh, uh, clergy, certain sections of their uh, uh, political uh, class have this problem. For example, the JVP has never forgiven India for having intervened twice to put down the insurrection. Mm -hmm. Wherever India is involved, the JVP is unlike. They to take a soft line. You look at Myanmar; you have the same problem. in fact if under the itec and the uh, other pro other uh, development assistance we give most of the burmese army officers navy officers navy officers prefer to come to india for training i think we have to leverage this in a very uh, you know focused manner that's why i was saying in the beginning you have to create narratives you have to create narratives which will challenge china i'm not saying take you know fisticuffs challenge them For example, what uh, we are going to do this year or the next year, we could talk about narratives. For example, we had one particular um, uh, webinar last year when we spoke about China's monopoly on rare earths. How a country like India can challenge China? 
why our policy makers where our news makers are not focused on this so I, i don't think that it's a difficult task and we need to focus and today there are many more organizations that talk about china than what was over 5 10 years ago i think we have the information we have the knowledge and we need to put all of them in front of us and evaluate them how we can get these narratives to work i hope um, bala is satisfied with the answer i will uh, supplement uh, very much sir thank you sir i will supplement what you said i mean i'm sorry to say this the indian media has never supported the government it's only of late they have been talking about army 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 because some of them get to go and visit some of these areas and come back and they pretend as though they have become army commanders i see one fellow with a stick and showing sand models and thinking he is general montgomery reborn so this is a kind of indian media and as he rightly pointed out in um, communication technology in radar technology india has probably has surpassed many countries in the world some of our radars and all are far superior to others uh, which other countries do have they never projected now only somebody was talking about artificial intelligence government of india has provided about 800 crores for artificial intelligence uh, for uh, also uh, quantum computing quantum computing center has already come up where they have started working on a complete quantum computer artificial intelligence research work is going on everywhere in the country and everywhere artificial intelligence is being used Telangana is using it. Tamil Nadu is using it. Andhra Pradesh is using it. Nobody highlights any of these things, but they will highlight some murder, some rape, something else. Mm. That's what is happening in Indian media? Whereas the Chinese media is controlled, so they will come out with only what Chinese government does and Chinese government wants to project. That's the price we pay for democracy. Um, I think. Let me also add one point, if I may, uh, just to what uh, <coughs> Mr. Siraman just said. <clears throat> you know, about three months ago, there was this uh, controversy about um, uh, organic um, fertilizers which uh, Sri Lanka imported from China. Uh, when uh, it was found by um, uh, laboratory process that it was not the kind of material that was wanted, um, Sri Lanka rejected it, and um, China. suffered a loss of 6 million dollars but you know what happened the next day when the order was signed the people's bank in sri lanka was blacklisted by the chinese embassy they went public with this now a few days before wang yi's visit to colombo sri lanka had to acquiesce and say that it will accept this uh, shipment and they paid 6 million dollars yesterday the uh, sri lankan government the chinese government has announced that they will take sri lanka to the un to the fa fao and charge them with not keeping up their contractual obligations now you are going on your knees to get chinese assistance and this is what you get in return from them on the other hand look at how in the last 6 weeks india has pledged over 2 billion dollars to sri lanka and none of our media has highlighted this in fact wangi went to the extent of telling his sri lankan host that we don't want third country interference in our relationship i mean like what mr sivaraman said uh, our media has is my has is myopic in certain cases we only highlight what we think is dangerous to india what government of india is not doing but there is so much that is happening in the bilateral relations that they have to open their eyes thank you thank you very much both speakers uh, we won't be taking any more questions because of the time constraints we'll be moving on to the third session the third session we'll have two chairs uh, we have uh, two speakers uh, one is uh, first speaker is mr rajaram uh, muthukrishnan and um, the second uh, speaker will be mr sridharan uh, subramanian sir the chair is commodore r s vasan i'll give a b- brief introduction commodore r s vasan uh, indian navy retired is the director general of c3s an alumnus of the direct uh, of the defense service staff college the naval warfare college and the international with a basic leadership program commodore sheshtari vasan has a distinguished service of over 34 years in the indian navy and 
the Coast Guard. His appointments include the commandant of warships, two major air stations, and a maritime air squadron. He has participated both in the 1971 war and the IPFK operation. He was an instructor at the Naval War College, India, prior to retirement. He was a regional commander of the Indian, Naval, Indian Coast Guard region, uh, region East, overseeing EEZ patrol, anti-piracy uh, piracy, fisheries protection, maritime border control, maritime pollution prevention, and other maritime tasks in the Bay of Bengal. Sir, I have hand over the session to you. Uh, thank you, Sabna. Now we have come to the last session. It's been a very interesting day. Starting off from the morning. And all of you are also aware that we are having the beating the retreat ceremony this evening. I encourage all of you to see it because this is the first time we will also be seeing uh, hundreds of drones or maybe thousands of drones taking off together uh, in the Rajput. So, you know, this is uh, going to be another important session where we have two distinguished members of Chennai Center for China Studies trying to uh, look at the strategic uh, options for India. So the first speaker is Rajara Muthukrishan, who is well known to all of you. So he is going to talk about India's force multipliers, opportunities and policy uh, alternatives. <clears throat> so uh, while uh, most of us in Sitriyas know all about uh, Rajara Muthukrishan, uh, let me briefly introduce you to him. He is the director of the Voice Snap Services Private Light Limited, which is a Chennai based IT company. And it specializes in developing uh, innovative voice based solutions. He is also the Chartered Insurer from Chartered Insurance Institute of UK and holds an MBA degree. He started his career in 89 in Hong Kong. And that's how, you know, we, we always look up to him for analyzing issues uh, as looked at from Hong Kong. And also is proficient in Mandarin language, which is an added advantage to Chennai Center for Chennai Studies in understanding uh, China through the prism of Hong Kong and through Mandarin. He has traveled extensively in China and has been on several international and uh, national trade and business delegations. He's been the chamber representative in some of the <clears throat> consultative companies of Hong Kong government, committees of Hong Kong government. He was part of the first e-commerce initiative of the Chamber of Commerce and HK government, as Hong Kong government, during the early days of World Wide Web era, WW era. He later moved on to the field of insurance and was the head of e-business and marketing for personal and commercial lines in Alliance Insurance, one of the largest financial conglomerates in the world from Germany. He was also on the expert group for e-business and alternative distribution of Alliance Asia-Pacific region and has worked, worked on several regional e-business and launch initiatives in the Asia-Pacific. He returned to India in 2002, which exactly two decades ago, and entered the IT industry as the head of insurer business consulting for Polaris Software Lab, where he set up their insurance vertical, including a joint venture with AIG. He later became the head of insurance practice for India and South Asia region in IBM's global business consulting business and became one of the 8% designated as global subject matter expert for insurance and member of the insurance academy IBM that worked on the forecasting of technology enabled changes that will impact the industry at a global scale. He is also a passionate researcher and defense enthusiast and has written on matters related to international strategies, strategic affairs, and spoken on national strategy issues to create better awareness about these subjects. He is also the co-founder of Satantra Forum, an independent think tank that is dedicated towards building of leadership capacity and institutions along with policy research and advocacy in India. So, you know, that, that that's a long bio data, but it just tells you the kind of experience and expertise that he brings to the table from Hong Kong, from insurance agencies, from the field of uh, strategy analysis, etc. <clears throat> uh, so uh, without uh, uh, wasting too much of time, because we are already short of time, I would hand over the uh, floor to Mr. Rajaram with a request that he totally restrict this to 20 minutes and not a minute more. Because I know you have a phenomenal amount of knowledge on this topic, and but uh, unfortunately we are constrained by time. And like I said, the many of us would like to go and watch the retreating of the retreat. And we would not like to jump from here to the repeating of the retreat. I know that you have some 40-odd slides. If just running through them, will take us 80 minutes. So I do not want to be in that position where we are 
you know, uh, taking on so much of time. I would kindly urge you to restrict your talk to 20 minutes and only look at the, the important things which must be made known to this audience who also have an inherent expect in some of these core objectives. We'll have a separate session and I will also promise you that we'll bring out a book on, on based on what you're going to present today separately as I say three years publication. So that, that I think will uh, motivate you to restrict the talk to under 20 minutes. Because I know the knowledge that you have is something that none of us can replicate. But we should not uh, overdo uh, that here in this forum because of the time that is allotted to you. I, I would be most grateful if you can kindly restrict to the time that is allotted to you and only concentrate on the essentials. Thank you and over to you, Mr. Raja. Uh, thanks, Commodore Watson, and uh, thank you uh, for the distinguished speakers who preceded me uh, for giving and setting the stage so well. I don't have a presentation to make. I am only going to take 15 minutes or less. So I assure you that there will not be any time slippage from my side. We start at 2.42 as per my plan. Um, my topic for the day is essentially uh, what are the force multipliers that are un in play with regard to um, issues that we have been talking since the start of the day, uh, which India currently possesses, which is currently pursuing, and what are the options that are there. Uh, if you just take back, look back, the comprehensive national power or whatever that has been talked about right from the time when Admiral Karambi Singh uh, gave his uh, first talk till now, where Amatse Raman and others uh, have touched upon the economic and other matters. The one common strain is the fact that um, there seems to be uh, a, a, a kind of a feeling in the darkness kind of a approach in many of these aspects when it comes to articulation. Um, but the underlying message that has come through right from uh, across the board from the top, from the beginning to the now, is the fact that India has been doing something. It's a question of articulation, which probably is not there. But has it been responding? The clear and unambiguous answer to that question is yes. So in the remaining part of my talk, I'm going to give you a composite view in terms of some of the evidences that is there, in terms of what India is pursuing, which can be the force multiplier in order to enhance the capacity and the capabilities that is comprised under the umbrella term of comprehensive national power to serve our basic need. Any national security paradigm has three fundamental aspects to it. One is set of national goals, which are always changing, which are a reflection of the aspirations of the society. And that, in a sense, is a reflection of the national strengths that come from the various advancements that we make as a society in all fields of activity. And the basic aspirational goals that comes out of that when it comes to interacting with the wider world is represented by national interests. So we have national goals, national strengths, and national in, uh, interests. The fourth underpinning factor with uh, Mr. Ajit Kluwal uh, recently uh, made a very important speech was on the topic of national will, national will. That's the least understood term, even by some of the strategic community doyens in India today. And that is a, that's a speech which I would urge everybody here to listen again, very, very carefully. National will is the composite intent expressed by a nation in terms of pursuing its national interests, which is based on the national goals and the national strengths. In its entirety, this constitutes what is called the national security framework, in my view, in a very simple words. And in this contextual understanding of this with regard to four dimensions. One is geopolitical, second is geoeconomics, third is military, and fourth is sociocultural. In these four dimensions, this contextual understanding of national security is the paradigm in which we have to express what is called the comprehensive national power. Since morning, we have listened to three things. Number one, that the fundamental point is in today's very, very transition in world, where a lot of issues and the pre-held notions of nation state itself is at question. And the concept of a continuous competitive environment, which Admiral Singh spoke about in the morning, it, it perforces every country to look at comprehensive national power as a continuum itself. And we are not going to have a clarity in terms of the situation for us to prepare 
a very watertight, wonderful doctrine written in several pages, debated and assembled by experts, and then internalized by people who are supposed to take decisions and work on that. That will never happen. It is an unrealistic scenario, and I strongly feel that we don't need it. It's a, it's a contrarian thought, I know. But that debate will go another day. Let us assume that there is a national uh, uh, doctrine. What does it comprise of, or what should it comprise of, is the second point that came out, that we must have a whole-of-government approach towards anything that is related to strategic uh, power, power projection or protection of our strategic interest. When we say strategic interest, it encompasses all the four dimensions I talked about. So now let us go and see what are the force multipliers. What do we understand by the term force multipliers? In simple military terms, a force multiplier, like uh, uh, Marshal uh, Vardaman explained today, a, a fuel a refueling tanker enables our fighter aircraft platforms to have an extended reach. So what can be done by one squadron to its limit gets extended. So the impact of that one squadron gets multiplied by X number, a multiple number. So that is a force multiplier. Now, if you address that concept of force multiplier to the comprehensive national power today and look at the four dimensions which I talked about, let us look at some of the evidences that what India has been doing in terms of increasing its capacity, increasing its capability in order to reflect its current evolving national will. Let's look at the geopolitical aspects first. Now, we have been having a consistent view of looking east and now going acting east. So that has been given a more concrete vision and action. Earlier, it was very nice to talk about BIMSTEC, look east, we are going to build this and that, that we've been talking from just one thing this. Nothing happened on the ground. There was a very lukewarm or a very insipid performance on this from the government of India side as well as from the regional partner side. But today things are changing. Why was it not happening? Because we were talking much and there was nothing on the ground for us to work on. Today, after the, in the 72nd year of the Indian Republic, we have managed to get our rail tracks in place in Northeast. So that the potential integration points that uh, was talked about by our uh, uh, previous speaker just now is now made possible. The roads are there only now. It is only there now we are building the strategic uh, forward airfields and uh, that is needed in the Northeast. Northeast was a forgotten area or was a disturbed area. It was discovered, described as a periphery of India. It was looked at the frontier where it has to be kept undeveloped so that any attack on India is getting stalled by the lack of development there. This is the mindset in which we have been ruled. We have never been governed, we have been ruled. Since only since the last few years, we have seen the breakage from the past in terms of getting things right so that we have action mode. So my point in the look east and act east is first of all, making us ready to act east is essentially done in, uh, in the last few years by the extending of the infrastructure that will enable us to integrate and open up. Now, there are things that are happening in Myanmar that, that have happened in the past, which were oh, bases which we were not willing to cross the Rubicon. But from a military angle, we have had established good relationships that we have taken even cross-border terror attacks and neutralized terror emanating from uh, Myanmar. Even in this fluid state where there is a lot of confusion and power play going on inside uh, Myanmar, on both sides of the equation, there are good connects and contacts that the Indian Army is maintaining, the Indian civil services are maintaining, and the Indian strategic agenda is being protected. Now, let us look at the similar thing when it comes to interaction with ASEAN. The interaction with ASEAN is getting extended not only to acts related to the economy, but also it is getting extended to defense relations in a very practical way with both interactions happening in a greater emphasis of providing capacity and capability to China's front door, which is Vietnam, as well as the new deal which has been signed with our Brahmos with Philippines. These are, uh, not, uh, these are not things that happen overnight. There has to be a certain amount of graded response and graded partnership that has to be built in over a period of years and this is accelerated. The linkages that has been accelerated when it comes to ASEAN has been both on the positive side as well as on the negative side. On the negative side, we have shown how our state policy is now adopting whole of government approach 
when pakistan and malaysia started talking about kashmir and other uh, uh, things india taught a lesson to malaysia without officially announcing an import ban but ensuring a practical import ban on palm oil this kind of activity the need for protecting india's interest assertively neither aggressively nor submissively but the right term to use is assertively is a clear example of how practical the look east and act east policy has become so this is an evidence in point to say that what we are doing in response has that enabled us to create a force multiplier today yes is my answer because if we are able to create a comparatively uh, collaborative security arrangement which is what uh, karambir singh also said in the morning where we have a collaborative security arrangement in which india is a net secure security provider and an enabler with a, a good bridge between the extra regional powers and the regional powers then we are we are in a position to actually deliver not only the security dimension uh, related needs of asean or even the middle east or even the west africa or the east africa side uh, indian ocean side of uh, east africa uh, we are also in a position to offer disaster relief climate related technologies and these are happening with the uh, uh, sending up of the south asia satellite we are uh, giving our uh, uh, naval uh, arrangements where we are monitoring a wide uh, area that again is being shared now with uh, partner uh, partner countries in the region and this is really giving solid substance to the relationship wherever the relationships have gone all right with sri lanka getting into the tentacles of uh, china or maldives getting into the tentacles of china and when they got themselves into a sticky wicket they have only reached out to india and it is india that has saved them and we are enabling them to come out of a potential dead trap this in spite of us getting through a more tough most tough time economically with regard to the covid pandemic the vaccine maitreyi also has enabled us the biggest uh, correct assessment of the change in indian attitude towards foreign policy and protection of national strategic interest is enunciated in the book by dr jay shankar called the india way i think that is a must in the reading the second aspect is in the, mar the maritime sector since we are also part of the co organizer today's national maritime foundation the sagar the bharat mala scheme is the readiness of india to actually enable sagar the central asia uh, and sorry the, uh, and the aspect related to uh, the charbahar port getting operationalized um, uh, an um, an important sea route uh, um, port development um, getting enhanced with west asia uh with a strategic port uh, connectivity that is established not only in charbahar but with also certain arrangements that have been reached with uae the enabling of the detente between israeli israel uae and the arab world uh, through the abraham accords is also opened up potential collaboration and investments from west asia into india including jammu and kashmir the, all these are also uh, clearly demonstrating the fact that india is able to uh, enable the collective security maritime wise and it's also creating certain options the defense of india in the north the in the lac also lies in the ability of india to dominate the malacca straits on its own and with partnership now that is a reality today the intent of indian readiness to resist chinese dominance has been clearly proven post kalwan the intent of indian ability to inflict any pain on china in malacca straits is already clearly demonstrated by the host of exercises and the platforms that are coming through and the kind of arrangements security wise that is being enabled through quad so from a geopolitical angle sagar the quad arrangement the economic arrangement these non getting into of the rcep despite a lot of pressure all of these indicate india's clear idea in terms of what constitutes its national interest and what should be done to protect it and what are the options that need to be enabled to enhance the capabilities of collectively the region and india in particular as a provider of that enhanced capability all three of them are getting understood and agreed
in addition to all of this from a geopolitical stage point we have always enabled the current uh, realistic assessment of balancing the needs from being too dependent on trying to counter a over exaggerated threat from china by an over exaggerated need for dependency to the western bloc india has rightly stayed away from over militarization of quad as it stands now because there is no clarity in terms of what that military capability is expected to do there is and that is why the western world has gone with the aukas scheme but we have been part of quad in terms of protection where india's needs are clearly spelled out which is the protection of the freedom of navigation protection of the energy routes and or keeping the seas open for all countries and the rule of law of seas so these are four things for which quad uh, is making sense we will be part of it but overall if you look at it we are part of rac and we are part of jai so there is a constant calibration of what is india's interest and that dictates action and that dictates creation of options unless this is understood assimilated and clearly articulated i think the problem is only in the articulation but not in the kind of response that is needed responses the extent that we want may not be there because of the constraints in which we are operating the demands of time and the resource constraints that we have but the response in terms of the directional clarity it is there the institutionalized readiness is getting prepared the discipline in executing those plans is evident and the core base level foundational activities of ensuring all of that is backed up by a very strong economic india which is performing at its maximum peak is enabled by transformational reforms the extent of which we may feel is not yet there or we may feel is adequate or inadequate in certain places but that's a point of view and that's a point of debate i would not get into too much into that so from a geopolitical angle my evidence is that we are in a position to shape things for the first time this has been the first time after many many decades that india has actually looked at energy requirements for a, for example and say to shape the overall architecture of the emerging energy arrangements of the world the international solar alliance is a case in point this is the first time india has attempted to shape world architecture otherwise we have only lived by the rules set by the west all of which has come from britain woods arrangement and the only status quo disruptor in that kind of arrangement has been china and they also do not want to disrupt the status quo they want to supplement or depose the western system and replace themselves as the center point in that whereas india is the true disruptor we are bringing in financial and other economic changes which are come to later but at least from this point of view that when we are looking at uh, uh, the basic uh, uh, structure of energy isa is a very very important thing the second this 10000 crores has been announced as the investment into national hydrogen mission our import bill it constitutes currently today of 2020 statistics is about 18.80 percentage of our gdp we are about 3 trillion dollars our energy bill is the maximum uh, 60 to 70 percent is our energy bill in our import if you are able to bring about a, a, a dynamic change which we are talking about and which we are instituting now and unfortunately we have to take a backward step because of the repeal of the farm laws if it, we are now looking at agriculture in a totally different context not only as a food security provider but an energy security provider nitin gadkari has gone on record to state that we will look at agriculture as energy security providers and that would be the way in which we are going ahead in a very fast track form we are bringing in the changes related to for the policy framework the technology framework we are pushing the industry to adopt and adapt to changes that is required in both electric vehicle blended fuels hydrogen fuel cell technology a lot of work mr shivaraman sir rightly said a lot of work is happening i don't know how many of you here have personally read this document which has been put together called the tifac 2030 uh, 2035 technology vision i don't know how many of you know an organization called tifac exists in the government of india it stands for technology information forecasting and assessment council it is the kind of place where we have got the best clarity of vision 
we have got a document and that is the blueprint that is being followed ladies and gentlemen in terms of seeing what is the force multiplier that science and technology will bring to the indian economy and to the indian national composite strength and the indian national security paradigm this document 2035 technology vision is created with a view or a, a simple statement what is the kind of india indians would like to live in by 2035 please read the document from that document there is a detailed road map for every single goal that is mentioned there it covers a socio cultural economic political system the entire governance structure everything what kind of india we all want to live in and that dictates the policy and that dictates the investments and that dictates the action all three are stemming from this act this particular document i would urge all of you to read it because our evidence of our story and our narrative is not getting heard and that is because we lack our ability to articulate it well so uh, from a military perspective i have got four evidences in terms of how india is responding and how they can be a force multiplier one of course is quad which we talked about and the increasing emphasis on having 2 plus 2 dialogue with all the strategic partners including china by the way uh, which is uh, yielding very clear focused uh, um, uh, attempts to create the right kind of framework in which all the key participants are uh, having interoperability and interfunctional fit that marshal vartaman talked about the third aspect is the emerging indo french uh, strategic dialogue and indo pacific view which is independent of the western uh, of the us view and that has a lot of potential for us and to balance it all we are also in the seo and the recently uh, launched dialogue geopolitically speaking with central asia and india which has happened a day back is a clear demonstration of the fact of the point the left wing general narsimhan mentioned where groups of countries are approached collectively just as what china is doing this is the response we are taking our approach to china's approach is very different we work with african countries we work with central asian countries in understanding what they want and then tailor making our approach of developmental uh, involvement with them with a strategic gain for example in agriculture pulses the indian government has entered into several agreements with east african and african nations to enhance their productivity in pulses and the entire pulses will be taken up by india and we are also having a agricultural policy which is linked in to the internal way of looking things the mr sivaram mentioned the need for moving the agricultural labor out to other sectors we also need to have a restructuring in the agricultural mix we are currently maintaining um, uh, producing too much grains today india for people here it might be of interest to know india wastes food in terms of food fresh fruits and vegetables and grains equivalent to what brazil consumes every year that is the wastage that we are doing we are just dumping it we get it let it rot because we are over producing our capacity is to store is not there and now we need to rechange it reconfigure it that means we have to have a corporatization of agriculture and that is happening through a very systematic approach how many of you here may have heard about rasa this is a this is an initiative started by iit madras this is for agriculture as i think somebody spoke about agriculture earlier rasa is a regenerative agricultural solution architecture uh, professor iit uh, the new director of iit madras uh, professor kamakoti is the is the origin originator of this we are already doing close to 6 uh, 6 million people are involved in 60 lakh uh, 6 lakh acres in andhra pradesh to do natural farming without even using any kind of artificial in multiple crops 40% more productivity with no fertilizer with landless labors doing less than 1 to 1 and 1/2 acres of land this kind of experiments this kind of technologies are being developed this is augmented by artificial intelligence it is augmented by uh, iot and we are also doing federated manufacturing the new concept of manufacturing is you don't manufacture it you build the scale manufacture you build speed in the manufacture but you build what is called customized mass scaling which was also talked about earlier today that is being enabled by uh, uh, iot that is being enabled by ai that is being enabled by machine learning as uh, mr sivaraman sir said 
we are today one of the biggest recipients of investments in ai and multi uh, machine learning uh, into our uh, software industry and in fact we have to close the gate to chinese investment on it this is another set of uh, 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 data that we have in terms of seeing how we are responding when it comes to economic management macroeconomic management today india is in such a position or as i am requesting to kindly wind up in another 2 minutes yes sir i just need 2 minutes Thank so you. we have uh, uh, from a, i am coming to the last part which is the economic part the fintech revolution that we have enabled and the upi that has been a game changer is today a world leader in terms of produce uh, um, processing payments and we have also created a, a wider range of industry academia and research networks which is called technology business incubators across both private and public sector universities we are working hard in climate change technologies and renewable energy technologies national uh, hydrogen mission uh, is likely to uh, change the face of rural india which mr sivaraman sir talked about how can we bring technology uh, services and technology jobs into rural side by bringing hardware and technology related usage and consumption in rural side rural people can use technology that is proven beyond a doubt with this covid with the kind of digitization that we have achieved the other thing is on the defense technology 250 items have been taken out and put under import ban list which has to be enabled the key aspect related to that is bringing the concept of civil military fusion general shankar has worked a lot on it he is a far better expert than me but i am telling you that this is something that is going to change the face of india with these evidentiary points i am saying that we have force multipliers in terms of policy frameworks which are now looking to put india with a competitive edge to enable the national competitive and uh, power structure we have got a snt infrastructure and snt ecosystem in place which is repurposed and redirected towards result orientation with a lot of funding and clarity in vision with the type act uh, uh, document coming in the governance structure is where we are lacking we need to overhaul our uh, policing system our judiciary which is beyond redemption and the other aspect that is uh, working very hard for us now in a renewed way with a very purposeful way is the diplomatic efforts that india has made in the recent past in terms of its outreach the standing of india today because of the diplomatic outreach and the kind of work the indian civil services and the indian foreign service has done has been exemplary literally exemplary and it is under appreciated in india and uh, the the extent to which india today is seeing as a nation which has to be consulted in every single major decision is because of this uh, effort put together by this so in all four areas of policy in science and technology in diplomacy and what is the work in progress is in governance we are doing we have identified what should be done we have got the force multipliers in place and we are acting on it is my case thank you for your opportunity jai hind thank you very much uh, mr rajaram i think it's a wonderful presentation and there's nothing on which we cannot uh, uh, sort of say that we don't agree with you because particularly it also blended very well with the uh, uh, thrust that was uh, applied by the previous speakers whether it's admiral karambir singh or general shankar or mr shivaraman you know that it, it presents a composite picture of what india is today where do we stand what are our strengths and perhaps what are the weaknesses some of the weaknesses have been addressed by previous speakers also so but i think we are on the right track and i go along with your assessment that yes there have been sea changes in the way india is trying to project itself in terms of its abilities in terms of its potential in terms of its capacity in terms of its capability so all these are being seen by the world today which is a good sign but yes unfortunately as was brought out by group cap chandrashekar there are many divisive forces both within and without and you know we need to be able to have a strategy to deal with them if we have to succeed because you know i cannot have a fence that eats up the entire field so that's what is happening you know it was in the names in the words of arun shauri you know where he had said that is the fence that eating up the fields which is there when he wrote about uh, uh, this after the uh, the debacle uh, in kargil so you know uh, there is plenty of potential as far as we are concerned we not been able to cash on this potential which is uh, a sad reflection not of today 
but of the last 72 days of our governments and and uh, the lack of will to take out some of these by the horn you know on the agriculture simple thing like agriculture well mr mr shivaraman has also said that some of these laborers should move on to other fields so you know i have another genuine question is why is that you know we cannot be a major agricultural exporter you know you see year after year tomatoes being dumped in the streets why don't we have convert them into squash and send it a simple solution you know if brazil is consuming as much of food as they want and we are in a position to it you know export this why are we not doing that again i look at it as a policy failure on other issues of uh, uh, governance on other issues of india reaching out to its partners to protect its interests whether it's in the indo pacific or in the indian ocean region all your points are very valid you know i go along with admiral karambir singh assessment on quad where uh, i feel that we should not be looking at quad as what it cannot do but we need to be looking at it what potential it has for the future to protect our interests in our extreme areas of interest south china sea is an area for interest indo pacific is an area for interest southeast asian countries are necessarily our interest look at what china is doing you know what pratap public had brought out in terms of china's engagement in sri lanka is is a pointer to say now china has the audacity to come and tell you today that tell sri, sri lanka that india is a third country you know where we have enjoyed historical cultural relations for centuries today sri lanka comes and tries to advise uh, i mean china comes to advise sri lanka to say that they should have nothing to do with uh, uh, india you know so this is the kind of uh, challenges that we are facing in terms of uh, our strategic options and uh, uh, potential but i am so happy i honestly did not have a heart to stop you because there is so much that you bring to the table in terms of your analysis it's all crystal clear but i'm sure we'll have a separate session uh, to engage with you uh, for a half a day so that you know we have some kind of a panel discussion to look at india's options in a more comprehensive and positive manner so that those recommendations can be sent to uh, the ministry this is what we will do but thank you once again for this wonderful uh, talk that you gave uh, because every time when we made it a point to involve you 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 have always brought the best to the table so thank you and uh, Are grateful for your participation. Now we'll move on to the last speaker of the day. Uh, that is Mr. Subramanian. You know we consider him as a strategist of Chennai side of a Chennai city. You know because there is nothing that uh, he does not know in terms of the historical perspectives, in terms of what happened in the past, and you know what his prescriptions are for the future. You know of course some within the group call him a dow or a hawk. So I call him a hawk because I also believe in uh, being a hawk and not a dow. and uh, therefore uh, i i i synchronize with his thoughts in terms of how to deal with the bullies around the world and uh, you know it only comes from a position of strength you know because this also came out very clearly when admiral karambir singh this morning spoke about the competition continuum that's continuous you have no choice so you have to learn to how to deal with this positively and not be always on a receiving end and not be always reacting and responding to what china does so where is our independent trajectory so this is where you know, our own uh, subramanian shridharan will he's been writing regularly on all these issues not only in english but also in uh, tamil we have i think already published about 15 articles in tamil including on quad so i am again uh, grateful to subramanian who i consider him is a great asset of citrius and he's going to talk about the changing contours of india uh, in, in terms of uh, the environment and the outlook <coughs> for india to be a vibrant country in the coming decades to take on these challenges you know these challenges some of these challenges are new some of the uh, challenges are uh, you know old but we have not been able to take on these challenges head on and i hope between raja ram and uh, shridharan uh, we will uh, have some prescriptions on what needs to be our course uh, for taking on the world at large so but like mr raja ram has already brought out india is being consulted almost on all matters we may feel left out in afghanistan you know but even then it's afghanistan now which needs all these supplies through pakistan and pakistan has no choice but to agree so there are ramifications of some of the developments which are taking place which impinge on <coughs> india operations and this is where we need to be very clear and also focused in terms of shaping our own trajectory to deal with the developments at a global scale in the coming decades so what do you subramanian all the best shridharan 
Thank you, uh, Commodore Watson. Thank you for your kind introduction. I hope uh, I am audible. Um, it has been a great session since this morning, and thanks for inviting me to make this presentation today. Uh, let me open my presentation here. I hope everybody can see this. Yes. It's visible. Yeah. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, when the 21st century was called out as the Asian century, nobody could have quite imagined that it would turn out this way in the 75th year of our independence. Events of great geostrategic significance are happening around us and impacting us in many forms. India is located geographically in an area of high political flux, which is exacerbated by unsettled boundaries, religious extremism, and enduring historical hostility. In this slide, I have highlighted the major decisions that have impacted us and continue to impact us, either positively or negatively. Among all these strategic decisions, I would like to point out to the Quad. While the slow formation of the Quad was largely due to the hesitancy of India, our level of participation in it increased dramatically after the 2020 Ladakh incidents, leading PM Modi to say, Quad has come of age. It is very clear that Quad also has a military component, though it is not advertised. Asia is a cauldron today, with almost all the active global hotspots being located here, from Central Asia to Taiwan and the East China Sea to Turkey. There is simply no other continent which is in turmoil like ours. Closer home, however, the growing influence of China in the Indian subcontinent concerns us the most. Pakistan is predictably the 24th province or the sixth autonomous region of China today. Take your pick. Pakistan's woes come from the hatred it nurtures for India, as Nehru said 65 years back. Nothing has changed. China will continue to help Pakistan escape financial action task force or censures in the world bodies while continuing to prevent India from taking its rightful position in international fora, such as the UNSC or NSG, etc. We must continue to maintain pressure on China and Pakistan internationally, trying to isolate them wherever possible, while punishing Pakistan with preponderant power every time she transgresses. In the case of China, we have to become unpredictable and in the face, as we did in Dokala in 2017, or in Galwan, and then in Kailash. China is conspiring with Pakistan to take over trans Karakoram areas like Shaksgam Valley and Hunza permanently. Therefore, India should not accept any demilitarization of Siachen, even if Pakistan is willing to sign the AGPL, that is the actual ground position line. The continued occupation of Depsang Plains points to this sinister move. Moving to the extended neighborhood, the ASEAN is an important grouping for India with whom our trade is almost US dollar 100 billion annually. Significant investment flows into India also happen from the ASEAN. There is a significant Indian diaspora and even bigger Indian influence in all these ASEAN countries. It is for this reason that I refer to South China Sea as Indochina Sea or ICS in the rest of this presentation. ASEAN is the pivot for our Act East policy with some individual countries of the ASEAN we have serious potential to engage in sales of military hardware, as it has happened now in case of uh, Philippines. However, the ASEAN is disunited now due to China's political maneuvers, and we must mind this gap. On the East European front, the Ukraine crisis is a big emerging geopolitical situation for India. While Russia is the most significant military supplier for us, Ukraine is also involved in military hardware supplies with us. The German Navy chief was right when he said in New Delhi last week that we need Russia against China. A time-tested diplomatic escape route in such situations where friends are in different camps is to remain neutral or to offer to mediate among friends. With the over $400 billion BR investment in Iran, that country would have a serious debts issue in the future. It has already given the bandar e jask port at the entrance of Hormuz to China. Iran's relationship is very important for us. Any unraveling of the Iranian economy, like the way it happened in Venezuela, where oil for loans by China led to its economic collapse, 
would affect India. We need Iran for oil supplies whenever sanctions are lifted. Need a conflict-free Strait of Hormuz for our energy security. We need access to Afghanistan and beyond through INSTC, that is the International North-South Transport Corridor. And we also need them in our fight against extremism from the Afpak region, especially the Taliban back in power with powerful supporters like China and Russia. Our joining the Quad West would be looked upon by Iran suspiciously. How this Quad West would develop in the future depends upon the resolution of the Iranian nuclear issue and the emerging axis of China, Russia, and Iran. There is, of course, a real possibility of China forcefully integrating Taiwan with the mainland. In the Indochina Sea, or ICS, China can easily take over Kinmen and Matsu Islands, which are within artillery range of mainland China, and also the Pratas Island. What would the US and Japan do in that case? Will they go to war, assuming it was an attack on Taiwan? China has significant advantages in such a scenario as it will be fighting closer to its coast. If the US does not deploy forces, it would not only lose the confidence of the allies, but also make the Chinese think that the US was unwilling to commit, which could embolden it to attack Taiwan itself. China could also be waiting for a more favorable Kuomintang government form in Taiwan after Tsai Ing-wen's term ends in 2026. Japan has clearly stated repeatedly in recent times that such a takeover by China of Taiwan would be considered by it as an existential threat and it would invoke collective security to protect itself. India may be called upon as part of Quad to provide support if a war breaks out. This could involve both diplomatic and military support. India should not hesitate to give what best it can. Asia has five known nuclear powers, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, and North Korea, and three ambiguous nuclear powers, Israel, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. Pakistan is a bankrupt country and the only nuclear weapon state where the military controls the nuclear arsenal. It has a first use policy with low levels of thresholds to use nuclear weapons. China and Pakistan are also significantly enlarging their nuclear arsenal. China is also the largest missile power in the world in the IRBM, MRBM, and SRBM class, and they are of immediate concern to India. In this situation, time has come for India to review its nuclear doctrine, especially as it is now 20 years old since the last announcement was made. Among the Asian nuclear powers, only India has a firm NFU policy. Russia rejected it in 1993 after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Pakistan never had an NFU. China has been wavering since she took over power and started to massively expand its arsenal, while North Korea is a nuclear rogue state. Russia, China, and Pakistan also possess battlefield tactical nuclear weapons. It is worth recalling what Wang Yi spoke so openly in the Brookings Institute in 2013, after assuming position as the new foreign minister under the new president, Xi Jinping. He referred to the Thucydides trap and recalled, and I quote, according to some study of history, there have been about 15 cases of rise of emerging powers. In 11 cases, confrontation and war broke out between the emerging and the established powers, unquote. Though it was directed at the US, we have to understand the message. A Thucydides trap involves a hegemonic and a challenger power. In our case, China is acting even before we have reached the state of being a challenger. We must recognize this fact. From the way the wolf warrior diplomacy has rolled out since mid-2020, we can also see that China would, in future, interfere in our governance systems, given our freewheeling democracy and open and liberal media and society. This will be a hybrid warfare involving PMESII, that is, political, military, economic, social, informational, and infrastructure. We had a taste of that in the Mumbai power grid failure in October 2020. Is it only a Xi Jinping issue then? India-China relations began to fray during the last years of Hu Jintao. But if one looks carefully, we also note that even Deng Xiaoping when they ask the Chinese to be careful and wait for their time and not rush. In other words, even he didn't tell the Chinese to give up the Middle Kingdom ambition. Middle Kingdom is an, immu is an immutable in the Han Chinese DNA, unlike the Wuhan coronavirus, which mutates rapidly. However, 
The aggressive memes employed and the timelines drawn are she's personal choices. And from that point, a successor could perhaps be different. However, like all autocrats, giving up power is very dangerous for Xi at this stage. And that is why Xi cannot announce a successor, even in the 20th National Congress. Xi's extraordinary haste is also conditioned on the fact that China has start, started facing the DDD, that is the declining demographic dividend. Therefore, it is not a personal decision of Xi Jinping to behave like this. It is civilizational, institutional, and very practical. I am afraid that this desire to grab Gilgit, Ladakh, and Arunachal Pradesh from us will endure for a long time, even if the CCP is dislodged from power tomorrow and a more representative and democratic governance assumes power in PRC. Are these all just whims and fancies of some Han Chinese leaders, or can these be explained on a theoretical basis? We shall see it in the next slide. As is well known of the Chinese, they seek knowledge from everywhere. They have studied the thoughts of Alfred Thayer Mahan on naval strategies. They have studied closely the tactics of the Americans in Operation Desert Storm. They have understood the Rimland theory of Nicholas Pickman. They have incorporated all this in their strategy, which entails ruling the Rimland of coastal lands or littorals in order to rule the world. Even if they do not accept the term Indo-Pacific, it is this Rimland that they want to dominate. The biggest hurdles for China in the execution of the Rimland theory are two. They are neither able to dominate the ICS nor able to break free of the ICS, either into Western Pacific or the Indian Ocean, because all choke points from Japan to Taiwan, the Philippines, Indonesia, and India are under constant watch by the Japanese, US, Australian, and Indian navies. Therefore, China feels very claustrophobic. However, it's trying to convert this adversity into an advantage by employing anti-access area denial, that is A2, AD, for others into its lake of ICS. India's strategic interests extend from the eastern shores of Africa to Western Pacific. Our external affairs minister, Dr. Jayshankar, said in the Racina Dialogues in 2021 that India's neighborhood stretched beyond the Straits of Malacca in the east and the Gulf of Aden in the west. And the Indo-Pacific concept overcame artificial fault lines imposed in the post-World War II era. The importance of Indochina Sea is therefore so high both for China and to each member of the Quad who is deeply affected by China in one way or another and who wants to control the unbridled, coercive, aggressive, and hegemonic behavior of China. The Quad is important for another reason too, as the hub and spokes security model so painstakingly set up by the US post-World War II, known as the San Francisco system, lies tattered today. The evolution of the Quad, Quad West, and AUKUS are but a manifestation of this breakdown. As the US withdraws due to multiple reasons, the Chinese would want to fill the vacuum as a major power in Asia and being the first responder and a net security provider or a net security partner, as uh, Admiral Karambir Singh referred to in the morning, in the Indian Ocean region, India cannot be oblivious to these momentous changes. Nobody is safe unless everybody is safe. Xi Jinping proposed a new Asian architecture in circa 2014 but there has not been much clarity on this so far. We can be sure that it is lurking in the background and as various pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fall into place, this architecture would emerge. It may be that the mysterious community of common destiny for mankind is related to that. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi said in Moscow in May 2021, that the current international order led by the United States, and I quote, does not represent the will of the international community anymore. End quote. Whatever it will be, one can be sure that it will invariably be detrimental to our interests whenever it is spelt out. From all appearances, she is working on similar hub and spokes, or more appropriately, a Han and spokes architecture by usurping territorial rights from nations made explicitly bankrupt for this very purpose. The India-US relationship, which was fraught, took a more positive turn, incidentally, after the Shakti series of nuclear tests in 1998. 
A deep understanding was reached after the several rounds of candid discussions between Jaswant Singh and Stroop Talbot. The 123 agreement and the NSG waiver were landmark events. Today, our defense partnership has no barriers. Well, practically. Modi and Obama signed a document on how to deal with specific situations and scenarios that could emerge in the Indo-Pacific. No guess as to what the, those situations and scenarios would be. India-US trade 2019 was dollar 145 billion, 30% of that in favor of India. Of course, the US is an unreliable partner, especially as it becomes more inward looking nowadays. It is also an unflinching power of real politic, which means that our interests might get at times less priority or even get jeopardized. However, the US is at its weakest today, and this may not be reversed in any time soon. It needs partners to protect its interests. It is still the reservoir of technologies that the Russians and the Chinese lack. We must benefit, therefore, from a close association with the United States. The relationship with Russia has been very solid since the mid-1960s. The extraordinary help received in strategic areas, such as building SSBNs or nuclear reactors, is too numerous to be recalled. It has been so in international diplomacy, too, where the USSR and later Russia have supported us diplomatically, though we see some wear and tear now. It is doubtful if any other country would have extended similar assistance to us. However, there are worrying developments in this proximity due not only to the fraught relationship between the US and Russia, but also the best bosom friend relationship between Xi and Putin, which could have an impact on us too. Situations could develop where either India or Russia could be forced to take a position that could be detrimental to the relationship. Our extraordinary reliance on Russian arms makes our position delicate. The dependence must be reduced. However, India must expedite energy procurement from Russia and expeditiously activate the Chennai Vladivostok maritime link and insert herself into the northern sea routes, that is the NSR. So what are India's options in the evolving geostrategic environment? We were blindsided by the Chinese incursion along the entire Ladakh front of nearly 800 kilometers in 2020. We have been complacent, never learning from our past failures along the same lines. But we have reacted brilliantly, just as we did in Kargil, or just as we did in 1965 or even 1947. So the first option in front of us is that we continue to react on a piecemeal and ad hoc manner, giving the first mover advantage to our enemies, and then fighting bravely back. For this reason, this option is simply unacceptable. The second option to be is to be more proactive, but relying entirely upon our resources. We may hope that we can handle anything politically, militarily, all by ourselves. But realism shows that we have to go a very long way before we can think along those lines. Even China today needs Russia. The Atmanirbhata is in a very nascent stage, especially in military hardware. We cannot assume even a major power status, leave alone a great power status, simply by importing 90% of our military needs. We have to reduce our dependence on Russia for mundane arms and ammunition. This option is therefore necessary, but insufficient. The third option is for us to work in close cooperation with friendly countries in the region and beyond. For example, South Korea, Japan, Australia, and France, as uh, Rajaram was also mentioning, both in diplomacy and joint development of military and related hardware. We have to coordinate more closely with Vietnam, Singapore, and the Philippines. We have been raising the level of our relationship with Taiwan, and we can do more of that. We can begin to make more specific statements about the Indochina Sea rather than the bland statements that we constantly hear. It seems that we do not want to offend China unnecessarily, but Chinese actions, having been completely inimical to us, do not brook such passivity from us anymore. But all these will not be entirely enough against a powerful China. This option is therefore, again, like option two, necessary but insufficient. The fourth option is not to hesitate to take the Quad to the next evolutionary level, a military alliance, when the situation so demands. Our hesitation seems to be with the US. We must remember that we had friendship treaty with the USSR, which was essentially a military pact for 21 years until the Soviet Union was dissolved. We are a strong country, and we have the confidence to ensure our strategic autonomy will, does not come to harm in any way. 
just as Japan and China did when they formed a very close relationship with the US. China did it rather effortlessly in 1971. Our diffidence is therefore inexplicable, especially when the US is now on a weak wicket, we are growing stronger, and the US needs partners to protect its security architecture. We should also remember that within 40 years after establishing a close cooperation, both Japan and China took a different direction without any compunction, going against the wishes of its own benefactors. Let us therefore give up cliched opposition and unnecessary fears and approach our evolving geostrategic environment with boldness and realism. China is simultaneously a global, regional, and an Indian challenge. The fifth option is a suitable combination of options two, three, and four, as none of the options by themselves is good in our supreme national interests. I will conclude by quoting what Thucydides said 2,400 years back, which remains relevant today. The future would resemble the past, but not in all respects. Thank you, and Jay Hind. Thank you, Sridharan. That was a wonderful presentation again, and which complemented you know, the previous speaker so well. Uh, it is really encouraging to see the clear-cut manner in which you enunciated the options for India. The last slide is very important. It tells us what our compulsions are and what is it that's doable and what is that it is insufficient. So, you know, I think with that, uh, we are quite clear that uh, there is a lot more that India has to do. It has to, in addition to the last slide that you showed, you must also remember that, you know, history condemns those who do not learn by it, you know, or something to that effect. So our, the, those who do not learn by history are condemned to repeat it. So, you know, this, this is the issue. So whether we, if we are not learned by 62, if we do not learn by, uh, you know, the, the Kashmir exodus, if we do not learn by 71 lessons or Kargil, then we are not learned our lessons at all. So, you know, therefore, it's important for us to put all this together and uh, perhaps uh, provide policy prescriptions or alternatives to the government of the day. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether they read it or not. But as a think tank, it's our job to put all this together and send it to those people and say that, you know, this has been our analysis of what we did today from morning till evening. And that, I think, will uh, be the right thing to do in terms of the output of a think tank. And not that it, you know, it remains in a recording or is circulated on the website and, you know, is seen by just the few members. So I must again compliment you for the wonderful work that you've done, uh, as, as is always the norm when you put across your thoughts. Uh, there's total clarity in your approach to ideas. And uh, so we are grateful to you for this. With that, Sapna, I can take over and uh, see if there are any questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will uh, conclude the show. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. There are two questions. Please go ahead. Uh, so the first question is from Abhishek Pandey. The question is directed to both the speakers. So India has to realize that countering China uh, requires raising individual capacity. With increased trade, China sees it can get away with the assertiveness and salami slicing. How do you see India-China trade of $125 billion touching new heights? So rather I can answer the question. Uh, so even uh, if you can answer, Rajaram, can you can start off? The fact that India-China trade is still growing. OK. Uh, am I are you audible now? Yes. Am I audible, sir? Yep. Please go ahead. Hello. It yeah, looks like there is an issue with his. Definitely uh, is on the upswing. And uh, given the fact that. Uh, I don't know whether I'm audible now. Uh, basically, you are cutting off. Because I have a dicey connection. Yeah, there seems to be some issue. So we'll request uh, Sridharan to take over. OK. Yeah. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. So so uh, I don't think the, the trade issue has got anything to do with our uh, relation, because the world is moving in very different directions, unlike in the Cold War 1.0 era. When the Cold War 1.0 era, there were very clear-cut uh, uh, separation uh, 
and you know one was in one one group the other was in the other group and there was no interaction between the two or very little interaction between the two that is not the way the cold war 2.0 is now emerging cold war 2.0 is very different uh, and here uh, you know we will have certain kinds of cooperations like for example in climate um, uh, policy uh, climate management we may collaborate with china uh, but we will have a problem uh, when it uh, does the aggressive acts in uh, in uh, Ladakh or elsewhere. So I don't see any uh, any uh, any difference or any uh, particular concern in uh, the trade growing and our relationship with China plummeting. Rajaram, if you have sorted out your mic, you may please come in. Aroshis, I think he has a problem with this. So only thing I would like to add on is that I go along with the assessment of uh, Mr. Sridharan. Point is very simple. <coughs> China, right from the word, was always saying that you know we should delink the border and not link it with various other things. And we started imposing sanctions. You know when we started boycotting some of the apps, and then we started also scrutinizing their investments here. But I think this is the only way to keep them under check. You know while today it shows that we have crossed hundred. Uh, the 100 uh, billion plus and you know the exports have also grown what we should not forget is that uh, even the exports from india have grown such as imports have also grown so there is a proportionality to what is happening as far as trade relations are concerned but we cannot allow trade relations to hold the the uh, the border dialogue to ransom so you know from that point of view i think our own government is quite clear the external affairs minister has made it very clear to say that you know we cannot deal in this nor can we put our border talks under cold storage. No, we will let business continue perhaps because of the mutual dependency that there is. But there is no question of abandoning the border talks or resolution of the border just because you want trade to go many folds. As we have brought out in many forums, the trade surplus that uh, China enjoys is the money that's used in uh, China POK economic corridor for development. So we are indirectly funding its development activities. So that is a realization that's come about and we need to be conscious of this factor before we try to say no no it's all right and let's go back to our old ways of dealing with trade and dealing the border talks from there so it has to be linked in my assessment because if you do not deal in this as and when it's convenient to china they will continue to you know carry on with this area of needle and nipple uh, rajaram you would like to give it a try yes uh, am i audible yeah, now sir it comes in cuts and okay uh, the point i would like to make okay uh, let me try uh, the point i would like to make is very simple the fact that the trade is going through an upswing is temporary the overall directional impetus to china india trade is one that will go towards the south uh, therefore there will be a reduction in the trade it contraction will happen over a longer period of time because it's not easy to transition away from china as the world realizes that but we will uh, over a period of five years not grow this trade or the overall mix in the trade will change with a greater impact or greater share for india in terms of its exports to china uh, the point is the advantages that we have is not given there is no market access for that in china and the other aspect is that they would like to prefer to source primary products better we would not be a provider of ores and minerals and uh, for excess rice that is what is currently occupying most of the india china trade uh, but i look at it from the as from what jay shankar sir has said uh, there cannot be a uh, trade as normal so the overall direction and all the decisions taken so far is to dealing ourselves from the chinese dependency so there will be a downward push towards the india china trade going forward is my view thank you uh, thank you rajaram uh, next question, please, Sapna. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. The next question is from uh, Bharati Sh Sharma. The question is to Subramanian Sridharan, sir. Uh, does China see India's asylum to Dalai Lama as a threat to their territorial integrity in Tibet? And what are the stakes of India holding on to Buddhist population as a major stance in China? See, the, the, one of the major reasons why China uh, has been saying that uh, India as an enemy is are, are, cl are close to their abouts is because India gave asylum to the Dalai Lama. Uh, so it will continue to hold that line because Mao has said very clearly, Mao Zedong, 
that uh, Tibet is the palm and the other five fingers are Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Arunachal Pradesh, Sikkim and all those things. So China will use every means to, to, to hold an inimical position towards India. And it doesn't want India to progress. It sees India as a competitor for, uh, for you know, uh, in the future. So it wants to control us right at this point of time. So there won't be, there won't be any let up on that. It will use every opportunity, including the, the case of the Dalai Lama, to continue that, uh, that status. What was the second part, uh, Sapna? So what are the stakes of India holding on to Buddhist population as a major stance on China? Uh, I think he is referring to, um, uh, or she is referring to uh, the, the Tibetans being uh, in India. Uh, if that is the case, uh, of course, India will give asylum. India is a very democratic and humane country. So we will give asylum to anybody who comes to our land. So they have been here. They will be. They will continue to be here. And it's not. Uh, it's not a kind of uh, hostage or uh, or um, a trump card that we use or employ against uh, China. Uh, it is China's own doings that uh, they draw away these uh, Tibetans from their own land. So China takes responsibility for what has happened, and India is just giving asylum to these people. That's all. Yeah, if I may just add, uh, using my position as a chair, I know I would like to inform the audience that uh, the Chennai Center for China Studies led a delegation and called on the His Holiness uh, Dalai Lama. Uh, this was uh, four or five years ago. And he spent more than an hour, and when we were discussing various issues related to politics, religion, and even the Buddhist religion. You know, I remember at that time, uh, His Holiness telling us that it is thanks to the refugees who came from uh, Tibet at that time that today Dharamshala has something like 3,000 uh, books, which otherwise would have been destroyed by the Communist Party. So, you know, this is, this is what has happened. And, you know, we have, there has been a historical blunder in terms of Tibet. Uh, you know, it, it is a great uh, blunder. And today, there is new evidence that's coming out to say that China never ruled Tibet. So this is Tibet today is in occupation. So which is the thrust of the government in exile. And we actively supported the Tibet Policy Institute, which has been bringing this forth. We also had conferences and seminars in uh, China Center for China Studies, where accomplished uh, researchers who studied in China for 10 years have brought out this fact to say that Tibet was never part of China. So Tibet is under occupation. So it's unfortunate that uh, the government of the day at that time uh, in 1949 did not see this and otherwise you would have had a buffer state in Tibet and you know with the cultural relations and the similarity would have had nothing to worry about in terms of China. Today by accepting Tibet occupation at that time we brought China along our borders you know in the McMahon line. So that, that's a serious issue. On the second point the only thing I would like to say is that uh, China today is investing a lot of money and effort to make themselves at the center of uh, Buddhism in an atheist country trying to declare that they are the center of Buddhism. They are spending a lot of money on this. So they want to have Buddhism circuits like Sri Lanka has for uh, Ramayana circuit. So they are trying to have this and you know claim uh, uh, the, the ownership of Buddhism uh, for China. So there are uh, these uh, uh, soft power manipulations that it is trying to undertake. And we need to be conscious of what it's trying to do. So we need to be supporting the, the, the Tibet uh, liberation cause. This is in the long-term interest. And likewise, you know, Southern Mongolia and also the Eastern Turkestan, where we are given platform to the, the governments in exile to come and talk to us or to tell us what the reality was and how China occupied these uh, countries. So I thought I'll mention this because we've had the good fortune of uh, interacting with uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama uh, four or five years ago when uh, a delegation of six researchers went and met him in Dharamshala. Uh, so Raja Ram, would you like to add something? No, sir. All no, right. sir. Thank Any you. next question? No, sir. That will be the last question. Yeah, all right. So I think that's, uh, I have nothing more to add. Is Mr. Shivaraman here? Or has he left? I think he's left. No issues. So that's all I wanted to add in terms of today's uh, discussions. Before I hand over to Vijesh, uh, I just want to say that uh, this has been one of the most productive uh, webinars that we've had, starting off since morning with Admiral Karambir Singh, who's recently taken over as the, the chairman of the National Maritime Foundation. You know, he just handed over uh, his reins uh, uh, very recently. On the 17th, he took over 
as the chairman of the National Maritime Foundation. But we are lucky in Chennai to have his first outing as the chairman of NMF to come and deliver that talk. So it was, it was most insightful. And you know, I, I like the tone and tenor of the talk in terms of the prescriptions for an India, which need to take on not just China, but other adversarial situations which are there and move on uh, with, with, with an assertive mindset and not with a defensive mindset. So thereafter, every session uh, has contributed to this process of relearning our own capacity and capability and to try and look inwards to the extent possible and see what mistakes we have committed in the past and how we should stop being reactive and we should become proactive. Which is, of course, a, a tall order, uh, particularly with the limitations that we have and the economic differential that there is. But as Mr. Shivaraman brought out, the economic differential should not be looked at only in terms of GDP, but also in terms of the PPP, you know, which is where he rightfully brought out that it is not 1 is to 5, but it is 1 is to 3. So therefore, we need to leverage our advantage, which is what again Admiral Karambir Singh brought out about the locational advantage that we have in the Indian Ocean region. The, our credentials as a democratic secular society, the demographic dividend that we have, and also, more importantly, the, the economic trajectory, which is quite positive as of now, and the fact that more and more nations are looking up to India, whether it's vaccine diplomacy, or whether it is the greenhouse emission, or whether it is uh, the op options and avenues for investment in India. So I think there is a promising landscape out there, provided the government of the day and the people of this country are in a position to utilize this to the best of its ability. So thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to chair the session. I was very happy to see both Rajaram and uh, Sridharan making their points as always in an enthusiastic, passionate manner. And I know which I hope the researchers would have taken note of and uh, that will uh, help us in uh, providing these policy alternatives to the people uh, who are in the corridors of power. Thank you, Ordi Sabna. Thank you, Jaihin. Thank you, sir. As we have reached the end of what has been an insightful event, I would like to invite Commodore Vijesh Kumar Garg, Executive Director, C3S, to give the concluding address and the vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sapna. Uh, Director General uh, C3S, Commodore Vasan, all the esteemed speakers, distinguished members, and all the online participants. When this concept note was thought of for this webinar for a day, and it was thought in a very systematic manner that you do an environment scan, do a preliminary analysis, do a net assessment, and then come out with a strategic option. This is the correct method which is taught in all the strategic management like CDM and all. We applied this method very happy today that in almost six and a half hours of deliberations, almost 10 speakers over the four sessions, we have come out very clearly to some aspect. One day is not enough. For CDM, the exercise is done for over three months. And then you come out with a policy option for India. But I'm sure we are on the tack. Now, since morning, what has come out? If you did this environment scanning, we had the speakers covering from the maritime domain, from the continental neighborhood and the far neighborhood, Air power is reach, capability from the air point of view. The global happening around us, whether it is Yemen, the Taiwan, Ukraine, all the issues. We had diplomatic aspect from Ambassador Saurav Kumar. We had very fascinating topic with the first time in detail from Group Captain Chandrasekhar about the external aid and internal stability. Very, very important topic, which was generally not talked about. We had industry expert. Um, she rather than we took an industry aspect of what is happening, international, what is happening. We took the science and technology, we took a climate change issues. Very important topic about demography today. But demography to be utilized, we should not waste it because time is now. That unlike China, we should not miss the bus. Very valid point came out of the issue of national goal, national strategy, national strength, and national will which needs to be articulated, whether it's national security doctrine or it's national security policies, which has to be integrated, taking all the comprehensive national power, which Mr. Hubbard brought out, Mr. Muturam brought out. This is what is lacking as of now. It's not that it's not happening, 
but it's not well articulated that what came out what are the options are for us the options are many which came from the uh, admiral kevising said it is the influence influence to our neighbor influence to our flower uh, so far neighborhood the strategic cooperation and coordination it is the integration of all the resources of the national power is a military it is a bureaucracy is a diplomacy is a industry it is a science and technology and the demography put together and of course the political class one major point came the about the employability as use of demographic advance uh, advantage to us we should not miss that for our economic growth and economic growth will drive the nation uh, make the comprehensive nation proud to go fast china it came the china we look as is a very very blow up everything yes they have a higher in economy they have more military power but i firmly believe it is the man behind the gun which matters it's man inside the aircraft which matters it's finally he who takes the lead and he who fights the war when he crisis comes we have examples what happened to abhinandan a mig 21 take your f16 sri ramasal mentioned during the galwan clash the the paras surprisingly captured those heights they were never thought of is the question of how is the morale how is the will national will has to go aggressively we can cope up with any threat on us with that i will like to thank all the 10 speakers mr kb singh tender darsingham ms das kumar jana shankar a marshal vardhman group captain chandshekaran chashivran sir sarbadar hablikar adara mutikrishnan sir and shridharan subramanian sir for your fantastic presentation and lighting us and all the participants on your thought process which actually ignite the minds that what kalam says ignite the minds and this new generation will think ahead and towards the right policies together i'll be failing my duty if i don't thank all the eminent speakers who made fantastic presentations which will be put on the youtube for all to share later on all the participant distinguished members who are present today national maritime foundation which partnered with us my director general c3s who is aspiring lighthouse for all of us to keep doing it and i'm forgetting my duties i don't thank my young friends bala and sapna who are the my right hand and light man taking on the show thank you so much for all being with whole day with us we promise you we'll come back soon with another series or strategic introduction like this which will be definitely much more intense than this thank you so much jai hind